Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with Ian Moyer about Egyptian astrology. Um, for the data, today is Monday, April 10th, 2023, starting at 1.49 p.m. in Denver, Colorado, and this should end up being the 398th episode of the show. Uh, so, hey, Ian, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. I'm a, I'm a fan of the podcast, and uh, I've enjoyed it, learned a lot from it and from your other work and your book, and excited about this, uh, well, I guess not so new translation of Vedius Valens. It's already a few months old now. Uh, so um, I'm glad you've been doing all this great work. I've learned a ton from it. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm a fan of your work as well. So you're the um, author of a 2011 book titled Egypt and the Limits of Hellenism, and um, which explores the ancient history and the modern historiography of cultural and intellectual encounters between ancient Greeks and Egyptians. Um, and I thought you would be a great person to do this episode with about Egyptian astrology, uh, because so much of what we know about Egyptian astrology um, really starts to come about. And a lot of the documentation takes place in the Hellenistic period, where we have this blending of Egyptian and Greek and Mesopotamian cultures. And so I thought we could talk about that today and talk especially about some of the unique contributions, either that the Egyptians made to astrology or um, different things that were culturally culturally relevant in Egypt, um, where Egypt kind of helped to foster the creation of different forms of astrology uh, at different points in time. So, yeah. so what's I'm your really what's excited? Your, It'll be great. Yeah. So what's your background and training, just for those that aren't familiar with you? Sure. Yeah. Um, I uh, I'm a history professor at the University of Michigan, and um, I did my PhD back in the day at the University of Chicago. And I studied in a program that allowed me to combine classical studies and Egyptology to a certain extent. Um, and that was great because I was able to really get into this world of uh, cultural contacts and interactions. And I've done my best over my career to approach it from both, both sets of evidence, from both sides, and try and look at the cultural dialogues going on in the periods of interaction between ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. Going to celebrate both cultures uh, and their contributions to various moments of uh, intellectual interaction and creation. Nice. Um, yeah, and it seems like a recurring theme that we're going to talk about today and that you've talked about in your career is just um, the sort of synthesis or the intermingling of cultures that come about when people or when people from different cultures are in close proximity to each other for one reason or another, and the unique kind of um, synthesis that that creates or unique things that sometimes come out of that uh, sometimes unexpectedly? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a really, um, it's an amazing uh, way to look at uh, culture. I think, you know, I don't know what it was like for you, but when I was going through high school, um, we tended to study ancient civilizations in isolation. You know, you have the Mesopotamians and they did that and the Egyptians built the pyramids and and the Greeks brought us philosophy or whatever, but um, we never really stopped to consider the the um, products of the interactions of these civilizations when I was in school. And so when I uh, went on in my academic career, I, I, I was just blown away by the just sheer amount of interaction, first of all, and then just the, the things that in a way could not have happened without uh, cultural interactions and exchanges in antiquity. I, and I certainly think astrology is one of those. Um, it's such a, an interesting confluence of different elements coming together. And at a particular historical moment of, of increased interactions and contacts between civilizations. Yeah, and, and astrology in particular provides such a great way of studying interactions between cultures because it's constantly being transmitted back and forth from one culture to another. And then every time it's transmitted, it changes in some way, but also there are different things then that are added um, to, to it from whatever new host culture kind of receives it from somewhere else. And, and uh, then it, again, transmits it back again to other cultures in the future so that you can really see the lines of cultural transmission through the study of um, the techniques and the doctrines associated with astrology. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think it's great also to think about this uh, in the the long history of scholarship. Um, people have been studying ancient astrology 
well, for a long time, forever, I mean, for thousands of years, literally. But in terms of the modern history of, of scholarship, um, I think there's been um, a tendency in, in the 20th century, there was a tendency in the 20th century, sometimes to downplay the contribution of uh, ancient Egypt. And so it's exciting to kind of see new evidence that's coming to the fore, um, understudied languages and texts that are now finally being published. And that's really changing our picture of this interaction uh, that produces things like astrology and allows us sometimes to trace in a little bit more detail just those kinds of transmissions that you were talking about, moments when we can see a particular kind of technique or a little bit of knowledge um, or a practice migrating across a cultural boundary, taking on a new form, being shaped by the practitioners in the new context. Um, and that's uh, that's just one of the exciting things about history, I think, uh, any kind of intellectual history. Right. That's a really important point that for much of the past century, most of the 20th century, um, since the late 19th century, there's been the rise of the study of astrology and its history, especially in an academic context. And um, there was a lot of material to work with where, on the one hand, you had the Mesopotamian uh, cuneiform tablets that were discovered. And so there was the ability, once those were deciphered, to start studying the history of Mesopotamian astrology from like 2000 BCE all the way through the first century CE, um, because those were relatively durable because um, they were on little baked clay tablets. So they there were there was evidence basically that stuck around that could be studied um, to study the history of astrology there. Or with the Greek and Roman and Latin tradition, there were texts that were transmitted um, by hand, that were copied over by hand for hundreds of years and transmitted through different scholars and different libraries and stuff that were then recovered and edited and published in the during the course of the 20th century. But with the Egyptian material for a long time, there was a distinct like lack of of evidence or lack of certain types of art, like similar archaeological finds until relatively recently. So that there were some scholars that were really skeptical about or or rejected that there was much of an Egyptian contribution to astrology until recently. But then it seems like a recent generation of scholars, as well as a recent, um, as a result of recent archaeological finds, that those views are being revised, and that the role of Egypt and its contributions to Western astrology, as as we call it, just generically, are starting to be looked at again, and it's starting to be viewed as a, as a much more significant contribution than was thought previously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the one of the factors too that played into that is that. Um, there are different phases of Egyptian language, and I will talk about that um, uh, later, I'm sure. Um, and a lot of Egyptologists, after the decipherment of hieroglyphs, really focused on the hieroglyphic sources from earlier periods, the periods that were seen as the, the classical periods of pharaonic civilization, the greats like Ramses the Great and so forth, the pyramid builders. And um, the later phases of Egyptian culture and language um, suffered a bit of neglect at times, and uh, they've, uh, you know, it's it's interesting to note, for example, that the dictionary for demotic, uh, the the late form of the language uh, that a lot of these astrological texts are in, the ones that we have, um, really didn't come together until you know you know ten twenty years ago. So imagine you know studying ancient texts and you don't really have a full dictionary. Um, a lot of the the scholarly work in just publishing and editing these texts uh, uh, just wasn't being done because there weren't a ton of people being trained in this field uh, because of the tendency to focus focus on earlier periods, and that um, combined with um, uh, you know sometimes a twentieth century mid twentieth century especially. Um, uh, prejudice really against um, Egyptian culture when it was in the period governed by the Greeks and an idea that these cultures were separate um, and didn't interact much uh, under the Ptolemies um, uh, in the later periods of Egyptian history um, really has, there's, you know, it's created all these different factors that have kind of, you know, made it understudy the kind of the world, the evidence that we have for these interactions in astrology. Um, that stuff has been understudied, but it's now really starting to pick up. Um, and so we're starting to see new stuff, which is quite exciting. Yeah. So um, 
One point of clarification, let's talk a little bit about the language and the three different languages that we might mention at different points here. So one point that you mentioned in passing that's actually really important is that um, like the ability to read uh, the original Egyptian language was lost and it, it was actually rediscovered or at least the ability to read hieroglyphs um, was actually rediscovered relatively recently, like only a few centuries ago, right? Yeah, exactly. The The famous image that we all think of is the Rosetta Stone. Um, so if people have seen the Rosetta Stone or a picture of the Rosetta Stone, that's the document, uh, the an inscription that was discovered during the Napoleonic expedition to invade Egypt. Um, and so right uh, at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, oh great, yeah, there's a picture of it. Um, this multilingual document was discovered that provided the key to the decipherment of hieroglyphs. And so famously, um, Jean-Francois Champollion uh, used this a text, which was produced in three versions to decipher hieroglyphs. Um, and, and that means um, effectively that, uh, you know, he eventually did it in the 1820s, uh, 1830s, that really started to come together. And that means that relative to, for instance, Greek and Latin, which have been known um, continuously since antiquity in, in uh, scholarship, uh, Egypt is kind of a latecomer. And so those texts were, you know, are being brought into the conversation over the last couple of centuries. And so it's, uh, that's a kind of an interesting, yeah. And, and then the, the demotic, once hieroglyphs got deciphered, demotic mm. was, in, you know, was initially studied a lot, but then um, uh, it kind of dropped out of view for a little while. So in the Rosetta Stone, uh, what were the three language that, languages that were written on it? Oh, yeah. So um, hieroglyphic, demotic, and then Greek. And so uh, if we have a, that picture again, you can see the mm -hmm. sort of three broad bands there, um, hieroglyphic, demotic, yeah. Egyptian, and Greek. So there's hieroglyphic. Yeah. So hieroglyphics mm -hmm. at the top. And yeah. we can see that as like the pictorial sort of language of, of Egypt or the original language. And then we see demotic, which is what more of a cursive style of Egyptian. Exactly. Yeah. And this was developed really in the later periods of Egyptian history. It's ultimately based on hieroglyphs, uh, but it was underwent a process of simplification and abstraction to create something that was easier to write on papyrus um, so that you could write documents. And it was developed primarily in the Sayite period of Egyptian history, um, a dynasty, the 26th dynasty, when um, Egypt um, was refounded and uh, uh, strengthened a new period of pharaonic rule after a period of interruptions known as the Third Intermediate Period. Circa, like what would that be? When would the Sayite dynasty be BCE? Yeah, it starts in the middle of the 7th century BCE and okay. uh, lasts until the late 6th century BCE. Yeah. Okay, so, so 6th century BCE, roughly for the development of demotic and of this more easier to write script on papyrus versus how old is our, is the previous uh, like Egyptian hieroglyphs? Yeah, hieroglyphs uh, go go way back to the uh, pyramid builders and and even earlier. So um, uh, those are almost three thousand. Uh, sorry, those are almost five thousand years old. Um, uh, but you know, uh, so hieroglyphs go way way back. Um, there's also another cursive form of Egyptian called hieratic that influenced demotic. Um, but demotic was really important because uh, um, it was. It doesn't seem like it because it's a very complicated script itself, but it was easier to uh, learn and write and write documents in. And so it actually led to ultimately a, a flourishing of uh, uh, documentary texts. People were using contracts and legal texts more often. Um, and so uh, probably a little bit of a, a spread in literacy that um, came about as a result of demotic. More people. It. Not it wasn't by any means mass literacy, but uh, there were certainly more people involved in producing demotic documents. That makes sense, and so it was able to be written more easily on papyrus versus the hieroglyphs were easier, maybe designed better for some of the like the pyramids and other monuments where you're like chiseling something into stone. 
Yeah, exactly. And they did write and draw uh, beautiful hieroglyphs on papyrus, um, but that was very labor intensive and um, like a calligraphic kind of art, really. Um, Demotic was meant to be a rough and ready language for everyday documents. But what's interesting is as time goes on, it gets used for more and more things. Initially, the distinction was between hieroglyphs, which were used uh, for sacred texts, um, uh, esoteric knowledge of the temples and so forth. Uh, and Demotic was meant to be the language of everyday contracts, letters, legal documents, that sort of thing. But over time, um, narrative literature starts to be written in Demotic Egyptian, um, uh, stuff that was originally meant to be part of the secret lore of the temple started migrating into demotic texts and being preserved there as time went on. And that's one of the reasons we have some of this lore from ancient Egypt um, preserved in demotic texts is that, that, that its scope started to expand. Uh, people started using demotic for more and more things. And by people, I mean largely the literate priestly class. Um, that is, the priests in the Egyptian temples were the ones who were primarily uh, the ones trained in demotic Egyptian writing. So it's not a it's not a broad slice of the population, but um, uh, more and more people were were or more and more scribes were able to be trained in this form of writing. Got it. And all this will become relevant later because as we see, there's been some horoscopes, some birth charts that have been rediscovered recently that were written in demotic Egyptian from the first century BCE. And also there's some instances even of some symbols for like the signs of the Zodiac being written, um, I think, in hieroglyphs, right? Yeah, well, uh, there's some um, demotic signs that may be derived from hieratic and hieroglyphic signs. So symbols that were used in demotic texts that are related to um, sometimes pictorial representations uh, that ultimately derive from hieroglyphs. Yeah, but okay, they've been simplified. Cool. Yeah. yeah, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, last point, just while we're talking about the early history and to give people a reference point, when were the pyramids um, built roughly as far as like modern scholars are concerned? Yeah, those are built in the third millennium BCE. So we're talking, you know, uh, uh, the middle of the, you know, so like 2500 ish BCE. Um, I should look up the dates. That's not my period. <laughs> I should know this, mm. but um, uh, they're uh, much earlier. And we're talking about a much later period in Egyptian history when we start to see astrology going on. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some things that happened before the conquests of Alexander the Great um, in uh, 330 BCE, 332 BCE, um, uh, around that period. And uh, but there's so we'll talk about a few uh, things um, that happened before that. But most of what we see in terms of the development of astrology in uh, Egypt happens after the conquests of Alexander the Great. So uh, Alexander the Great was, uh, of course, this famous general from the Macedonian part of Greece who conquers the world and establishes yeah. these kingdoms. Um, oh, sorry, did you want to? Yeah, and we'll we'll get to some of that. I just want to establish the first, the just early history of Egypt while we're on it. Um, and especially the Deccans, and because those go back pretty early, at least the early use of the Deccans does, right? That's right. The ninth or tenth dynasty, um, which is really after the great era of the the pyramid texts. Um, so uh, uh, they start showing up in coffins and things like that. I think are some of the earliest attestations, um, and then they make appearances in in monuments, uh, inscriptions uh, on temples, uh, but also in other funerary contexts. That is tombs and and inscriptions on on coffins and so forth. Okay. And so what are the Deccans? Like the Deccans seem like they originally probably fixed stars um, and that were used um, for like calendrical and timekeeping purposes um, in order to sometimes like time different ri religious rituals at night or to tell time, right? Exactly. Yeah. So the, the Deccans were um, uh, primarily used... Um, the, the rising stars or the culminating stars of the decans, um, uh, depending on the context, were used to mark the hours. Um, and this was important because uh, various Egyptian temple rituals had to um, occur, had a sequence of rites that were performed at particular times, uh, sometimes through the night or sometimes during the day. And so the um, uh, the stars of the decans were used to mark um, exactly when 
um, a certain event happened or a certain rite was supposed to be performed. And so we have some, for instance, um, liturgical papyri that give instructions for the performance of a ritual that um, from uh, Karnak and Thebes that actually give instructions for a particular priest known as the um, Imi Wenut, um, who is the he who is in his stars, uh, to actually um, uh, you know, mark off the correct times when certain parts of the rituals are to be performed. And um, uh, this was the priest that would be responsible for sighting the stars um, and using, uh, if we're a nighttime ritual, using the, the sky's uh, motions, the, the rising and culminating the stars to mark off the hours of night. Um, but they were also used uh, uh, for calendrical purposes. Um, there are um, each Egyptian month uh, was divided up into, had 30 days um, and was divided up into three 10 day periods, sometimes called decades. And those 10 day periods are sort of like an Egyptian week, if you will. Um, and it was by marking, you know, which decan is um, having its heliacal rising or its appearance um, uh, just before, uh, either just before the sun rises or when the um, uh, the sun is setting to indicate uh, you know which uh, which week we're in and use, used as a kind of timekeeping method as well. Okay, so it was initially there was um, rising decans which had to do with like a, a fixed star, a certain fixed star in the morning making a heliacal rising uh, during a certain ten day period. So they were using it to tell time basically either by certain fixed stars rising on the eastern horizon, which is roughly what we associate today with the ascendant or um, culminating overhead, which is roughly what we associate today with the, the midheaven. Exactly. Yeah. So this is a basic, uh, the basic function of the decans in the earliest periods, uh, you know, before um, the periods that I mostly work in uh, seems to have been calendrical. Um, and it's, um, I mean, that, that sort of downplays it a little bit because uh, there were these kind of presiding divinities associated with these uh, decans. Uh, but uh, they represent particular hours of the night. They are the presiding uh, uh, divinities, or um, they're not quite, uh, you know, the stature of the great gods like Horus and so forth. Uh, but they preside over these uh, these uh, clusters of stars that mark time, mark the movement of the seasons as well. Um, okay. And so this is yeah part of the the solar calendar of uh, of Egypt, um, especially, which was was quite precise and eventually was one of the main calendars used by later astronomers and astrologers to um, uh, uh, to, to do their calculations because it was better than many of the uh, lunar calendars that were used in other areas in the Mediterranean. Okay, so this is important. So we've got a connection between like the, the priests are the ones who are using the decans um, in the temples in order to use these fixed stars in order to tell time. They're focused roughly on um, the the regions that we now associate with the ascendant and the midheaven in order to to do this and uh, some later schol scholarship eventually and I guess maybe we'll circle around to this later because of this connection with like um, the decans either rising or culminating have suggested that this may have been a precursor to the the later development of the idea of the ascendant as an astrological concept or the midheaven, and then by extension as a precursor to eventually the concept of the 12 houses or, or sectors of a chart. Exactly. This is something you see over and over again um, in Egyptian astronomical texts as a great emphasis on, on rising and culminating. Um, it's also an important part of solar mythology. So uh, the course of the uh, sun god Ra's solar bark through the sky um, is marked by points of rising and culminating and, and descending. Um, and these are uh, all have their own mythological function in the sort of life cycle of the sun and um, also also the travel through the underworld. So there's a very um, uh, intense interest in the solar cycle uh, in Egyptian mythology and marking uh, these uh, initial culminating descending and also the, the when when it, times of either stellar or solar invisibility when the these stars and the the moon and so forth are under the earth or appear to be under the earth right and there was a whole this is tied in also partially with like the division of the day into hours and also um some notions also of of 
both sunrise and sunset, but then also the sun moving through different sectors when it's under the earth during the course of the night. Right, exactly. There's um, a lot of mythological texts that uh, uh, discuss the the travel through the underworld, the underworld journey of the sun, um, and that's uh, you know that those hours um, are marked by looking at the stars. You know, when is the sun in its particular point? Um, especially in liturgical texts, when is the sun in that part of its journey in the underworld? Well, that can only be told, of course, by uh, looking at um, uh, rising and culminating stars. Okay. Um, and some of this is told partially almost through the use of what we kind of call, we refer to today as like mythology, and there were like mythological aspects to some of these different astronomical things that are being described, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, the, the sun itself was viewed as a god. Um, various stars were really important. And we'll see these come up again and again as we have our conversation. Um, for instance, the the star Sirius um, was really important because its um, heliacal rising uh, was a sign that the great inundation of the Nile was coming. And so the, the god, uh, various divinities uh, like Isis um, and Hathor and other divinities were associated with that star and, and were thought to be you know, interchangeable sometimes. Sometimes Sothis is viewed as a uh, a divinity itself. Sometimes uh, stars uh, uh, take on the attributes of of these important goddesses in uh, cosmological cycles, and there's other stars as well that are important in earlier texts, like the pyramid uh, texts, famous uh, texts uh, that were inscribed on the inside of pyramids as funerary texts for pharaohs. Um, uh, certain constellations um, uh, appear like Orion and uh, the Foreleg and Egyptian constellations, and particularly important in those texts were the circumpolar stars, uh, which never set. So the 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 symbolism of the sky um, takes on um, uh, religious meaning in in various uh, Egyptian texts. So the the circumpolar stars that never set, never dip below the horizon, are seen as immortal spirits. For example, the Ahu. Um, uh, so so there was um, to go back to to uh, the question of the dating. There was of of the emergence of the Decans. There there were constellations and and a lot of stellar lore um, in the pyramid texts, but not yet quite the Decans. Okay. And um, to linger on that point a bit, and then I want to go back to Sirius, but just you were contrasting like the fixed stars and the ones that that never die with the sun, which rises and is kind of born in the morning each day and then dies in the evening, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, these, uh, the um, there are gods associated with um, some of the constellations. Um, uh, for sure. So um, uh, Horus um, is associated with Orion and and so forth. Um, but and, and there's different kinds of associations. Uh, but there's certainly um, uh, what's interesting is it, there's there are names for the uh, planets um, in early Egyptian texts, but they don't seem to take on um, huge mythological roles. Um, the 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 planets that we um, are that we see in astrological texts later do have names associated with the gods, but many of them are actually associated with the same god Horus, which is interesting, um, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, Thoth. But these may be uh, as a result of uh, Egyptian interpretations of um, uh, uh, stuff that they're getting uh, through other channels from Greek or, or uh, Mesopotamian uh, interpretations of the planets. Sure. Um, yeah, and and I just wanted to. I guess the main point was just that there was some sort of very early sort of mythology surrounding the sun and the notion of being born in the east each day and then dying in the west uh, at sunset each day, essentially, right? And and that that I think is just interesting from a later perspective because then um, in the Hellenistic tradition, eventually, once the concept of the houses comes about, we have notion of like the native or the person who's born at a specific moment in time being associated with the east and with the ascendant and then later eventually concepts of like death um being associated initially with the seventh house or sometimes with the seventh house but sometimes then eventually that gets moved up one sector to the eighth house but still roughly associated with the western side of the horizon 
Yeah, exactly. Um, and and you see um, different, um, there's even different uh, sort of symbolic and mythological representations of these different moments. So just to choose the example of of the ascendant, the, this is often the, the horizon, uh, uh, ahet, so sometimes Horus is associated with the rising sun, Horus uh, on the horizon in, on the Ahet, uh, but also the, the beetle, the scarab beetle uh, is sometimes shown is kind of raising the sun up. And the, the beetle was the hieroglyph for um, Hepri, uh, which means to become or becoming. Uh, so there was a very rich symbolism associating uh, different moments in the solar cycle with different mythological episodes. And the, the culmination was always the, the divinity in the prime, uh, and then this, you know, birth, uh, the prime, uh, the decline to, to death in the underworld, and then the good burial in the, in the afterlife, which was associated with the underworld journey of the sun. Okay, so and that's really important. Just, which then is also important because sometimes the fourth house in the Hellenistic tradition eventually in the Greco-Roman tradition becomes associated with death or the concept of death um, in, a, in a practical sense, but already relatively early on in the Egyptian tradition through some of the solar mythology, we have notions of the, the underworld or the sun being under the earth being associated with death in a mythological sense. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's a, there's a there's a really uh, predominant uh, solar mythology uh, that that pervades all aspects, and it, it as I said, it it's um, part of temple liturgies, but also part of everyday funerary practice. Or not every day, but at least uh, people who um, had elaborate and could afford elaborate burials, the symbolism of the solar journey becomes an important part of uh, you know birth, death, uh, rebirth in the underworld and the afterlife. Okay, that seems really important just because it, it highlights some of the ambiguity that will come up later when we get into debates about what constitutes astrology and at what point are the Egyptians starting to do quote unquote astrology is just um, you know, some of these early ways in which they were mythologizing um or or creating mythological sort of stories surrounding astronomical phenomenon like the daily cycle of the sun. And, and the way in which we can see a sort of resonance between that and very specific um, astrological doctrines that would develop many, many centuries later during the Hellenistic tradition, there's a little bit of like an ambiguity there of where, where you might wonder at what point does it move from being something that we might label as mythology, and at what point does that become astrology at a certain point, uh, if that makes sense? No, that's a, that's a great point, actually. And um... You know, one of the things that I find exciting about looking at something like astrology that crosses cultural boundaries is that um, it can take on meaning, uh, multiple meanings in different contexts. So the system of the stars and astrology, um, uh, as uh, I'm sure a lot of your listeners know from, from your work and other work, um, starts to get integrated into various philosophical systems and natural philosophy systems in the in the Hellenistic and Roman world, where Stoics have this uh, well-developed sense of cosmology and a divine mind pervading the universe, directing the courses of the stars and giving signs to people, um, an idea of uh, sympathies between planets and what's going what planets in the heavens and what's going on on the earth. Um, but the same system, in a sense of the stars and astrology can also have different meanings in a different context. So in an Egyptian context, um, if they were still in touch with a lot of the old mythological traditions, um, someone living in Egypt um, might as well associate uh, the same stars with gods and divinities. And I think that's one of the fascinating things about uh, astrology in antiquity is that there are multiple different accounts of why the influences of the stars uh, or the planets might affect people on Earth. Um, you can have uh, kind of a natural philosophical Aristotelian sort of approach. You can have a Stoic philosophical approach, but you can also have an understanding of the stars as divinities that um, have an, an effect on it. And so um, I think to um, sometimes to to uh, see, you know draw too hard a line between uh, mythology and and astrology can can um, maybe obscure some of those ways in which astrology was interpreted in or understood in terms of one's cosmology 
differently in different cultural contexts, or even in the same cultural context, really. Um, different people had different explanations for why astrology worked. Yeah. Well, and also just just that um, when we see resonance, resonances of that with like the early Egyptian tradition and some of the solar mythology with some of the later practical, so quote unquote, like scientific astrology of the, the Greco-Roman period um, or the Greco-Egyptian period, just realizing that some of those later um, applications of astrology may have drawn inspiration from some of those earlier cultural and cosmological motifs that were based around astronomy and mythology and, and all these things. Um, so, all right, so that brings us back to one of the questions then that comes up eventually is like this, the Deccans basically then are the indigenous form of astrology to Egypt that go back at least a thousand or, or 2000 years BCE. Um, and so that's really the, if anybody wants to understand and really research as far as we know, in terms of the archeological record, like the actual indigenous astrology of Egypt, this would be it. Um, and this is prior to the development of natal astrology. So this is prior to the concept of birth charts and the Deccans are largely just being used early on, at least for these calendrical and timekeeping purposes. But then in the academic scholarship recently, there's been a debate about at what point did the Deccan start being used astrologically, because we can see in the Greek and Latin texts that eventually the Deccans sh start showing up in horoscopes and start being used in the concept, context of natal astrology. And so there's this question about well, at what point did they start being used explicitly for an astrological purpose, or, or did each of the Deccans start being ascribed individual meanings that could be interpreted astrologically. And this is where um, an important archaeological discovery comes in with the, the discovery through some underwater archaeology of the nous of the decades uh, starts becoming relevant at this point, I think, right? Right, right. I, I would just uh, add a few observations that uh, we, we might also make as we go along. I, I think the the decans are certainly a, a an a contribution to later astrology that that nobody would dispute uh, in some way because they do mm -hmm. work alongside the the zodiac and I I guess I would say that um, the decans could be understood as the Egyptian zodiac that is to say that they are the the band of stars that uh, mark positions in the sky in a way similar to the way the zodiac was developed in Mesopotamia. But um, you, there's also other little um, pieces that um, uh, came along which used the stars, but not really in the same way. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about these as we go along. But um, there does seem to have been some interest in omens, celestial omens of a kind. Uh, so when certain can, whenever um, Sirius, the this uh, the dog, the dog star, or Sothis. Uh, rose sometimes um, omens were taken uh, at that moment and they were interpreted for the health of the kingdom that year or something like that or whether there would be a good inundation and therefore prosperity in the kingdom uh, so there were there were um the the decans were a kind of zodiac um but at least in early stuff there doesn't seem to have been a lot of emphasis on the use of the decans for these kind of predictive purposes. I think the early things we have actually mostly go back to omens around the rising of, of Sothis. There were calendars of lucky and unlucky days, but that's more like a hemorology, as they call it, uh, seeing certain days in the calendar, often because of their mythological associations with a mythical event or a festival or something as being lucky or unlucky. Um, so there are kind of a set of loose connections that uh, there's a background in um, what you might call divination that's connected with time and timekeeping to a certain extent, the rising of stars. Um, but then, like you say, this uh, nous of the decades has been a, a focal point for um, debates about maybe the emergence of something a little bit different or evidence of something a little bit different, more more yeah. astrological, right? Well, and that's a good point, though, before we get there, just that the the annual rising of the Nile, that the beginning of the Egyptian year was associated with um, the helical rising of the fixed star Sirius, and they could see that around the time that Sirius made a helical rising and appeared um, from under the beams of the sun, that that 
uh, roughly coincided with when the Nile started to rise, and therefore they they tied their calendar to that. Exactly. Yeah. So the um, that's a fascinating uh, point about the calendar. Um, uh, as I said, it was quite earlier. It's quite an accurate solar calendar, but it was still a a, a three hundred and sixty day calendar. Um, so it did shift a little bit. So there was an ideal solar calendar um that uh however you know shifted over time relative to the seasons but it appears that um the egyptians were aware of this and they used a lunar calendar quite often that was a little bit more tied to the rising of uh sirius um, which kept pace with the seasons and they used this lunar calendar continued to use this lunar calendar often for um, celebrating festivals at local temples and so forth so there was a there's a kind of an interesting uh, disconnect there um, uh, we'll get to the Ptolemaic period in, in a in a second, and and uh, but remind me to to point out that there was actually an attempt to um, create a leap year system already in the Ptolemaic period. Okay, um, yeah. yeah. So that's important, though. And and one of the things I try to do is not take anything for granted, or not assume my audience knows anything, and not take anything for granted. So um, maybe a good point to clarify here is why was the flooding of the Nile important? Oh, yeah, no, great, great point. Yeah, everything in Egypt depended on the Nile. Um, so uh, this was a, a river valley civilization, and all of agriculture depended on the, the flooding of the Nile to irrigate lands in uh, on either side of, of the Nile in the valley. Um, and they developed a, a fascinating system of, of irrigation to catch the water and retain it in basins and then distribute it. Um, and it, not only that, it also brought uh, fertile soil to replenish the soil each year. So uh, there's a, a famous quote from the Greek historian Herodotus saying that Egypt was the gift of the Nile. Um, and uh, that is uh, you know, often quoted because it's in many ways true. The all of the fertility um, and the agricultural productivity of this country for thousands of years was entirely dependent on the cycle of, of flooding um, and replenishment of uh, of Egypt's um, uh, fertility. And so you can see why the the whole cosmology of of uh, and the mythology of Egypt was very closely tied to the land and an understanding of the land and its natural cycles. Yeah, and we can kind of see this from this like picture from space of just all of the the greenery and the things that are growing in Egypt are like growing along the Nile as it's stretching across the southern parts of Egypt as like a, as a, like a line, and then eventually you get to the Nile basin and you see um, many different. Uh, smaller like parts where the Nile breaks off, but you just see greenery gr growing all around those areas. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that was also a big part of uh, Egyptian understanding understandings of geography. There was the the Nile land, which was called thought of as the black land, the fertile land where everything is moist and and fertile and crops grow, and then the red land of the desert, the Gesseret, the the lands to the sides, which are kind of the lands of the dead. Um, and, you know, again, uh, just to go back to the solar point while we're on the geography, um, the land of the west, uh, the, the land of the setting sun on the west bank of the Nile was uh, usually understood as the land of the dead and where the great necropolis uh, collections of tombs of the kings were usually on the west bank of the Nile in the desert, in that dead land where the sun sets. Um, so those uh -huh. are, uh, you know, everything is tied that's together. Very, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a whole world that uh, we're inhabiting. It's really, as we go along, we're going to see really interesting connections between uh, the the geography and cultural geography, the, cu the cultural understanding of the land of Egypt, and then how that was related to this uh, newly emergent system of astrology. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, and then just to close out that point in that section, so this is why the Nile was so important. And the fact that they were tying the annual rising of the Nile when the Nile would rise and everything would flood and then eventually start growing for the growing seasons is that um, they were tying this into the sun and the rising, the heliacal rising or the appearance of a specific fixed star, Sirius or Th Sothis, which is also associated with one of the, the decans and then tied into the beginning of the calendar. This means that there was just an intimate relationship between Egyptian culture at a very fundamental level and some uh, astronomical cycles. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we see this uh, playing out in lots of interesting ways, both in terms of um, the whole country, the Pharaonic kingdom of Egypt, but also on a more personal level sometimes and thinking about uh, one's place in the cosmos. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That seems important. All right. So that's, that's a pretty good foundation. So then eventually we fast forward several hundred years and um, so they're not using the Zodiac at this point. Like the Zodiac is actually something that was developed in Mesopotamia, which is roughly coincides with modern day Iraq. Um, and the, the Mesopotamians are developing a Zodiac and they're also developing a complex mathematical astronomy based on focusing on the planets, the five planets, as well as the sun and the moon. And then also in Mesopotamia, they eventually develop the concept of natal astrology, which we'll get into. But um, for our purposes, a really important point in terms of the Deccans is we have this um, surviving stone structure that's been discovered recently, uh, which indicates that there was some sort of um, what we might call broadly like astrological associations with the Deccans eventually at some point in their history um, that, that were developed. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is a, a, a monument that uh, parts of which were known earlier, at least um, uh, even as early as the late 18th century. And uh, then other bits were discovered. And then uh, more recently, around 1999, um, as a result of uh, Frank Godio's uh, underwater excavations um, in the region of Canopus, which is a, a region just to the um, west of Alexandria, uh, and Alexandria itself uh, is in the northwest corner, roughly, of, of the delta of Egypt. Um, and so um, uh, various um, bits and pieces of this um, uh, had been discovered uh, previously, but they were assembled. And then um, a few years ago now, I think it was 2008, a, a full publication of all of the fragments together uh, was um, put together. And um, that allowed uh, gaps to be filled in and uh, presented some interesting uh, results uh, for understanding how uh, the Deccans uh, were viewed in a mythological, cosmological context um, that may have anticipated to a certain extent uh, the idea that uh, the Deccans um, uh, could be indicators uh, or agents of particular uh, effects in in the the world of Egypt. Yeah. So here's a picture of the book. So it's titled "The Nous of the Decades" uh, by Anne Sophie von Baumhard, and you can see it as this like stone structure that's broken into pieces. But they had like the top of it uh, quite a while ago, but the bottom pieces were basically rediscovered underwater. And um, what is a what is a nous? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Naos is uh, a, actually a Greek word for a temple, um, but it gets used in Egyptology as well to indicate um, shrines of various kinds. And um, these were actually the Naos uh, that we see in the, saw in those pictures. Uh, it's a black basalt miniature shrine, basically. It's not uh, not that big. It's not like a huge temple but it was used to house a sacred image of the god. In this case, uh, the god Shu, uh, the kind of god of the atmosphere and air, if you will, um, in the form of a lion. And I think if we have uh, uh, pictures of it, one of the pictures uh, of it shows the, the lion seated there. That's right. Um, seated in the shrine. And I believe it is understood that that picture engraved in the shrine uh, would be a representation of the actual uh, statue that was placed within the shrine. So the shrine was like a little house for the um, statue, which was given uh, worship and reverence um, by the Egyptian priests within the inner sanctuary of the temple. And this, right. oh yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. so the stone structure, this whole stone structure itself would have been placed in the temple or or somewhere central in the temple itself. 
Exactly. Yeah, these were um, very popular, interestingly, in the time when these were created. Uh, we know from the inscriptions on this particular one that it dates to the reign of Nectanebo I. Um, so it's about 380 to 362 BCE, so in the earlier part of the 4th century BCE. So again, we're before the conquests of Alexander, which set up uh, the Ptolemaic period, Ptolemaic rule, Ptolemaic dynasty, uh, which is when most of our um, astrology is, is going to happen. Um, this is before that, in the early 4th century uh, BCE. Right. And they were and a very I... popular kind of monument, these kind of black basalt um, shrines uh, throughout this whole dynasty. Yeah, And ironically, so Nectanebo I was the last, basically, Egyptian pharaoh before Alexander and before the Greeks and the Macedonians came in and conquered Egypt and then actually. Oh uh, yeah, actually, this one is they've. There's it's confusing. There's two names here. This is um, there's Nectanebo the first and Nectanebo the second, and mm. the second one is the one just before Alexander. Um, is the last one okay? Yeah. So Nectanebo the first is uh, as earlier in the same dynasty uh, though, um, and Nectanebo the second is the one in Egyptian. They actually have different names, um, but this is just the uh, the uh, Greek transliteration of them, which is confusing. <laughs> Got it. So that, okay. that's just wanted to point that out because it's it's a little bit uh, uh, it's just it's confusing. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you clarified that. So, but so this is towards the end of the just succession of of pharaohs basically in Egypt that have been going on for for thousands of years, and we have this stone monument that is made for the center of a temple. And you said that there would probably have been. So there's like written on it for those listening to the audio version. It's like this stone structure that looks like a little sort of house. And in the center of it, there is this engraving of a lion. And you were saying that there probably would have been a statue of the same lion that would be placed in the middle. Yeah. And it was probably a, a you know, valuable gold statue, gold and silver statue or wood covered in gold and silver. So it probably went missing at some point, <laughs> right? Um, and that's why we only have the uh, the Naos, the, and, the black basalt statue or uh, and, shrine. And there was something important in terms of the religious context about statues and the the th things surrounding that, right? Yeah, yeah. The um, uh, statues in uh, I mean, there's lots to say about. Uh, statues in ancient Egyptian religion, they were uh, believed to be li living images or living representations of, of the gods. Um, so, uh, and they were uh, very secret. Um, they were very pure. Uh, they were protected, especially in the later periods of Egyptian history with all kinds of um, uh, purity restrictions on those who could enter into their presence and handle them and so forth. Um, and uh, they were always put in the innermost part of the temple, except on some occasions, some of the statues would be brought out uh, to the wider population in a special shrine carried in, a, in what looks like a boat called a bark shrine, and it would come out of the temple, and then the general populace could offer uh, worship and, and adoration. Was that what you meant, or you had another? Yeah, just yeah. because I know there there's some things that kind of like pop up a little bit later in some of the hermetic tradition about the notion of statues being alive or or or... Um, something like that that goes back very early in the Egyptian tradition. Absolutely. Yeah, that's another great, I mean, you could do another, I think you have done some podcasts on hermeticism and astrology, isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, that's a really fascinating thing that's been discovered through Egyptology too, is um, uh, the uh, there's some arguments being made that some of the hermetic uh, theories and ideas about um, theurgy and the creation of divine living statues um, that are in texts like Iamblichus and so forth may go back in some ways to uh, ideas that were part of the House of Gold, um, as it was known in an Egyptian temple, which was the craft workshop where the sacred statues were made um, and uh, the kinds of rituals that were used to bring them to life. Um, one of the most common being the opening of the mouth ritual, which is a ritual that allowed the statue to kind of come to life and breathe and so forth. So these these statues, these Egyptian statues that would be housed in a naos were exactly that kind of living image of the god. Uh, so this is a very important uh, piece piece of sacred architecture that's protecting uh, this divinity. Right. Okay. So that's really important. 
And so one of the things we get that, you know, we should, I guess, move on to the, some of the astrological elements, but there are um, relief, you know, little relief sculptures on uh, parts of this little Naos temple uh, that have protective divinities on it as well to protect the statue um, and keep it safe to ward off harm and evil influences. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So let's talk about that and some of the things. So this stone structure um, you can see is inscribed with a bunch of different uh, figures, a bunch of different characters, as well as text. But the most important thing for our point, our purposes, is that inscribed on it are figures for each of the 36 decans, right? Exactly. Yeah. There's uh, 36 decans, and then uh, another representation for the five days, um, the five so-called epigominal days, um, which go um, uh, between the the end of one year and the beginning of the next. Um, uh, in order to get up to 365, obviously, you need five days, <laughs> 36 decades, uh, decades of 10 days, and then there's five extra days. So there's a representation of those as well. So it's the full, um, it's a full representation of the Egyptian calendar year um, in astral terms. Okay, got it. Because the decans, while they're associated with certain fixed stars, eventually that would rise uh, every 10 days, and then it would change every 10 days, they then eventually that was transferred into being 10 day periods of the calendar itself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there, it's a bit confusing. People usually use the term decade to refer to the 10 day periods, and then decan <laughs> to refer to this constellation, the star, uh, uh, the um, astrological symbol. Um, but Got they're it. both, they're the same. Uh, they're related concepts, obviously, because one is used to mark the other. Got that it. is, the stars okay. are used to mark the, the decades, the 10 day periods. Got it. So, um, so what's really important about this is that it doesn't just list the decans, but it's suddenly, in terms of Egyptian history, it's unique because it starts associating specific um, like effects or manifestations or outcomes or, or ideas and what might be broadly associated with what we might call mundane astrology, things that are supposed to represent or relate to large groups of people astrologically. And we start seeing individual interpretations basically associated with each of the decans in this um, stone monument. Yeah, exactly. And that's the interesting part here is that um, the the decan each decan is laid out in a little square with um, some uh, figures uh, we'll talk about in a sec. But then next to it is a set of hieroglyphic texts in in columns that then detail um, what this decan does, as it were. What does it do? And I guess we could do. You want to pick one out and and just read an example or a sample? Do we have? I think one? that would be great. I didn't. Do you happen to have one? Like I'm trying to get one together right now. If I you can have just, one, we could flip to one at random, and it'll be okay. like some sort of random lot. Let's hope it's not too bad. But yeah, uh, some bibliomancy. Right, exactly. We'll do some bibliomancy here. So um, it's going to be. It's going to say something like, "You will have a terrible podcast," and uh, <laughs> yeah, it right. says that. Then close the book. Yeah, I, I'll, I'm going to. You know, I'll, I'll preview it first. Um, okay. Let me see. Let us find a. a uh, here we go. Um, uh, um, let me find a, f a nice full one that has. Uh, yeah, and that, that also did, will not curse this podcast. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so here, this is it says uh, the translation of uh, one of them for the for decade number nine, uh, which is the third month of the of Achet, uh, days twenty one to day thirty, associated with a particular decan. Um, then says the great god at the beginning. For this is Sophie von Baumhardt's translation. The great God at the beginning, it is he who causes massacres, who brings war, carnage, fury, and turmoil. It is he who sends miasma to all foreign countries after having defeated them by fighting with tenacity. It is he who brings the rain from the sky and who kills all the small cattle of the desert. Mm -hmm. So kind of negative, kind of negative. Right, like that one, and a, and a lot of them are kind of negative, but they're like broadly relating to almost like disasters or other things in in a mundane astrological context. They're referring to like the population as a whole. 
Exactly. Yeah. So most of them um, refer to uh, the emergence of, of diseases or wars or, or um, famines, sometimes political events, sometimes things striking Egypt, sometimes things striking neighboring uh, countries of Egypt. Um, uh, very few of them are positive. Um, one or one or two, actually, interestingly, the ones near the new year, um, the beginning of the, the cycle, when the inundation is coming, um, that's one of the few where there's mention of that Deccan being, the, I believe, the Lord of Life or a life-giving kind of sign. But most of them are, are quite negative, and um, uh, that's been a little bit hard to explain because the, the Deccans um, uh, in later practice don't seem to be all universally negative. Um, they're uh, often a, they're assigned different rulerships or different um, you know uh, planets that they're associated with, some of which are benefic and some are are uh, you know malefic. but uh, these are mostly pretty negative. Um, yeah, I remember, I think I was reading in it that von Baumhard speculates that maybe it had to do something to do with like the protective function of the Deccans for like the country as a whole or something like that. And there's still a lot of mystery surrounding um, this text and what function the Deccans are serving and also how they might be used in, di in different ways in that period. Yeah, exactly. I think there's two things going uh, on here. Um, this um, uh, this shrine uh, we know from the inscriptions was originally placed at um, a, actually in the eastern delta, um, uh, way on the eastern edge of the delta, um, uh, at a place called Saft al Hena, which was a borderland region. Um, and um, the god Shu there was associated with the god Sopad, who was um, a protective god that protected the frontiers of, of Egypt. And so, um, uh, and the in the mythology that's described in this text, there's a, in addition to the text on the Deccans, there's a mythological text that um, uh, describes the god. Um, uh, it seems that the god has a, um, there's an association between Shu and this protective god. And so one of the roles of the Deccans, which are under the power of uh, the god Shu, is as a protector of Egypt. Um, and so that's one of the reasons they might be negative is a lot of this is like these fierce divinities that are um, protecting Egypt against adversaries. But there's a couple of other, uh, this often happens in Egyptian mythology. There's multiple uh, mythological structures that are referred to in the same text. Um, and there's also a, um, a part of a text that's a creation text that's um, inscribed on it, um, which describes uh, uh, the a creation myth, and there were several in, in Egypt, but this is a part of a creation with creation myth in which uh, the god Shu um, uh, and uh, separates uh, Nut, the sky, from Geb, the earth, and kind of raises it up. Um, and uh, some allusions in the text, uh, as uh, the editor points out, and he, uh, the translator of the text points out, some allusions in the text seem to refer to a, a moment in the creation uh, myth uh, of the Egyptians in which there's a rebellion against the sun god Ra uh, by um, humanity and they are destroyed. Um, and so uh, it may be that also in the context of this um, uh, this particular naos, because it involves uh, Shu, uh, the role of the decans as beings that bring uh, certain things to earth um, is a role that sees them punishing humanity in various ways. Okay. So there's a there's a mythological context that uh, makes it make sense that these are largely um, hostile and negative effects that are described. Got it. And um, the god Shu was associated with um, the winds. And I know the right. translator and the author of the book, von Baumhard, um, says that the reason the god Shu is so prominent here with the Deccans is because of that association with the winds and because the winds were thought to be what was carrying up um, the sun and the other stars and the Deccans themselves and sort of like causing in a way the diurnal rotation of like rising and culminating and setting each day. 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, the 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 shoot the winds of Shu kind of carry the stars and planets and the sun and, and moon along, um, almost as if they're sailing uh, through the air, uh, which is a very common um, uh, image in Egypt. So, and it's also interesting that um, uh, uh, Egyptians, uh, you know, fragmentary Egyptian astrological texts often make a um, connections between winds and stars, and sometimes uh, predictions of. Um, uh, of um, of an astral kind also involve uh, references to winds blowing at certain times when a certain phenomena comes along, and that may be related uh, to this kind of idea, perhaps. So, yeah, the, um, the what's interesting also is in this cosmological text we get um, something of a mythological definition of the role of the decans, um, which uh, I think is quite fascinating. Uh, they are really seen as agents of the gods. Um, uh, they are referred to in different points in the text as um, uh, workers, basically. And in fact, the term baktiu um, is related to uh, the Egyptian word a bak, which means uh, a servant or a worker. Uh, and so the Deccan seem to be subordinated to these higher gods uh, like the sun god and Shu um, and do their bidding, basically. Uh, so they're sort of intermediaries between the higher gods and earth. And they carry out, the, uh, sometimes they're referred to in this text as carrying out the decrees of the god Thoth, or, or being his emissaries. Sometimes they're agents of Shu, uh, the god of, of the air and the atmosphere and the winds. Um, and sometimes they're referred to as this, just the souls of the gods. Um, and so that gives us kind of an understanding of, of the place where they fit in the, in the cosmology of, of ancient Egypt. And that's, of course, really interesting and, and relevant because then later in the um, some of the Hermetic astrological texts, which may have been influenced by some Egyptian ideas later in the Greco-Roman period in the first and second and third centuries, the Deccans become associated with um, spirits or diamonds. And those are said to be like intermediaries between the, the human world, uh, the sublunary sphere world uh, where humans live versus the the um, planets and the other gods and the fixed stars. Exactly. Yeah. You know, occasionally, sometimes these figures are, you know, loosely translated as the, that is the Deccan figures are sometimes loosely translated as demons or daimons because they play that kind of messenger role that is the behind the, uh, the idea of the daimon in, in Greek tradition. So yeah, it's, I think there's some interesting connections and translation between uh, earlier Egyptian ideas of the functions of these gods and um, what we see in later texts. Yeah. And there's also something really important here that's embedded in this text that uh, von Baumhard brings out and she doesn't emphasize in terms of the later tradition but i but that immediately struck me coming from the perspective of later hellenistic astrology several centuries later which is um she has these sections talking about the decans and when they do work um when they come to like the ascendant or the midheaven um essentially or what we would associate the the eastern horizon or when they culminate overhead and they're said to be doing work because that's when um, you know, you can use them in order to tell what time it is, um, as if they become more active when they hit those astronomical sectors of the sky. Um, and that's very, to me, reminiscent of the later Hellenistic concept in Greek called krematistikos, which is the different sectors of the chart or the different um, houses, which are primarily the first house and tenth house, where planets are said to become busy or said to become um, more active in some way in terms of their ability to either produce astrological effects or in terms of being able to um, just be prominent in terms of indicating certain things about a person's life and their birth chart. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the um, other uh, interesting revelations about this text is that, um, uh, that in each of these representations of a decade, there are also these uh, uh, different figures um, one of which seems to represent the, um, uh, according to von Baumhard's uh, uh, interpretation, one seems to represent uh, the the heliacal appearance uh, of the decad, and then the others represent these different cardinal points. Um, there's and there's some debate between different interpreters on this because it's it's very there's just pictures and very terse little captions next to them, <clears throat> so it's a little hard to interpret. 
um, and different scholars have come to different conclusions about which is the more the, the most effective part and with what's doing what. But they all seem all the scholars seem to agree that there's some relationship between these um, uh, cardinal points and the effects of the decans that they have particular effects at different or are more effective at these times. So uh, that debate will will continue, I'm sure. But um, there's there's a concept there, a concept of um, uh, you know angles or points being more effective. And you mentioned the first and the tenth house, of course, that would be the the rising and the culminating um, uh, house, uh, uh, right? So so and it seems to be that the rising descending culminating at midheaven and and the uh the the fourth house i guess what we would call the the house below the point of invisibility um in uh in terms of the the way the decans are talked about those are the ones that are represented in this little uh sort of breakout chart of of the the decans and their positions right that's part of her interpretation because she tries to connect it with a later text that we know from Hephaestio that's this like mysterious text um that was said to be associated with the decans and that that does mention like the rising and culminating and setting and anti-culminating decans in particular is being particularly important for some reason and there's some possibility that that could have been tied in with this earlier tradition associated with the nows of the decades that's right. Yeah, no, there's dispute about this. Um, you know, there's always debate as people um, try to arrive at different interpretations of, of these, um, you know, very terse and difficult to read texts. Um, so some people have different theories about it. Um, but uh, it, it does seem that in, in some way, uh, I don't know if it's the right word, but angularity sort of plays a role, if you will. Right. That is, yeah. uh, the being close to one of these points seems to have an effect on on the um, uh, the, the power or the effect of the decan. Yeah, and there was one other point, and I might have to get my copy of the book to look this up really quickly, but it, it was something in von Baumhardt emphasizes about there being like a, a poking or a stinging notion associated with those places where the where the decans are doing work. Um, do you remember that point or remember what that was about? I'm afraid I don't remember it. <laughs> All right. Um, let me let me grab my book really quickly because it's kind of an important point. I'll be I'll be right back. So one of the things that's relevant is just she also brings in another book that she says is important and tied into all of this, which is called The Book of the Fundamentals of the Course of the Stars, she said is formally called The Book of Newt. And do you know, are you familiar with that work? Yeah, yeah. This is um, a, um, a text that has a long tradition. Um, uh, there was a publication several years ago now by Alexandra von Leeuwen of uh, the um, this this book on a papyrus version, but it seems to be commenting on uh, inscriptions that are on monumental sites, temples, for instance, um, and those uh, they are representations of the the sky goddess Nut um, and the passage of the stars uh, through Nut and in the sky. And so uh, this is where uh, there are there's a mythology of the the stars um, passing through the body of Nut um, and then coming out and being visible again um, uh, that explains their um, visibility and, and disappearance. And um, uh, this includes the the movement of the decans um, as well. So uh, this is what's fascinating is that the uh, Again, this this demotic text, I believe, dates to the Roman period, but it's commenting on uh, relief and relief sculptures and inscriptions depicting the sky goddess note uh, that go back, you know, almost a thousand years earlier. Um, so that's a really important point, the sky goddess note, because we should be like mentioning some of those mythological things as we go, because I know those are going to come up very prominently when we start looking at some of the for example, like the the sealing zodiacs from different temples. Um, but what was the goddess that was associated with the sky? Yeah, that's Nut, um, uh, N-U-T. This is a, a goddess of the sky. Um, and so there's the, the, the higher upper sky and then uh, Shu, who's kind of like the atmosphere and the winds and so forth. Um, and then Geb is the earth. And so in these depictions, they vary sometimes, but um, Shu is sometimes shown holding up uh, Newt 
um, as the kind of dome of the sky, and then Geb is the earth. Um, and uh, the uh, <clears throat> so it's a kind of a representation representation of cosmology um, or a description of the world. Um, but the stars um, are sometimes in these texts imagined as uh, disappearing when they enter the body of Newt and then reappearing when they emerge from uh, the body of Newt. Um, and that uh, is, you know, one of the ways they explain visibility and invisibility of stars. Okay. So when we see some of the re representations um, later on, when we get to some of the coffin lids that contain zodiacs and we see like a female figure in the middle of the zodiac signs, that goddess is what we're seeing. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, all right, I pull out the book, and, and one of the things she, it's, it's in the appendix, but one of the things Von Baumhardt's pointing out is she says that, so uh, the she says the, the culmination of the decans in the middle of the sky lasts approximately another four months. For the Egyptians, the main interest of the decanal stars was that they permitted the determination of the hours of night in order to regulate rites. Only during the time of the culmination does a, does a decan assume this function of marking the hours. And that notion of marking the hours is like really important because that comes up later in the Hellenistic tradition for the term for the ascendant um, was horoscopos in Greek, which literally translated means hour marker. And so there's some sort of connection there between the what became the primary um, Greek or, or Hellenistic term for the ascendant and this like earlier Egyptian tradition of using the, the, the decans to mark the hours or to to designate what hour is essentially and that also became tied in with i think the egyptian um like name for some of the priests that did that i think became at some point that same term right like our our marker exactly yeah <clears throat> this is the um the priest known as an imi wenut uh which just means sometimes he who is in his hours or overseeing the hours so it's the hour priest has a specific function in in liturgies of observing the stars, uh, marking the hours as they passed, and so observing uh, when they reach their culmination point. And um, there are they use these very basic sighting sticks uh, to just measure the elevation of the stars and see when they had reached their um, culminating point. And once they had that, that was um, the precise moment uh, of of the 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 hour represented by that decan. Okay, so that specific role of the priests of like telling time and being able to tell time, because nowadays it's something we take for granted and it's like easy to look up the time. But back then, that wasn't necessarily such an easy thing to do. And especially if time is crucially significant for that, that there's certain religious rituals that should only be done at certain points in time, that's actually becomes a very crucial role to be able to be the one who's able to tell definitively like what time it is or what time it will be in order to prepare for certain things exactly yeah um and they also devised various uh, devices for this um uh, there were we have water clocks um attested that you know use draining water over time to mark the passage of hours and those are marked with uh, various kinds of uh, symbols in fact for uh uh th these hourly um uh figures that we were talking about um, and there's also, you know, sundials that are attested from Egypt, but ultimately it was the responsibility of uh, this priest of the hours um, to make these observations and uh, to determine the correct hours. Okay, so that's really important. And then that becomes essentially, eventually like an astronomical role. And it's those priests that eventually have some astronomical training in this period that we're kind of talking about roughly or start having some astronomical role by the time of the nows of the decades yeah um they go back even even further but we also start to see um uh around from around this period um uh we see that there are there's a, a statue um sometimes called the statue of harhebi um which is a, a statue of one of these priests and the texts on this statue celebrate his roles uh, both in terms of timekeeping, um, that is his ability to know when the stars are rising and count the hours and, and the months and so forth. Um, but there's a few passages in his biographical inscription that also praise his ability to 
um, possibly foretell things on the basis of um, the rising of, of Sirius again. So um, uh, this may be, this is uh, another piece of evidence that suggests that there may have been uh, something of um, uh, an astrological tradition uh, in Egypt or a tradition of prediction based on um, stellar phenomena that was carried out by uh, a certain member of the priesthood. Okay. Um, trying to, you don't happen to have his, I wish I'd written da it down, like part of his, um, like what was written down that he said. Um. I could probably find uh, it. It might take me a moment, um, but uh, let me just see if I can find um, that text. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. here it is. I have it. Um, this is, uh, or did did you find it? Because I, I found a copy of a translation of his text that uh, we can read, and you give a sense of the the tenor of it. Would you like me to read that? Yeah, I'll have you do it because I will absolutely butcher all pronunciations. So oh. <laughs> you you take it. All right, great. Um, so the yeah, this is a translation. Uh, there's several available. This is a translation by Andreas Winkler in an article he published recently, um, and this is his uh, biography. Um, it says the prince, governor, and unique friend who is educated in the sacred script. That is the Medu Necher who has seen all that is visible on earth and in the sky, who is educated in observing the stars, along which, uh, among which, sorry, there is no erring, who announces the rising and the setting in their time together with the gods that foretell the future. So that's, a, that's the thing, one of the significant passages there. So we have in this biography, him talking about his usual duties as one of these hour priests, but he's also talking about the stars, the gods that foretell the future. Um, and then it goes on. After he has purified himself for them in their days of coming forth, when the effective one, Ah, was beside the phoenix. Um, so this is uh, probably a reference to a creation story. Above them, so that he is able to pacify them with his utterances, uh, the one who sees the rising of every star in the sky, who knows the coming of, and there's a gap in the text, something to do with the great inundation and everything which will come into being in a perfect year. The one who foretells, once again, the coming forth of Sothis in the beginning of the year, seeing her in her first feast, who calculates her tra trajectory uh, to the times of touching the ground, who observes all that she makes so that everything that she foretells is in his hand, the one who knows the northern and southern path of the sun disk, who announces all its omens and their revelations, and so on. I think those are the main uh, references. So you had, had a couple of references to um, omens having to do with uh, celestial phenomena, and prominent among those was, of course, once again, the rising of, of Sothis. Um, uh, and uh, not only the rising of it, but also... Um, and this is something that I think we sometimes, you know, along with timekeeping, you were mentioning earlier that we take for granted. Um, one of the great skills of an astrologer in antiquity was actually simply predicting the movements of the planets themselves and the stars themselves, knowing when a particular phenomenon was going to happen. This was part of their uh, their learning and their lore was simply being able to calculate when something was going to happen. Uh, and so knowing the precise time and being able to calculate the precise day when something as fixed and regular as the rising of Sirius uh, was going to happen was was um, more than we might think it was, you know. So this was their skill. They could not only predict what the movements of the heavens were going to be, but they could also predict what they foretold and what they signified. Yeah, which is really important because that's actually much more complicated back then and involved much more uh, mathematics and calculation and and sort of high level um, skills in in doing something that's not necessarily easy. So so one of the things about this is that this author, because you could have you could also read this like very emphatically or dramatically that he's really talking about like all these things that he's capable of doing as part of his role. Uh, as the temple like astronomer 
And um, that's one of the reasons why in later times in the Greek tradition, eventually one of the words for astrologer came to be mathematikos, which means like mathematician because of all the, the calculations and all the math that's involved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I think that's, uh, I think uh, you recently did an episode on doing charts by hand, right? Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, that involves a certain amount of mathematics, but it's um, not too difficult. You can you can do it uh, with a paper and some uh, basic formulas, and you can calculate it out. Um, in, all ancient astrologers, of course, had to do this. Uh, they had to do it uh, from um, uh, less good tools as well, and they had to use various kinds of tables that were the equivalent of an, of an ephemeris table that a modern astrologer used in the 20th century primarily, um, where you take, you know, uh, the position of planets and so forth at a particular point and then have to interpolate for the correct time between two points. And those are the exactly, I think, you know, pretty close to the same kinds of calculations that a lot of astrologers would have to do themselves. And so the skill in being able to do it um, and do it correctly was a huge part of their art. Um, in antiquity, yeah, and this is <clears throat> and this is really important also because it's not some. This is um, especially determining the positions of the planets was something that was only to only figure it out, and they all, only started developing models for being able to predict accurately where the planets would be in the future and the past, especially during the course of the first millennium BCE, from like one thousand BCE until about let's say the first century CE, um, that this was something that um, took different cultures like a long time initially, especially in the Mesopotamian tradition to do based on many centuries of like going out every night and observing the positions of the planets, which look like different stars and, and observing that they would move sometimes very slowly from night to night and writing that down. And then eventually um, recording that and starting to notice periods in which those placements would recur. So noticing that like Saturn every 30 years will come up around to approximately the same position or noticing that Venus will go retrograde in the same position roughly every eight years and eventually building up these um, large libraries of observations eventually led to them being able to come up with different models for planetary movement which which led to the development of like a complex or advanced mathematical astronomy. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, a lot of this, what's interesting is uh, we've just been talking about uh, the nous of the decades, and we were just brought up this statue of Harkebi, which has an inscription describing him and his his skill. Um, Harkebi's statue is um, dated to the um, probably the reign of the second Nectanebo we were talking about, or to the early Ptolemaic period. Um, so somewhere uh, right in this transition, just before Alexander the Great, that's the, the scholarly uh, consensus anyway. Um, so these are all uh, from roughly the same period, fourth century um, BCE, these this now so the decades in the statue. Um, and it's also um, uh, around this time, uh, you know, just a little bit earlier than this, that really um, horoscopic astrology seems to be developing in Babylonia, right? Um, so we have some of the, you know, some people would argue some elements of it are go way back earlier, of course, with omens, but some of the first kind of, uh, you know, um, the zodiac as we know it, um, some early kinds of natal uh, horoscopic astrology or proto horoscopes um, is developing around the same time too. Yeah, and it, and it depends what you define as horoscopic astrology, and that's a debate and a definition thing that we'll get into. Mm -hmm. um, but really quickly to wrap up the now of the decades sections, the last thing that Baumhart that von Baumhart says was just this period of culmination and marking the night hours represents the quote unquote work of the decans over a total of 120 days. Following this last culmination, the star's quote unquote work is done, and it moves west of the meridian and begins to decline. Um, but on the very next page, on page 237, she has this point about um, Sirius and some of the different names, and maybe you can um, help me with this, but she says both of the names for um, Sirius, but also for one of the forms of Shu, 
as associated with the Deccans. She says both names are spelled with a pointed thorn, a hieroglyph that represents the idea of pointed, stinging, acute, but also ready, prepared, and providing. And then she says the sense of quote unquote stinging particularly fits the warrior god Shu Sopid. And the notion of providing fits Sirius as the herald of the Nile flood. I just wanted to draw attention to that because that's really important because of, or it, it creates a, there's like a resonance or there's there's a possible connection there that immediately comes to mind for me, which is later in the Hellenistic tradition, this term for the angular houses, for the for especially the eastern horizon and the midheaven was kentron, which mm -hmm. means center, but it also means anything that is pointy that um, pokes or prods something into action, like a cattle prod. Um, and that was the Greek term that was used for the angular houses. And that's one of the reasons why the angular houses were thought to make the planets busy, because they sort of like prodded or goaded them into action. And there's something interesting here about how she's seeing some similar sort of theme there, perhaps in the, the earlier Egyptian tradition. Yeah, yeah. Um I I the um the this was a common thing to see in Egyptian texts is this kind of wordplay between similar sounding things or things with similar signs. Uh, and so yeah, sopadu is the uh, uh Egyptian word for Sirius or Sothis uh, as it's kind of transliterated into Greek. Um, and it's very similar to um, uh, sepadet, uh, sepadet, as it would have been pronounced without the T at the end in, in later Egyptian. Um, and so um, uh, there's a, a set of um, uh, connotations here. Um, I think the, um, that, um, I guess, to connect it with the decans and, and angularity, I guess the sopadu marks a, a real transition point, the beginning, the sothis rising is the beginning of the annual cycle in a way. So in a way, I guess it's a, um, a sort of annual rising or an, a, an annual ascendant uh, for the entire cycle. Um, and so that, that might be um, uh, the connection there, although um, you know, so and and it's, you know, it, like it says earlier in the text, Sirius is the heralds the rise of the first decan, and so it's the ruler of the decans. Um, it's the it's kind of, if you will, I guess, although they don't say this explicitly in the tech, I, text, I, I think we have to be clear, it's sort of like the ascendant of the whole cycle, if you will. Sure. Yeah. And then I just wasn't sure. So you're saying, and what the connection is with Shu and Shu being um, the god that was associated with all of the the decans in this text, partially because it's carrying each of them to the places where they do work, um, especially the the ascendant and, and the midheaven. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so Shu directs the decans. Um, it's seen as the kind of the the, the ruler director. So there's um, there's a lot of other mythological associations there too. In that um, uh, Shu is uh, also the one who. Um, uh, persuades the the goddess Tefnut to come back from her exile, and that myth is associated with the rising of Sirius and the return and the inundation. We'll get into that a little bit more, I think, when we talk about the the Hathor ceilings. Uh, but Shu is often associated with a, a warrior god, um, but also plays this role of um, um, persuading the goddess to come back uh, to return um, because she's being distant, and therefore restart another cycle of inundation and creation. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, there's a bunch of tightly interlocked mythological references uh, going on here uh, where different elements are playing multiple roles. And, and you know, that's, that's uh, sort of, you know, important too, because the the goddess is also associated with uh, the eye of Ra, the, the, the eye of the sun god. And of course, at the summer solstice, which is near around the, you know, not far from the rising of, of uh, Sirius, that's when this, um, the sun's course starts to change, um, you know, in, in its you know, apparent path through the sky um, uh, shifts um, uh, and starts moving the other direction um, mm. as you change the seasons. So there's a bunch of interesting um, uh, parallels there. Um, 
I, I'm not sure about, I, I, I'm not sure, um, but like the Kentron Goad thing is very interesting, um, but I, I don't know how to make the connection between um, the, those mythological references and the the decans and their various culminating points, except through Sirius, which serves as a kind of beginning point. And this will become maybe that that's not nothing because I think we're going to take a little bit a look a little bit later on at the so-called Thema Mundi or the chart of the nativity of the world, where uh, there's an important ascendant position associated with um, uh, the you know Sothis. Right. Okay. Um, and yeah, I just wasn't sure if there's a connection through, like you said, she said homophony, and you said that, which is like a play on words sometimes that connects different terms. And what what is that again? Yeah, Egyptian uh, Egyptian uh, scribes and scholars and just Egyptians in general seem to have loved um, homonyms, things that sound the same. Um, and mm -hmm. so connections were often made between um, uh, uh, names of gods or things or anything really that sounded similar. And so there's an association between them that's created, but also uh, writings, visual writings of things can be playful and make references between uh, two different things. And it's kind of partly poetic, but it also in the Egyptian system of representation, these kinds of connections took on a more important significance. They weren't entirely just word wordplay. There could be sometimes a sense that were that there was a more intrinsic connection um, between uh, two different things because of either the similarity of their writing or the sound when they were spoken verbally. Yeah, like a sympathy. It makes me think of like the later concept of sympathy or or how that comes up sometimes in astrology, where astrologers then would later make connections between things through uh, similarity of meaning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it, it's a very Egyptian thing to do, engage in that kind of wordplay. You sort of see it everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, that's important. And then there, there's also like a, a microcosm, macrocosm concept that exists also earlier in ancient Egyptian thought. But really quickly before we move on this point, and just is, she says that um, the god of shoe that's associated, the form of shoe that's associated with the Deccans is... Um, spelled with a pointed thorn is that true as far as you know yeah i think it'd be nice to find a, i don't I think we have to flip around in the book and find one of the hieroglyphic um writings um oh wait she there's figure 59 yeah yeah right in the in the illustration uh, below there uh there's at least um uh Sopadu, um I don't know if you can see in the upper left of figure A4, there's a little conical looking thing. Okay. And that's the pointy thorn thing. <laughs> Got it. Okay. It's, yeah. Yeah. So um, it's true. Yeah. there It is true that there's a point. Um, uh, uh, whether we can, can I think it, Egyptians might have connected. I'm not sure. I, it's, it would be hard. To, I'd have to trace through and find text to see if there's a connection that's made by Egyptians between angularity like culminating points and um, these spellings of the different names yeah and there's no documented connection at this point and i don't think i've seen anybody else either in ancient text or in modern text make that connection is just a resonance that i noticed that i wonder if that's accidental or if there was something there that maybe there was some sort of connection um in terms of those concepts so it might be worth exploring more yeah, at some point. yeah it's an we'll, interesting idea yeah. we'll see yeah um all right so to wrap up the section with the nows of the decades, and then I want to take a little break and then we'll come back and move on. So this text at this point is just it's describing mundane astrology. As far as we know, this is not, as far as we can tell at this point, is not related to individual birth charts, like nativities, but instead it's just referring to large groups of people such as cities and nations, as well as like natural phenomenon and some sort of potential connection between the decans or the fixed stars and things that are happening on Earth, which in the broadest sense we would associate, I think, with, with astrology, or one could argue that that's essentially um, some form of astrology at this stage in Egyptian history. Yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, there is a connection between um, the stars and up in the heavens and their influence down on Earth. And uh, it's um, uh, it's definitely, you know, if mundane astrology counts as astrology, then it's kind of related to that. Um, 
Uh, it's not natal astrology, um, as you said, but it's uh, a version of um, relating uh, beings in the heavens uh, to their action on earth, and those beings are associated with the stars. And I think it's also really interesting uh, that um, it gives us a glimpse into how once again, how the mechanisms of astrology were thought to work in this period. These are divine beings that have power over uh, the uh, the world below. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. Sure. And and we don't exactly know what the mechanism what the mechanism is. Um, and if this is just a matter, if this is a matter of like celestial influences or if this is a matter of just um signs of, of them being omens and not necessarily causes of those things, even if they signify something happening. Um, so we don't have to get into questions about the the mechanism of astrology that come up later in the Hellenistic period, where we start having notions of like celestial of change being um, sent down from the planets to the sublunary cosmos and then influencing the elements and all of this more complex mechanistic stuff from that gets involved with the Greek philosophy, but at least there's some sort of connection between the Deccans and like events that are happening on Earth. And to the extent that that's true, then I think at this stage, we definitively by, let's say the fourth century BCE, have some astrology, some legitimate form of astrology that's occurring in the Egyptian astrological tradition. Right. And, and we have, an, um, in addition to Egyptian astrology, and uh, I guess we can talk about this after the break too, um, there's a, a few other signs that um, Egyptian uh, scribes and scholars are already interacting with a wider world of astrological ideas uh, that are coming from Mesopotamia um, in this period. So, and that's so that's also interesting. Uh, so we have both Egyptian ideas starting to emerge, at least according to this this interpretation of the Naus um, and Harkebi, but also we have stuff coming from elsewhere that may be um, part of the fertile mixture that's uh, taking place in Egypt. Right. Yeah, that's very important. All right. Uh, well, let's take a little bit of a break. Um, all right. So we're back from our break. Um, before we get started with the second part of this, I wanted to just briefly give a shout out to and mention some of the different scholars that we're drawing on um, who we might be different papers. I know we've already mentioned um, a couple of people, such as Anne Sophie von Baumhard, who wrote the book on the Nous of the Decades. Um, and I might put on the description page for this episode on the Astrology Podcast website, like a list of some resources or some of the the, the different scholars that we drew on who are influential in this talk. Um, you know, because it's more of a discussion, we're not necessarily like doing citations, like every time there is something from different people, but we still want to give credit and we also want people to know where they should go to, to learn more and to research more of the things that we've been researching in preparation for this episode. Um, I know earlier you mentioned a paper by Andreas Winkler, and and I know both of us have been, you know, really impressed by and influenced by his work recently on demotic astrology over the past decade. Do you know what the title of that paper was that you were drawing on earlier? Yeah, it was called Stellar Scientists, I believe, um, and it's a it's a great overview um, of uh, uh, you know um, astrology as it was practiced in the Egyptian temple context. So, so those priests that we've been talking about, and I quoted a section of his translation of the statue of uh, Harhebi, also known as Harantebo. There's different ways of reading his name, and uh, Winkler actually prefers Harantebo. So. Got it. Okay. So, um, so yeah, his paper, which is titled Stellar Scientists, the Egyptian Temple Astrologers, um, is out there. And he has a number of other papers, some of which we're actually going to mention later in this episode. So we can talk about that later. Um, who are some of the other? I know, um, for example, uh, Maria Escalano Poveda is another person that's done work on demotic astrology that we, we may mention later. So we want to give her a shout out. Um, I was reading and I was rereading actually and was re-impressed by some discussions um, that I want to bring up here in a little bit once we get into natal astrology and the Egyptian um, god called Shai, the god of fate. And I was rereading some of Dorian Greenbaum's discussions and coming to like a much better understanding of actually how impressive and um, interesting some of her work on all of that has been and how um, she was doing some good stuff in terms of connecting some of the earlier Egyptian concepts with some of the other concepts that eventually developed in Hellenistic astrology. So that's a, another one I want to give a shout out to. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love her work on the Hellenistic daimon. That's really great. And uh, another person that uh, we draw a lot on um, who's just pr produced a, an enormous amount of stuff on astrology is uh, Joachim Gvak, a uh, Heidelberg professor of Egyptology who really specializes in the texts of the late period and, and demotic. Um, also, Alexandra von Leven has produced really excellent stuff um, on uh, the uh, the fundamentals of the course of the stars that we were mentioning earlier, um, and many other works as well on, on astrology. It's uh, There's a lot of stuff out there um, emerging over the last uh, generation or so uh, from these Egyptologists working in this material. Who are some of the other people we were going to mention? Um, um, there's Alexandra von Leeuwen, as somebody you mentioned yeah. earlier, that you drew on with the course of the stars. Um, I showed a picture early on of the Deccans from the work uh, Egyptian Astronomical Text by Otto Neugebauer and Richard Parker, which is a huge, like major landmark publication that has just a ton of stuff for astronomy and astrology of, of Egypt. Yeah, yeah, really fundamental early work uh, that put, put a lot of this stuff uh, out there for um, scholarly and other audiences to work with. Really great stuff. Um, I think, uh, you know, later there's some uh, texts that have been published by Kim Ruholt, a uh, Danish uh, or Reiholt, uh, um, a Danish uh, scholar, also working in these late uh, demotic texts. Um, we'll try and mention people as we go, but it's uh, it's uh, great for uh, everyone out there listening to know that there's all these scholarly resources that you can turn to and and really dig in deeper if you want with uh, uh, with this material we're talking about. Yeah. Um, also, did you mention Christian Leitz? Oh yeah, Christian Leitz. Yeah, is uh, also written a, a ton of stuff on um, ancient Egyptian calendars and astronomy and astrology and so forth. So that's another important scholar that we've uh, we've encountered in our work. And then finally, um, Stefan Hyland, who yes. um, has done a lot of important work on Hellenistic astrology and especially for a discussion we're about to have about Nechepso and Metasiris, com compiled a new. Um, sort of list of all of the different references and fragments to those authors. And then recently, Levant Laszlo has been translating those fragments from Greek and Latin into English as part of his um, Horai translation project, which is like a, a crowdfunding the translation of ancient astrological texts through his page on Patreon. Um, yeah, I'm glad anyway. that's coming out. That's It's really hard sometimes to find uh, translations of these texts. So it's a, it's always a service to do that work. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I think that's good for now. And then we'll try to mention anybody else as we go. Um, so backing up to the discussion we were just finishing up, but I think, um, you know, one, you know, there, there's some debates amongst different scholars and different academics where sometimes there's still a tension about whether the nous of the decades is like astrological, quote unquote, or to what extent it's astrological. And um, sometimes I'm nervous about in some of the discussions I've seen that some of the later definitions of astrology from the Greco-Roman period, um, especially ones that involve like planetary causation or natal astrology or the complex techniques that they use, that some of that's been being sometimes like almost anachronistically used as the reference point of what something has to be in order to be astrological or that, that something has to be up to the similar scope. And I think sometimes that goes a little bit too far in holding some of the earlier Egyptian astrological tradition up to that because there's just many different ways that astrology can be conceptualized or used from a technical standpoint that I think still are broadly astrological, even if they are more basic or or early forms of things that would eventually develop later. And I think it's kind of important to, to recognize that. And I think that that's something that's been changing over the course of the, the past century of doing studies into Egyptian astronomy and astrology, especially with the nous of the decades, That um, because one of the things that uh, Kwok points out is that that was probably based on earlier texts or, or was probably a something that was drawing on an earlier tradition. And we don't fully know how far back that tradition stretches exactly. But if that's true, it just means there was a little bit more of an indigenous astrological tradition in Egypt a little bit earlier than people may have previously thought or suspected. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I think that uh... You know, we mentioned earlier the the fundamentals of the course of the stars, formerly known as the Book of Nut or the Book of this uh, Sky Goddess. 
that Alexander von Lieven um, has done so much work on, uh, that tradition goes quite deep. Um, and uh, we are always in antiquity dealing with an incomplete record. And so we, uh, we don't know um, uh, what might have been antecedent to this. And I think one of the things Kvok points out about the analysis of the decades is that it's in a quite a uh, an earlier archaic form of the Egyptian language. Um, and that to him at least suggests that uh, the text that it may have been based on, copied from perhaps, uh, derived from, uh, is part of an earlier tradition. And, and mm. what we're seeing is only this, uh, this later part of it uh, as it pops up into view because this monument happened to survive. And that's a common uh, thing with a lot of this ancient literature is we have a moment and um, that will give us a moment, you know, that is the latest, possibly at least the latest point at which this tradition emerges, but may represent an earlier tradition that just isn't uh, visible to us because the evidence hasn't survived. Right. Okay. It's That's speculative, great. but it's still, a, it's an important point to bear in mind, I think. Sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Cause that's, I think it's a really important point about how academic scholarship is done and what the approach is, is that you look as best as you can at what evidence is available. And then you try to base your conclusions only on that evidence that's available. And, that, and while sometimes inferences can be made, you kind of, you try to avoid um, going too far and making any inferences that aren't directly based on actual like textual evidence or other archaeological evidence. And I think that's a important, it seems like a simple point, but it's an important point to make because it's kind of different compared to, you know, since this is, a, is an astrology podcast compared to like, let's say um, some of the, in the early 20th century, some of like the theosophical discussions or, or new age discussions about things like Egypt and other things like that, that are not necessarily always based on evidence and sometimes there's a lot more speculation or, or or other things that go on um so that some people if they're coming at watching this episode from that background they might not understand as much why we're focused more sometimes on the specific textual things and how that approach is a little bit different right exactly and, and uh, different audiences will have uh it, this material will have different significance for different audiences which is which is great but uh what we're trying to do is uh, figure out historically where did certain ideas emerge or what's the evidence for it and what are some of the debates around it because it's it's often uh, settled we were mentioning earlier how a new piece of evidence can change our picture quite uh, quite a bit you know mm -hmm. something that was just not known and then a text emerges and somebody is able to decipher it and translate it and uh, bring it out into uh, public view. And, and the, the facts literally are new and uh, we have new ideas. Um, and that's really one of the fun things about all of this and especially what's going on in the last generation or so with these studies of early Egyptian texts. Yeah, for sure. That there's actually like, even though you would think everything has been around for so long that it's like everything that historically is going to be known about certain periods is already known. So that's actually not the case, that there's actually new things being discovered all the time. There's new inferences being made that are sometimes being confirmed. There are, yeah, just like, you know, in this case, we've been talking about the Naus of the Decades, which was literally discovered in the water, the submerged part of like a city, um, not too far from Alexandria, I think is where it was discovered, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, underwater archaeology techniques have developed and it's become possible to do um, things in ways that were just impractical before. And so new discoveries are being made all the time. And, and actually similar to that was I was re recently watching um, a lecture by Alexander Jones, the academic of ancient um, astronomy and astrology about the Antikythera mechanism, which was discovered over a century ago you know, submerged in water from a shipwreck. And it's like this mechanical device with a bunch of gears. But for most of the past century, they couldn't see more than just a little bit of it. But through advances of in x-ray technology, suddenly they can actually see so much more uh, of the gears that were previously hidden, as well as a lot of the text that was previously obscured under layers of like grime and dirt. And all of a sudden, they've been able to reconstruct this complex mechanical um, calculator, essentially, a device that previously they only had a, a little bit of an understanding of. Yeah, that's really exciting stuff. It's an amazing device. And it's like there's one of them. And if we hadn't discovered it, 
we wouldn't know this this amazing sophistication um, of yeah a, a mechanical calculator basically. Um, yeah, so. and 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 that technology also was recently implied. There's another discovery about Alexander Jones that he was involved with, where there was a work of Ptolemy that um, somebody had taken like a, a a piece of not papyrus, but I think it was like like something else of writing surface, and in the Middle Ages. Um, a scribe had like erased it and written another text over it. And they had known for more than a century that this text existed and there's other text underneath it, but only through being able to use x-ray technology recently, they were actually able to see and reconstruct that it was a lost work of Ptolemy's. Um, and this was just announced really recently, I think in the past past few weeks. Yeah, I remember hearing the news about that as well. It's really exciting. Uh, new imaging techniques are developing, um, you know, X-ray tomography, multispectral imaging, where they use different, you know, wavelengths of light and then, you know, uh, recombine the images to get the fullest possible amount of data out of a surface. Um, palimpsests are, are a great source for these kinds of things. Uh, but, you know, what's uh, amazing and, uh, you know, mentioned this maybe, you know, multiple times, one of the amazing things about, the Demotic Egyptian material, which is mostly on papyrus, is that many of this stuff, many of these things have already been discovered, um, and they're, they're already sitting in libraries and museum collections, but there just hasn't been the sort of um, uh, scholarly workforce to, to actually work through them and, and translate them. So few people um, actually study these languages and, and develop the skills needed and to work on them that um it could there you know there are you know just piles and piles of things waiting there to be published and many of them may be fragmentary and they might not all pan out and be super exciting you know sometimes it's a little bit you know more frustration than anything but it's really exciting um that there's this material out there um there's lots of references in the astrological literature by people that we were just mentioning to unpublished texts of demotic astrology and it's such a difficult thing to publish because you need the the demotic um uh, uh language skills and the ability to read the script but you also need to kind of know what's going on in terms of the astronomy and astrology of it to really kind of get the context or reconstruct the context of a fragmentary text you sort of have to know what it might be saying in order to make educated guesses at, at reading some of this material and so really i think uh one of the lessons um, in terms of scholarship for this is collaboration um, getting more people to work together on these kinds of things um, to to you know sh uh, you know um cuz not every not you know one person in many ways can't master all of the skills needed um, to work on such a complex topic as astrology in the in the ancient world you know, so many different languages technical specializations and the knowledge of how astrology works um, that i think it really is the, the way forward is to work uh, collaboratively on this yeah for sure and i'd like to encourage more people listening to this episode if this is something that interests you or that gets you excited that you know that going back and and sometimes in a university setting like trying to um get an adva advanced degrees in some of the different training that is necessary to work with some of this material that that could be an access point and, and i'm sure there's a lot of work still to be done there if people did want to if this sort of like intrigued somebody enough to pursue it that would be the, the way to go yeah absolutely what yeah, would that so look like 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 classics archaeology other things like that I, I think if you wanted to acquire the language skills, um, you could start with a, a classics program. Um, those are getting harder and harder to find, and it's not available at all institutions, which is uh, you know tough. I mean, um, uh, uh, only certain colleges uh, have these uh, language programs. Egyptology is even more rare, um, but you know I think you can find these things. There are more and more resources available. Um, I think online too and special courses where you can take like a summer course in um, ancient languages sometimes more institutions that are offering those so you, i think these days one need not necessarily commit to you know a, a, a full bachelor's degree to get the language skills you could study um, other fields and then take these languages on the side and i think there's a lot of uh, another thing i'd like to just uh, point out um i think a lot of um, thinking right now is going on in academic institutions about how to make this kind of training more accessible to more people. Because it's, you know, to be honest, it's been very um, exclusive 
It's been dominated by uh, wealthier institutions and the barriers to access to these institutions are often very high. And uh, um, I think a lot of folks in academia are doing a lot of soul searching about um, how do you make this knowledge um, or training or access to this knowledge accessible to more people. Um, and so I think there's there's lots more work to be done. You know, it's it's it, those who are seeking uh, can find these things, but I think it's also there's a responsibility to um, uh, to the world that that academics take a more active role in in making this kind of knowledge more accessible. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right. So going back to the now, so the decades to yeah. wrap, wrap that up. So um, mundane astrology and something uh, Quark says in one of his articles that I wanted to mention is that he said that there was some basic idea in the Egyptian tradition already before Hellenistic astrology of cosmic harmony and a relation between macrocosmos and microcosmos. Um, that he says was traditionally present in Egypt. And this is part of like a longer paper, but I was curious if you could explain that a little bit or expand on that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a lot of different ways to to think about that, but um, the Egyptian um, uh, whole cosmological system um, uh, was uh, based on a principle of um, cosmic order, actually, would one, one way to think about it. And that Cosmic order had the name uh, Ma'at, uh, which is a term that's sometimes translated as justice, um, but it's also um, order and justice and um, uh, right conduct, um, the, the proper function of things all ro rolled into one. And um, the, the, the obligation of the Pharaoh in Egypt um, and the priests who were the delegates or representatives of the Pharaoh uh, was to maintain right relations with the gods and perform the correct rituals in order to maintain ma'at, uh, which is not just justice, but also a cosmological order that pervaded the whole universe um, and that was necessary uh, for the uh, security of Egypt, uh, the continuing uh, fertility of the Nile Valley, uh, for human beings to prosper in general and the state of Egypt to prosper in general. And so there was a, a, a central idea of the harmony um, of the cosmos and that uh, uh, it was a two-way street. Uh, human beings had a, a important role, especially the, the priests and the Pharaoh had an important role to play in maintaining uh, this cosmic order um, as a principle of harmony uh, within the universe. And that comes up in lots of different ways, um, from you know very grand conceptions of uh, you know, the performance of rites that are uh, commemorated, but also reenacted uh, the creation of the universe and its divine ordering, but right down to actually even more humble uh, ethical obligations. Um, uh, something I'm working on in some of my other research is about uh, the meeting of law courts at the gates of temples. Um, uh, the temples were a site of um, justice and the um, uh, creating of harmonies um, on earth between people in terms of their disputes. And that was thought to reflect um, larger mythological um, and cosmic principles as well. They were all quite intertwined. Um, so uh, there's a lot of ways in which there were seen to be connections between what was happening um, in um uh, in Egypt on earth and what was happening um, in the heavens. And conversely, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, there were times when there was disorder and disharmony in the in the cosmos, when things were um, thought to when Ma'at wasn't functioning properly, um, everything that was supposed to be as it was, was reversed and inverted and disrupted. Uh, so it's almost too big to talk about really in a way. It's, a, it's an enormous uh, um, pervasive concept. But you can see, I think, how um, principles of cosmic order and the relationship between the heavens and what's going on in the heavens um, and what's going on at a large scale in the state of Egypt, right down to um, uh, personal interactions, uh, might be seen as all connected within this uh, very large cosmic framework of, of Egypt. Sure. Yeah. And even if it's not like astrology per se, um, it at least sets up some sort of cultural um connection or uh, i'm trying to think of a better word than obsession but between like astronomical events in the sky and um the functioning of society in some sense like a like a 
cultural sort of precursor to astrology that then we could see maybe then why astrology once it was developed would you know grow because there's like a very fertile soil there to grow in once those seeds had eventually been planted yeah absolutely um and there's a number of specific concepts uh, that we mentioned earlier about um uh, the the signs uh, in the heavens and their relationship to the gods and how those are transmitted to Earth, uh, but there's also this general cosmological concept of of order um, and divine order in the cosmos, which connects all things. Yeah, and there, there's also like a, another interesting concept with some of the gods that may have been relevant from earlier that also set up some interesting cultural things once astrology had been developed. And one of the ones I was interested in that I was reading about today was the Egyptian god named She, S-H-A-I. Yeah. And this was the Egyptian god associated with fate. Um, right. and, and Doreen Greenbaum has a whole uh, very extensive like treatment of this in her book um, on Hellenistic astrology and, and the lots. Right. Yeah. Um, that's another important antecedent. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I usually say shy, but I think that's, you know, tomato, tomato. It's one of those things. Um, shy. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, shy. Yeah. It's it's an Egyptian word that um, um it's a complicated uh term. And and I think Greenbaum does a great job in in um wrangling all the elements of of shy and, and showing how they are connected to the idea of the fortune and the daimon and so forth and fate and but basically, it's it's a very old um, uh, concept. Um, there's some early representations in funerary papyri, for instance, the Ani papyrus, uh, which goes all the way back to the um, 13th century um, BCE. Oh, you have it. Oh, is that? Yeah. You have it so the, oh, great. Fantastic. The Br British Museum has it up on their on their website. Yeah, fantastic. And there's a representation of um, Shai there as a human figure with a, a bull's tail. Um, uh, that uh, yeah, I think that's that the figure standing. But if if you zoom in just a little bit, I think that figure standing under the balance there. Um, you can't see the tail, but it's kind of along his back leg there. And it's then the one on the left. Yeah, that guy, and and then his the hieroglyphs um, clinch it for sure because he's he's labeled there, um, the hieroglyphs that he's looking at his face there, um, that just spells out shy, um, and so that's a, a an early indication of this idea of a a divinity or a being. Um, it's kind of almost like a, a you know a, a a guardian being or a, a being that appears at um, a birth. They are the these uh, beings that serve as gods who oversee the the birth of an individual and protect them through life. Um, often paired sometimes with another goddess named um, Rena Nutet, who's sort of a goddess of fortune or Meschenet. Uh, these are similar female um, divinities that are often uh, understood as as fortune, um, and uh, they are. Um, uh, they're kind of connected with birth and one's the outcome of one's life um, as divinities, um, but then they start becoming incorporated and fused with um, astrological concepts later on. Uh, so that uh, you know, and, and I think we'll see some of those as we as we go forward. Yeah, but just in the early stages, mm -hmm. it's this god is associated with like decrees, like what is decreed about a person's life and eventually notions of like laws of that decree being sort of like a law and that somehow they're present at the beginning of life and then also at the end of a person's life um and i think this is this um the one that we were looking at was this um showing the end of a person's life i think in depicted or what gods yeah. maybe i should ask are being depicted on this Sure, absolutely. This is a, a scene from uh, the a funerary papyrus, <clears throat> so, uh, a, literally a, a book of going forth by day, one of the, the variants of the um, funerary texts that were used um, uh, for uh, buried with people, actually, in this case, someone called Ani. And um, what you see there is uh, the weighing of the heart against um, uh, a feather, uh, which is the, the scene of judgment in the afterlife. And um, the 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 heart is the the heart of a person, of course, 
uh, the Eid, uh, it was called an Egyptian, but then on the other side of the balance on the scale is this feather, um, which is also the sign for ma'at um, itself, this concept I was referring to earlier, which is a concept of, of justice. Uh, so there's a kind of rich iconography here of, of the weighing of the heart against justice um, and uh, um, being hopefully found um, uh, to to be uh, in the right state to have acted correctly during one's life. In any case, there seem to have been ritual ways of of getting around it if you didn't quite do what you were supposed to. Um, so one of the points of a funerary papyrus is to ensure that you you make this make it through this uh, this rite um, and uh, and have a happy afterlife. Um, but yeah, the, there's there's an early representation of of shy, you know, your fate, um, uh, not just in life, but also your your um, potentially your afterlife fate in this case. Got it. And we see over here on the right side, like another important god that's present here as well, right? Oh, yep, right. Forgot about that. That's uh, that's Thoth himself, the great, uh, eventually the the Hermes uh, of uh, later. Hermetic tradition, uh, the Hermes uh, later in the late period starts to be called Hermes the Thrice Great, but also in Egyptian texts, Hermes pa a a a a a a, which means Hermes the Great, 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 um, and uh, uh, he's uh, you know writing in his uh, book, um, writing down the the decrees of fate and so forth there, and then there's the. Uh, uh, yeah, this this is this is a whole typical scene. Um, uh, that's the uh, the monster that then devours those who are found wanting there. But so, the cro crocodile on the right. Yeah, yeah, sort of a, a hybrid beast, um, the devourer who uh, uh, devours those who uh, didn't quite make it through the ritual, through the okay. uh, the, the judgment scene. And who is Thoth in just the early Egyptian tradition? Yeah, Thoth is a, the scribe of the gods, and so uh, you can see him there writing with a writing palette. Um, uh, he's holding up um, in front of him, and he's got the ibis head, uh, the bird with which he was associated. Um, and so uh, Thoth is uh, an important figure uh, for scribes um, and uh, is often connected in, in later texts with um both many things, calendrical lore, but also astrological lore eventually. Yeah. Okay. So he's the scribe of the gods. He gets invoked a lot. Um, and I guess, okay, we'll come back to that later. So anyways, so I was just interested by this god that there's a pre-existing concept in the Egyptian tradition of fate and almost of a person's like personal fate. And then it also became, it was also tied in with both the beginning of the person's life and what was decreed but also like the end of the person's life and potentially the length of a person's life exactly. um, and i th and i think that's extremely interesting and important the idea that the the god associated with fate was particularly tied in with the notion of the length of life um because that would become like a major preoccupation in the hellenistic tradition with the development of greco uh, egyptian astrology and especially in the Nechepso and Pedasiris text, I think was one of the earliest texts <clears throat> in the Hellenistic tradition that really developed a technique for attempting to predict the length of a person's life. And so when I was reading some of that today um, in Greenbaum's work, I was just struck by that and how um, that may be relevant, again, as an early Egyptian cultural notion that, that then shows up um, in the later Greco uh, Egyptian or Greco-Roman tradition. Yeah, absolutely. And and we should bear that in mind as we move forward, because we'll see that pop up in some of those um, horoscope texts that we have um, uh, that uh, that are coming uh, coming to light uh, recently um, uh, from Athribis. Um, there's oh. also, I, I don't know if, uh, I mean, so I think we, we've we seen that there's a lot of these um, uh, really important Egyptian concepts that have uh, quite deep traditions, deep roots in, in Egypt uh, going all the way back. Um, but it's also the case, um, and I, you know, I, I think it'd be great to make this point, that um, even before Alexander the Great shows up and we get the Hellenistic period in Egypt, there were, of course, contacts between Egypt and other parts of the world. And so we have some early evidence that um, uh, Egypt was in contact with other traditions um, and adapting and adopting those traditions uh, to their use and practice within Egypt, unless, you, unless there's other concepts we're missing that uh, you want to talk about in terms of the Egyptian background. 
No, I think that's great. This is the point where we should start talking about the Mesopotamian tradition. So while it's like we have this long tradition of using the Deccans for you know different purposes, at the very least for calendrical and timekeeping purposes by the priests in Egypt for over like 2000 years, starting back around, let's say 2000 BCE, um, over in Mesopotamia, we also have a very long astronomical and astrological tradition that built up through many centuries, many generations of observing the, the stars and recording their movements, as well as making predictions um, and recording omens based on the alignment of certain celestial events with events on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually by the, so, the, so they had mundane astrology that was predicting events for large groups of people, certainly um, became super popular by the 7th century BCE. But then eventually by the 5th century BCE, we get the standardization of the zodiac with 12 signs of 30 degrees each. And we also have the introduction of the concept of natal astrology with the first, the, the oldest surviving birth charts uh, dating to 410 BCE in some cuneiform tablets that have been discovered. <clears throat> and here's actually a picture of that tablet from 410 BCE from the book uh, Babylonian Horoscopes by Francesca Rocheberg, which, because it was published by the um, American Philosophical Society, uh, you can actually read it for free through Google Books. Um, so this is the, the picture of that tablet, and then she has several others where, starting in 410 BCE, we start seeing the concept of natal astrology, where they're recording the alignment of the planets for the day a person was born, and then starting to make predictions about the person's future from that point forward. Um, so this is a really important development in astrology in general at this point in time in Mesopotamia originally. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, um, and and I'm not an expert in that. So, um, but uh, it, it's uh, it's fascinating that um, as this really starts coming to a head, we also start seeing. Um, some of our earliest signs of contact between that tradition and uh, the e Egyptian tradition. Um, there's a papyrus that uh, was published a long time ago by Richard Parker, a demotic papyrus that was of of the Roman period. Um, but uh, the um, uh, the this is a a text that probably had. Uh, almost certainly had earlier origins. Um, and this is um, a text that has a whole list of uh, solar uh, or eclipse omens of various kinds and lunar omens. Um, and uh, it's probably because it makes certain equations um, between Egyptian months and Babylonian months and actually uses Babylonian months in it. We know that it came from um, uh, a Mesopotamian tradition and it lists various um, uh, eclipses and what they mean when they happen in these months. And uh, this uh, this text was originally thought to uh, be uh, uh, have a reference in it to um, the uh, uh, Achaemenid Persian King Darius I. Um, but recently, Kim Ruholt has uh, offered another interpretation that it may actually, the, the name in question may be a reference to uh, Nikau Pasher or Nekepso, um, who's famous in the later astrological tradition. Um, so uh, what this text shows is that um, a, a tradition actually not yet of um, uh, natal astrology, but probably of mundane astrology, because they seem to refer to events happening in various lands um, uh, rather than uh, events associated with persons. Uh, that body of practice and knowledge seems to have made its way to Egypt, um, probably at some point in um, either the Sayite period when around when Demotic was being invented that we talked about earlier, um, or uh, possibly in the Achaemenid Persian period. And this is when the actually Egypt was conquered by the Achaemenid Persian Empire and incorporated into it uh, for quite a long period from 525 BCE uh, down to about um, uh, 404. So just around, um, and then the uh, uh, Egyptians revolted and were able to shake off Achaemenid Persian rule. You know, just 
a little bit after the time when these the first evidence of um, uh, you know natal astrology that you were just talking about, Chris, is showing up. So um, this is you know what's interesting about this is that um, Egypt ha has at many times in its history been part of a wider international network of intellectual exchanges, um, and they kind of ebb and flow to a certain extent depending on imperial histories of the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Um, but certainly when the Achaemenid Persians ruled Egypt, this was a time when there would have been communication between uh, Persia, Mesopotamia, the, the um, uh, so-called Near Eastern world down into Egypt, because that was the territory that Achaemenid um, Persia covered. And so it seems like this text um, was probably transmitted at some point uh, during that period, and then copied over and over again within Egypt um, to preserve uh, this um, lore of eclipse and lunar predictions. And they even kept the month names for Mesopotamia for all this period. Right. So so the important point is just like by this period, by the um, 5th and 6th centuries BCE, um, there's these major connections between Egypt and Mesopotamia, and there starts being the transmission of some of the Mesopotamian astrology and astronomy starts getting transmitted to Egypt um, and incorporated into some of their own astrology at that point. And so we start seeing um, texts at this point that contain mundane astrology related to eclipses and um, yeah, eventually also relating to the signs of the zodiac, uh, which I think are also transmitted at some point in the next several centuries. Exactly. So this is a point of contact, really, since they're using the month names, it seems like maybe the um, the zodiac wasn't as, as significant by this point or wasn't being used in the same way. Um, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, there's definitely a, a, a a kind of mundane astrological connection there. And there's one or two other things that suggest, you know, and, and like we were saying earlier, sometimes we can suspect that this bit of evidence might be the tip of the iceberg of broader connections that we just can't document. Um, uh, and there's another, there's an interesting uh, text published by Friedhelm Hoffman that um, uh, describes a method for calculating, or well, it gives a chart for the lengths of day and night as over the changing seasons. And um, Friedhelm Hoffman has shown that it's based on a, a Mesopotamian um, arithmetical calculation scheme for doing this. Um, and so that's a, another thing. And there's little bits of evidence like this that um, there was intellectual context anyways between Mesopotamia and Egypt. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the points I think that David Brown makes in the paper we were, we were reading together recently was just that, like you just said, the Persian Empire was in control of Egypt for like mm -hmm. a, a long period of time. So obviously, like in the time period we're talking about, so obviously there's going to be major cultural interactions taking place as a result of that. And that in this entire time period becomes one of the primary means of like cultural interaction and synthesis when there's like one country that's like invaded and, and taken over another country. Um, and then the subsequent like blending of cultures as a result of that. Right, right. Um, it was a, a century, more, more than a century of uh, that the Persians were um, occupying and controlling Egypt. And um, there were, you know, we know that there was must have been intellectual context because we have um, Aramaic texts, the, which was the administrative language of the Achaemenid Persian Empire have been on papyrus have been discovered in Egypt. And so there's a good chance that um, you know an Aramaic text could have made its way to Egypt and have been translated into um, a demotic Egyptian form um, at some point because there were scribes working in both of these languages. It's kind of a foreshadowing of what we're going to see in the uh, in the Hellenistic period with the, the Ptolemaic um, uh, you know context of the emergence of astrology. Yeah. And so the, the Persian Empire, though, was not, they were in control, you said, for a century, but then they got, they lost control of Egypt, like briefly for a period of time, right? Right. They they lose control of Egypt um, uh, 
for, uh, and this is when we start getting the last few dynasties um, of Egypt, the 28th, 29th, and 30th dynasties, which are relatively short. Um, and the 30th is the one that includes, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, is the one that includes uh, Nectanebo, the, both the Nectanebos that we were talking about earlier. Um, so, uh, and, and, that, then and that's the a, one that created the, that was, that the um, Naus of the Decades was dedicated to. Exactly, right. Um, and then uh, there's another brief period of Persian rule um, once again um, uh, before Alexander the Great starts his you know, famous world historical conquests. Um, and um, he's really launching his campaign at that point against the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Um, and uh, the um, Alexander drives the Persians out of Egypt. In fact, he defeats them um, in two major battles before he even gets to Egypt. So he enters Egypt without a fight, basically. Um, and uh, it's from that point forward that you eventually get the establishment of the Ptolemaic dynasty, a dynasty of um, Greco-Macedonians um, who uh, rules uh, for e Egypt for the next 300 years or so. Right. So um, so Alexander the Great takes an army of of Greeks and Macedonians out of Europe um, from Greece and then storms down through modern day Turkey, initiates a war with the Persian Empire that's in control of both Egypt and Mesopotamia and Persia at that point. And then Alexander proceeds to conquer, uh, going downwards first Egypt um, by like 332 and 330, or sorry, three, yeah, 321. BCE then eventually goes over and conquers Mesopotamia um, and dethrones the Persian Empire and goes as far as the westernmost portions of India before eventually like turning back and going back to Babylon where he promptly dies and then um, his the the land that he conquered is then divvied up by his generals basically who divided into different um, Greek speaking kingdoms that we know as the Hellenistic, um, different Hellenistic regions. And this is the start of what we call the Hellenistic period. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of Alexander's generals by the name of Ptolemy um, uh, captures Egypt as the place that he governs notionally as uh, in a regency for Alexander's son, but eventually it develops into a, an independent kingdom. And um, interestingly, Ptolemy actually uh, hijacks the funeral procession of Alexander's body, which was supposed to be going back to be buried maybe in Macedonia or somewhere. And he hijacks it and takes it to Egypt and um, has uh, Alexander buried in, in uh, Alexandria eventually um, as a kind of sign of his continuity with that, um, the great conqueror. So, uh, you know, this is, a, a, I think, you know, we don't necessarily need to get into um, all the details of political history, but it's a major moment, of course, um, another moment that uh, connects Egypt um, with a, a new network of uh, cultural contacts and the circulation of goods and circulation of people and ideas. Uh, so it's another high point in um, Egyptian kind of global, global connectivity, if you will. Um, so just as the Achaemenid Persian Empire was a uh, uh, for its area and uh, context, it was a global empire virtually. Alexander's empire takes over the Achaemenid Persian Empire, basically, um, and uh, becomes the new empire. And that facilitates all kinds of uh, migration between different spots. So uh, huge numbers of Greeks, especially in the third century BCE, migrate into Egypt um, to serve various roles in the new administration of uh, of the Ptolemies, uh, because they created a Greek language administration. Right, because uh, so Ptolemy takes over Egypt and he sets himself up as pharaoh in Egypt, and then he creates he founds a dynasty of rulers of Greek speaking rulers that rule over Egypt for the next three hundred years, um, all the way until. Uh, the first century BCE that that famously ends with Cleopatra the seventh and her suicide when she loses um, against a, a battle in the against the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire takes over Egypt from that point forward. Um, so, but it's really important that Ptolemy starts this three hundred year dynasty of of Greek speaking people that are in control of Egypt 
and then not long after that we also have the, the well we, around the same time we have the founding of the famous city of alexandria which is like a multicultural city that's blending many different traditions and cultures and we also have the foundation of the museum and library of alexandria exactly yeah alexandria becomes a, a major cosmopolitan center uh, patronized by the ptolemies as a center of learning um Greek learning, but also uh, the translation um, of other uh, texts and languages um, uh, as well. Uh, one of the things that Alexandria is famous for is a, a really significant translation of the, the Hebrew scriptures uh, into Greek uh, that was um, used by um, diasporic uh, Jewish populations um, often uh, in Alexandria, but it was according to the legends anyways, created uh, to be a text for the library at Alexandria um, by um, sages that were requested to be sent from Jerusalem to Alexandria to carry out this translation. And so it's a, that's a kind of an emblem of the types of intellectual and cross-cultural exchanges that uh, were going on. You know, one could debate the details of the story, but that's uh, that's the historical record, what the historical record says. Um, and, and we know that other activities were going on there as well. Um, I've done a lot of work on this Egyptian priest uh, who wrote a history of Egypt um, in Greek, but based on Egyptian sources, and so translated a lot of ideas about Egyptian history into Greek for the Greek rulers of Egypt and the court. Um, in order that uh, these uh, new Greek Macedonian pharaohs would ha have an idea of Egyptian history and also the uh, ideals of pharaonic kingship, uh, which are implicitly discussed in various ways in this history. So it was a huge hub of uh, cultural interactions, immigration. Um, it grew up very quickly into the eventually um, before, uh, you know, by, by the, the later Ptolemaic period, it was the largest city in the world and it was only eventually eclipsed by Rome, um, people estimate. Um, but it was an enormous city with an enormous population um, that brought together people from all parts of the Mediterranean um, into close contact with one another. Okay, so there were in Alexandria, there were Greeks, there were, of course, native Egyptians, there was a, a Jewish community, mm -hmm. um, there were probably still like Persians or people from Mesopotamia. Um, yeah, so it was a huge like multicultural sort of like blending pot. And during this time, this 300 year period during the Hellenistic era, um, we have a lot of blending, especially of Greek and Egyptian culture, it seems like. Yeah, it was, um, uh, you know, the, the details are, are debated by various scholars um, about what the nature of the interactions were. But I think uh, it's now generally agreed that it was really important for the Ptolemies um, to have a a strategic partnership, especially with the uh, elites of Egypt, which were these priests who were the literate um, uh, figures in society, uh, who often, in addition to being priests, held posts in the Egyptian government as administrators um, uh, because of their literacy skills. And so um, the Ptolemies, when they came in, really couldn't run Egypt without the priests. Um, there was no way of doing it. And so they had to have uh, come to a, uh, an understanding um, between uh, their ideas of uh, kingship, which were based largely in Alexander and, and his rule, and traditional Egyptian understandings of kingship, uh, which based on the long traditions of pharaonic rule. So there was a, a lot of work um, to try and find a, a middle ground um, between these traditions. And that involved um, complex processes of translating ideas back and forth, finding uh, ways in which the different traditions could harmonize around certain points. And all of that translation activity, um, uh, which was going on at the top level, also had analogs further down the line in different parts of society as um, members of uh, you know, immigrant communities of Greeks, for instance, mercenaries or soldiers that were often hired and brought to the uh, brought to Egypt, uh, found themselves settled amongst um, Egyptian populations. Um, there was often people that uh, you know, um, formed families, you know, a lot of these immigrants were uh, 
uh, mercenaries, and so they would uh, marry into Egyptian families locally. Um, and so there's an extraordinary amount of um, cross-cultural interaction. Um, and out of these um, various levels of society, um, new ideas, new ways of doing things, uh, new uh, bodies of knowledge were generated. Sure. And, and one of the things we see um, at some point in the next few centuries after um, during the Hellenistic era is we eventually start to see the Mesopotamian concept of the 12 signs of the zodiac get merged with the Egyptian concept of the 36 decans, so that eventually the decans become seem to become like subdivisions or of 10 degree segments of the zodiac itself. Um, and even though the dating is much later, that's when we start to see things like the the famous uh, zodiac of Dendera, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's probably a, a good thing to take a look at now. Um, it's um, uh, probably uh, the um, one of the earlier bits of evidence for the zodiac in Egypt. Uh, there's some uh, a demotic text um, uh, that has a, a fragmentary, but it has an equation of different Egyptian months with um, zodiac signs, which is probably dated to the um, you know, maybe second century um, uh, BCE. But after that, um, it's really these uh, temple zodiacs, uh, which are some of the earliest evidence that the zodiac has really uh, fully arrived in Egypt and is being used. And in a big okay. way, I mean, it's really important. Um, we should take a look at this. Yeah. All right. So here's the famous zodiac of Dendra, which is, you can see in the, in the Louvre, and just to describe it sort of for our audio listeners, it's this big stone square sort of block that was cut out of a, a ceiling of a, in a temple in Egypt. And in the circle, you in the middle, you can see a circle that has the zodiac and it has the 36 figures that represent the decans around on the outside. And then on the inside, you can see different figures that rep represent the different signs of the zodiac, like um, like a scorpion, um, or elsewhere you you see like a what else like a Leo for a, a lion for Leo, or you see a crab for Cancer, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, and this is um, this is was on a uh, chapel, I believe, on the roof of of Dendera, a chapel devoted to uh, the god Osiris. Uh, the main temple was devoted to the goddess Hathor. We'll talk about her in in a moment, but um, uh, so uh, that dates it um, probably to the first century uh, BCE. Oh, that's great! That's a beautiful picture of the the temple. Um, it's one of the most spectacular and well preserved temples of ancient Egypt. Um, because it was largely built in the later Ptolemaic period and into the early Roman Empire. So, um, uh, you know, first century BCE into the first century of the Common Era, um, broadly speaking. Um, yeah, that's the the front of it. So um, a spectacular temple. If you ever get a, a chance to travel to Egypt, it's a, it's a glorious place. And... Um, Maybe Chris, do you have the? Uh, yeah, I want to take a look at this um, that zodiac in a moment, which is really exciting. Um, but I also, do you happen to have that one with the labels on it? Um, there's a, uh, a zodiac sign for the at least for the, um, yeah, the video see. viewers can take a look at uh, the zodiac. There is it this? is. Yeah, that's the one. And so this, what's exciting? Uh, this is a picture of the. Uh, Dendera zodiac, the round one that Chris was just saying is preserved in the Louvre, and um, I've added some labels so you can see that there are, in addition to the zodiac signs, uh, there are uh, divine figures that represent the um, the different planets, and uh, they are closely associated. The planets um, are the five uh, uh, visible planets are all associated with the zodiac signs that are their exaltations in, in later tradition. Um, and I know you've worked a lot on the exaltation, so, so maybe you could say more about that and 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 what's you know interesting about this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've always been, because I've always known about the zodiac of Dendra, and I went and I saw it in the Louvre when I was in Paris in like 2007. Um, and actually, I actually went, it's a really funny story because I went there looking, especially for that. I was like the one thing I wanted to see when I went to the Louvre 
uh, you know, the, or the primary thing I should say. And um, I got there and I, I get to the section where it's supposed to be. And then I see on the wall, there's like a plaque for it, but I don't, I don't see it. And there's like an empty space on the wall. So I think it's, I think it's missing. So I'm actually sitting there for a few minutes, oh, like no. kind of, de kind of depressed and kind of sad that I think it, it must be like getting cleaned or something like that. And it just doesn't happen to be there the day that I'm visiting. Um, so I'm standing there like an idiot for a few minutes. And then I keep seeing like tourists come by and then look up and start taking pictures of the ceiling. And then eventually, luckily, I looked up and it's right there on the ceiling, like above, you know, just as it was in the temple, uh, you know, right above you look up and then you see this big square stone thing that's like kind of massive that has the signs of the zodiac um, right above you and then representations of the decans in each of the planets. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and and that's great to see it that way because that's where it was originally, like you say, in the temple. Um, and that's a really typical thing. We'll, we'll say this a number of times that um, Egyptian temples were in many ways models of the cosmos. Uh, it's not obvious and unless you're kind of reading all the signs but this one is you know you can this is the dome of the heavens really put over you as a roof so that um the for people standing in the temple um it's like you're in a um, a cosmological model or a, a, a architectural representation of the world with the the stars above you um and this yeah. is uh yeah oh sorry go ahead so and and i didn't know until a few years later was reading um Neugebauer and Parker's book, Egyptian Astronomical Texts, and they start talking about the um, representations of the planets on it. And they point out that the planets are um, that in the diagram, based on their identifications, that Saturn, the, the, the figure for Saturn is very close to the, the figure, the symbol for Libra, and the figure that represents Cancer is very close in proximity to the figure that they've identified as Jupiter that Mercury is right next to Virgo and so on and so forth, so that when you do the full scheme, it actually ends up representing or being a visual representation of the um, the planets in their signs of exaltation from Hellenistic astrology, which is just really striking and really amazing because <clears throat> that's a concept that's basically existed in Western astrology for over 2,000 years now. Um, here's a diagram with the planets and their signs of exaltation from traditional astrology. And just the fact that this happens to be in this representation is just really um, just really striking and really, really amazing that they had created this and put this in Egyptian temple and that it was that important that they wanted to create something um, that would be so permanent and so lasting to represent it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really remarkable. Um, and there's really there there are some. I guess I should point out um, that there are some uh, scholars who interpreted um, other elements of this to suggest that there was a particular date that was represented. Um, some people have argued that there's a an eclipse represented that may have happened specifically around 51 BCE. Uh, but there's others that argue that actually this is a schematic representation, um, and that's why their planets are shown in their exaltations. Um, and that, in other words, um, so this is this is interesting uh, on many levels, just as you were saying. But one of the levels is that um, an astrological doctrine is basically being encoded in the um, in the heavens here in this temple, and that's one of the things that people have actually pointed out about Egyptian temples of these later periods, uh, is that they were often um, ways in through their inscriptions, through their decorations. Um, they were often ways of encoding um, and canonizing and preserving knowledge um, in the architecture themselves. And so that's kind of what you have here. Um, uh, and also we have to bear in mind, uh, we've mentioned a couple of times this figure, Nikepso, I think, um, uh, who's often regarded by uh, many of our later Hellenistic sources as uh, a wise king who uh, was a, an author of, of early astrological texts that are only preserved in in fragments. Um, depending on uh, who you ask, the these fragments at the earliest probably date to maybe the the middle of the, or late second century BCE into the first century um, BCE. And here's this temple that's just not long after that that's already got, you know, this um, uh, important monument of uh, astrological 
uh, of an astrological idea or doctrine embedded in it. Yeah, yeah, that's really important that once the system of like Hellenistic astrology had been established, it became so popular and it became so widespread that um, in the Egyptian temples, it from like, let's say the, let's say first century BCE forward, um, that it wasn't just the zodiac of Dendra, this one we're looking at now, but there's also other representations of either the exaltations or of the planets in their domiciles and in other temples as well. Right. Yeah. Um, a temple, Roman period uh, temple at Esna um, has the same uh, system of exaltations. I believe a now lost temple that was north of the existing temple at Esna also had a representation of the exaltations. And then there's also um, uh, various tombs uh, that have uh, zodiac ceilings occasionally. So um, it's really remarkable how this uh, starts to um, become incorporated into really some of the most traditional spaces of Egyptian culture and, and learning, uh, that is the temple um, and also tomb architecture. Uh, these are um, not wild and crazy spaces, you know, where you just do whatever you want. You know, this, so this clearly there's a sense that this lore and learning was um, integrated into um, Egyptian practices in some way. Um, yeah, and, and especially amongst the the Egyptian priests, that their previous work with astronomy for sure and timekeeping, um, that eventually they also developed uh, an astrological interests and roles potentially as well. Um, so I guess before we move off of that, so so we had the zodiac of Dendra, which we've talked about the planets being their signs of exaltation. There's also sometimes debates about whether it represents like an actual like time period in it, I think, based on signs that may represent eclipses around the first century BCE or other debates about whether Neugebauer and Parker's identifications were correct and that it represents the planets in their exaltation. But the fact that there's other um, temple illustrations that show the planets in their exaltation or domiciles to me is part of the compelling thing that makes it clear that Dendra, that this version of Dendra does actually represent the planets in their exaltations, probably. Um, and I think you have some pictures of other some of the other ones with some identifications as well, right? Yeah, um, we there's a what's interesting about Dendra, and maybe we could focus on those because um, we can stay in the same place, and I think they're particularly interesting. Um, is there's a second zodiac ceiling? Um, so Dendra actually has two, um, and uh, this yeah, that's that's one of them. Maybe we could. Uh, there's a plan that shows. Um, actually, could you show that picture that you had just a minute ago of the front of the Temple of Dendera? And then we'll start there and get a sense of, um, for people of where this is actually located. Uh, there was a temple you showed of the front with the columns of the temple. Okay, hold on a second. Here it yeah. is. And um, is. this is, is great. This... Perfect. Yeah. So this is in, um, this is known as the, it, they use a Greek architectural term i'm not sure why but it, it's uh the pronaos or the front the you know front now so the kind of a porch or port portico space it's a columned hall sometimes called a hypostyle hall in egyptian it's called a henti or four hall um sometimes and what's uh, this is uh the preliminary space that um Probably at some times, ordinary people would be able to enter, um, like in festival, certain festival occasions. Um, and inside the roof of this structure, like right up inside the roof, um, there's another zodiac on either side of the two uh, of the hall, like so on the far ends of it. And um, I think we have a picture that uh, shows where they're located. They're on the far west and east ends of the hall. Um, and there are zodiac uh, uh, bands. Um, this uh, that you've got on the screen here, I think, is a, a different part of the of the inscriptions um, on the hall. There, there's a good spot. Uh, this is one of the um, uh, zodiac bands uh, that's on uh, that are on the ends of the hall. And I think you can see in that upper register, the upper band there. Um, that's well, you know, what else would that be? But, uh, um, our, our friend, the, uh, the centaur Sagittarius, 
um, with the bow and everything. But right. the the iconography is amazing. It's got he's got a kind of a pharaonic um, atef crown, and he's got this winged uh, feature, which looks a little bit more Mesopotamian. What, what do you think, Chris? Yeah. So there's, I mean, that's really striking is that what you get is this blend of some of the iconography from some of the Mesopotamian representations of the Zodiac figures, but also they get, there's there's sometimes Egyptian adaptations of them where different um, Egyptian features either are merged with that or, or completely replace the Mesopotamian versions. Right. Right. And if we, I think I have some other ones with the figures um, labeled. Oh yeah, well here you can, this is good though. You can also see um, Capricorn there, I think. Um, right, the goat, uh, fi goat fish. Right, the goat fish. Um, but there's also other, uh, and below them, uh, these are the, the decans um, as well. Uh, so it's similar to the round zodiac at Dendera. Uh, you have kind of an, an outer band, with the uh, uh, decans and then an inner band with the um, zodiac signs. And so you're seeing that the, the um, in an Egyptian temple, the uh, fusion of the zodiac um, taken over from uh, Mesopotamia through these cultural contacts and right. uh, the very longstanding Egyptian tradition. And then this goddess here that um, now that we're zoomed out, you can see uh, this goddess stretching over as a, just a, very typical representation of the goddess Nut that we've been mentioning several times, the sky goddess. Got it. All right. Yeah. And then let me pull up your... So you also have a broader plan that you made. Here's the image. Yeah. So um, this is an image uh, so of the a plan, basically, of the roof. And there's a, a central column, the aisle of the main entry, and then um, two bands uh, of um, other processional processions of divinities. But on the far ends, uh, there is these uh, there's zodiac and decan bands, and uh, so one and they've split the zodiac in an interesting way. So unlike the circular one that's in the roof, um, it's it's not a, a round band like we're used to seeing with a, a, a series of um, zodiac signs, but it's been split so that half is um, uh, basically Cancer, you know, or Pisces to Cancer, and the other half is um, Leo to Capricorn. Um, right, because we've got a like a, rectang a rectangular temple, and then on the far sides of the temple, like one half has one side has one half of the zodiac and then the other side of the temple has the other half of the zodiac. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Christian lights and others um, have argued that this way of splitting the zodiac is, is significant um, because it puts uh, emphasis on the, the two, um, uh, the two solstice points, because those are the dividing points that is the winter and the summer solstice. And in the context of, the Temple of Hathor at Dendera. This is particularly uh, significant because uh, Hathor was in um, in uh, many texts associated with an important myth that's connected to the um, the New Year's uh, cycle, the cycle of of the the annual cycle of the year, the New Year's festival, and the return of the inundation. So in this picture we have here, we have the two halves once again from Pisces to Cancer um, and uh, from uh, Leo to Capricorn and uh, all of the different uh, divinities. Um, and I've you know labeled the different um, signs of the Zodiac. It's also worth pointing out that there's other um, traditional Egyptian constellations that are uh, interspersed in these as well. So they haven't abandoned some of these, these older traditions. And there's also the Decans. Um, but there's also um, other figures as well that are important, like uh, um, planetary figures. And also, if we're up back up in the upper left corner there with, um, uh, there we go, with Cancer, and um, we see the the star Sothis or um, uh, Sopdu or Sirius, the dog, sto dog star that um, rose just before the inundation uh, came. It's heliacal rising was just before the inundation. And it's represented right next to gods associated with the uh, inundation, Anukas and Satet right there. So it's a, it's a, um, it's very much an, 
a zodiac, but it incorporates all of these Egyptian elements as well. Yeah, so we're seeing like a real blending of Egyptian and Mesopotamian cultural and astronomical fa factors basically in here. And then also interestingly and important for our purposes is that the planets are also um, represented in, in here as well, and they happen to be in very specific positions. Yeah, exactly. So here we have a section of the panel so you can see uh, better uh, the images and uh, you can see Gemini uh, there, which again is another interesting adaptation. You know, we're used to them being the twins. In Egyptian representations, they are often uh, Shu and Tefnut, um, who are brother sister uh, gods, and uh, they're represented right there as as a pair, you know, extending their hands to one another. But then uh, to the to the right of them um, is uh, a representation of Mercury, which in the form of a of a human uh, headed divinity. And it's hard to tell otherwise, except he has a star on the top of his head to show that he's a, a, a star, a planet. Uh, but the, in the hieroglyphs um, just above his head and to the right that he's facing towards uh, the name, the Egyptian name um, of uh, Mercury, uh, Sebeg or Sebka is uh, written there. So you know who it is. And okay. then, yeah. So we have we have Mercury in proximity in this like temple illustration or relief mercury's in proximity to gemini exactly yeah and so um then likewise uh here's taurus very easy to recognize um uh, but given a kind of a lunar disc uh, maybe um above and then a couple of figures over is uh venus um or uh, uh panetra tua as uh, Venus was known, which is, means the morning god. Um, so they they had different names uh, based in earlier Egyptian tradition uh, for the uh, the planets and the divinities associated with them, uh, but they were blending that with uh, these Mesopotamian traditions of uh, the zodiac. Um, so you can see the uh, um, uh, obviously the other point is that uh, these are the planets in the signs of their um, of their domiciles. Right. So Venus is in Venus is basically in Taurus in the diagram, and then it turns out that if you go through all the other planets, that all of the planets are in their domiciles according to the traditional, um, or at least the Hellenistic the the system that came about in the Hellenistic period and then was used from that point forward for assigning um, each of the seven traditional planets to one or two of the signs of the zodiac, which I have a diagram for right here. So here's the domicile scheme with um, the two luminaries assigned to, to Leo and to Cancer, and then the rest of the planets assigned flanking out from there. Um, based on the relative speed and distance from the sun, right? Yeah. So, so that's re that's really cool that the that the this again another illustration. So we have one illustrating the exaltations, and then we have another um, that's illustrating the domicile scheme. Yeah, and this pronos was uh, this ceiling where the um, uh, with this columned hall where this uh, 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 this zodiac um, was placed would have been built later than the other uh, one, uh, the other uh, zodiac, which was in the uh, Osiris temple, most likely. Um, but it's uh, still relatively early. Uh, so it's probably more like first century CE, I think, um, when this was uh, put together. And so yeah, uh, we have, a, a, I think, a, a another a fascinating um, uh, kind of incorporation into the architecture of the temple of an astrological uh, doctrine. It's it's not just uh, um, you know representing the sky. The the placement of these different planets also goes back to, or in later tradition is associated with uh, the whole idea of the nativity of the world or the thema mundi. Right, Chris. That's the the thing that we start to see in like Firmicus and other other texts um, uh, about uh, the, that it seems to explain. Um, although there's you know debates about this, I imagine um, uh, seems to explain the placement of the planets in their houses with reference to a chart of the nativity of the world. 
Right. So here's the diagram <clears throat> that shows the theme of Monday with Cancer rising. It has the ascendant in Cancer, and then the Moon in Cancer, the Sun in Leo, and then the rest of the planets assigned um, in zodiacal order, which is counterclockwise based on their relative speed and distance from the sun, first starting with Mercury, which never gets more than one sign away from the sun assigned to the sign next to it, which is Virgo, and then Venus, which never gets more than two signs away from the sun assigned to Libra, and then Mars to Scorpio, and Jupiter to Sagittarius, and Saturn to Capricorn. And this was said to be like the the nativity or the birth chart for the the, the world, basically, according to Firmicus Maternus, who ascribes it to Nechepso and Pedasiris, as well as Asclepius and Hermes. So these, these mysterious, um, supposedly Egyptian figures, um, where there were some sort of texts that were ascribed to them during the Hellenistic period, um, where this diagram, this one, and the exaltations serve as these like foundational points for a bunch of different astrological doctrines based on these sort of hypothetical charts for the the founding of the world yeah um and uh, you know i we don't know maybe necessarily for sure where these uh, doctrines originated but what's interesting about um how they are incorporated in uh, the Temple of Hathor at Dendera is that they make a lot of sense from an Egyptian perspective. They've um, integrated um, a, a an astrological concept into the Egyptian cosmology of this temple. And I don't know if we have that uh, diagram again with the labels with um, the two bands of the zodiac and the signs labeled. And yeah, that that one or the next one maybe where it was shows the in close up the two bands with the label of yeah this one here is perfect um so this is these are line drawings of of those zodiac ceilings and you can see that um uh there's cancer represented actually sort of interestingly as as maybe a crab or maybe a scarab beetle i don't know it's it's a little bit uh um iconographically um uh you know a mixed bag but it has you know, it looks crab-like maybe or something. Mm -hmm. But right next to it is, uh, as we were saying earlier, there's the this uh, Sothis and these inundation um, gods. And and uh, what's interesting is that, uh, as we've said a couple of times, um, the heliacal rising of Sothis um, happens, you know, uh, when the sun is uh, there in, in Cancer, roughly. Um, and uh, this is when the inundation arises. And according to many uh, cosmologies uh, or accounts of the creation of in ancient Egypt, uh, the creation was the emergence of the first mound of earth from the primor primordial waters of the flood. Um, and so the flood is uh, an initial stage in, in the creation story of, of the Egyptians, according to different versions. And um, so what we seem to have here is a representation of the planets in their domiciles um, in a visual representation that emphasizes the solstices, maybe including the summer solstice with this placement of Sothis, um, and so seems to make a connection between the idea of the Thema Mundi and the placement of the uh, planets in their domiciles with uh, an Egyptian creation story, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, that's one of the things about the <clears throat> the theme of Mundi is that they had always, all the scholars have always noted that um, it seems to, having cancer rising in the sun in Leo, um, it seems to betray an Egyptian influence on the concept because that connects it to the heliacal rising of Sirius and the flooding of the Nile, which occurs every year, which had always been such a important thing in Egypt. Um, and it's really anchored or really focused here in the Thema Mundi um, with these positions and with with Cancer rising. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. I think I said that, um, the sun was in Cancer, but it's not. It's in it's in Leo and and um, the the moon. Um, you could even take this maybe a step further in that. 
if the if the moon is um, there close to the sun, just in the next adjacent sign, um, it would have been the the start of a of a new month, um, I think, or just about to start a new month. Um, and so this would represent the the uh, the moment in the lunar calendar as well, um, which was keyed to Sothis when a new month was about to start the first month of the year, perhaps, or the last month was just ending and the new month was about to start. Uh, and so you have a, um, a, a New Year's vibe, depending, you know, both whether you're looking solar or whether you're looking at a lunar calendar, I think. Um, and, you know, that's, I only mentioned that because the lunar calendar would have been the calendar for temple festivals. Um, and so, you know, and this all happens again, just at the Temple of Hathor Adendra, um, because of Hathor's association um, with uh, Tefnut um, and other goddesses who were seen as these distant goddesses who uh, went away and then returned around the time of, of the new year, bringing the inundation and the return to life once again after being away um, at, at a period of, of low uh, water and um, uh, uh, potential danger um, uh, in terms of, you know, reduced fecundity and so forth just before the inundation starts again. Um, uh, so it's a, it, it may be that um, the, this particular uh, creation story and the connection with the Zodiac was chosen particularly because of this temple and the main goddesses association with that um, cyclical myth of regeneration and creation. In Egyptian mm. thought. Okay. So um, so backing up, it's like these monuments that we're talking about, these temple illustrations of like the domiciles and the exaltations, these are late. These are probably dated to like the first century BCE or the first century CE when we're talking about Dendra as well as the Esna um, illustrations. And I had one picture of the Esna ones from Neugebauer and Parker where they show the signs of the zodiac and then Neugebauer and Parker point out where the planets are and that the moon is like depicted as being above Taurus, the bull, the sun is depicted as being above Aries, the ram. We see Venus next to Pisces, the fishes, um, and we see Mars, the figure for Mars next to Capricorn, the goat fish, and so on and so forth. So it's like Esna, Esna A at least, as it's called, is depicting, again, the planets in their signs of exaltation. So um, anyway, the important point is that the domicile and the exaltation schemes, especially the domicile scheme, is one of the systems of astrology that emerges and that we become aware of by the first century uh, BCE as part of this seemingly new and complicated system of astrology, especially of natal astrology and interpreting birth charts. Um, that's part of this fourfold system of the the planets and their meanings, the signs of the zodiac and their unique meanings, um, the doctrine of aspects or configurations, and also the doctrine of the twelve houses or places, um, the dodecotropos, and that fourfold system kind of like emerges, and we see evidence of it sort of show up by the first century BCE when we start seeing both. Um, instructional texts that tell people about this system and how to use it, as well as we start seeing um, birth charts or horoscopes um, that in, that use this new technical system also showing up in especially Greek and Demotic sources in the first century BCE. So we assume, or all of the scholars assume or infer then, that this new type of astrology must have developed at least by the like early first century BCE or late second century BCE. So around 100 BCE by the, probably by the latest that the system would have developed, but its origins are mysterious because we can see elements from the Egyptian and from the Mesopotamian and from the Greek cultures that have all sort of coalesced in order to contribute to or to create this new system of astrology that shows up in the first century BCE that we call um, Hellenistic astrology. Yeah, yeah, it's a really remarkable uh, cosmopolitan fusion of ideas that all comes together um, 
in it seems like a short period of time. I always I'm, I marvel when I think about this that there were these antecedents for sure, but then you know suddenly in uh, maybe I don't know the space of a century. I mean that's a long time, I guess. But I'm used to dealing in ancient history, so I think of enormous period. You know that seems short to me, but it comes together as this uh, this coherent system and uh, the the texts uh, of this. Nekepso, um, sometimes associated with Pedoceros, um, that are cited by later astrological authors. Um, you know, we can't always be sure how early those texts go, but uh, they seem to cover most of the major topics of, of astrology. You know, you have natal astrology, you have um, mundane astrology, you have a lot of familiar doctrines um, that are already present, uh, like like the uh, the lots of fortune and the lot of the daimon, um, a whole set of doctrines that seem to be part of that tradition. Um, and then we also have this, this temple architecture suggesting the emergence of, of these astrological doctrines and their, and their use um, in a dip for a different purpose, but a, an awareness amongst these temple builders of these um, astrological doctrines also dating to this period. Um, uh, and uh, they, they really are a, an amazing kind of um, a translation of concepts, recombination of concepts in and uh, the generation of something that's really more than the sum of all of its parts uh, uh, into this new system. Um, that's what I find really, really extraordinary. Um, and it, a lot of it, I know um, parts of it could also be happening elsewhere in the Hellenistic world because we have a lot of early Hellenistic astrological authors that are also from other places as well. But a good bit of it seems to be happening um, in uh, Egypt and maybe in Alexandria, and particularly because, in particular, because of its cosmopolitan location, but also probably in the temples of Egypt as well, um, in outside of Alexandria. Yeah. So, so we have this new system of astrology that shows up on the scene by the first century BCE. Um, it has all these like abstract technical concepts that seem to be playing the role of like a like a theoretical construct when you have things like the domiciles and the exaltations as well as the interrelationship and interconnection of those concepts together where they're not they're not necessarily like isolated concepts but instead the domiciles and exaltations and the doctrine of aspects and the doctrine of the 12 houses have these weird interlinking conceptual structures that are linked together in this really weird and really mysterious and yet elegant way um, that I've talked about in other episodes as well as in my book. Um, but the question by scholars becomes, uh, and also additionally, a lot of these concepts are attributed to an earlier set of, of texts that we don't have access to anymore that are attributed to Hermes, to Asclepius, and to Nechepso and Pedasiris. So these sort of like quasi-Egyptian sounding figures um, that had, there were actual texts floating around with their names on it. And so there's a debate among scholars about are these, for example, a lot of the older scholars argued or believed that these were um, originally were Greek texts and were Greek authors who adopted Egyptian names, but were not necessarily Egyptians themselves, but instead either used that as a, as a sort of like contrivance or alternatively like maybe incorporated some Egyptian concepts but ultimately were Greek that it was a product of Greek learning somehow um or these other questions about whether these were especially more recently some scholars arguing that these may have actually been the product of some of the Egyptian temples and some of the Egyptian temple astronomers and astrologers um who produced this in the centuries, after the perhaps after the conquest of Alexander the Great in this two or three cent two or three century period where we don't really know what's going on. And so there's a question of was this perhaps actually this new system of astrology actually produced by Egyptian um, temple astrologers? Or alternatively, there's other people that say that perhaps this was um we know large parts of this system were already being practiced in Mesopotamia and that they already had natal astrology by 410 BCE. And perhaps some of these concepts were introduced in the Mesopotamian tradition, and we just don't have full documentation of that yet. And then that system got transmitted to Egypt and then incorporated and adopted and, and sort of Egyptianized. 
So there's this mystery surrounding this, but we know at the very least that somehow it's the product of the synthesis of th these three different cultures. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way of putting it. I, I think, you know, um, uh, the other thing that I, I, I'd like to add from the point of view of the um, Egyptian context, um, just, you know, what I know more about is um, that uh, by the time we're getting to the development of this um, astrological literature, if we can trace it all the way back to maybe the late second century um, BCE, this is a time when uh, Greeks and Egyptians um, and other populations as well had been living in Ptolemaic Egypt side by side and 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 working, sometimes coming into conflict with one another, but working together um, for a long time. And some of the cultural and ethnic divisions that um, people sometimes imagine um, were often blurred uh, uh, because there were definitely bilingual individuals um, uh, much earlier on, I mean, there was definitely already bilingual individuals. There had to have been in the third century. And we have this figure that I mentioned, Manitho, writing a Greek text, uh, although he's an Egyptian priest. Um, but we also have these uh, figures uh, later who we can tell from uh, various documents, whether they're um, contracts or translations of texts or family genealogies or whatever uh, that are bilingual individuals um, that are people and and seem to be uh, well versed in both cultures. So um, you know uh, these different strands of um, concepts and practices and ideas all come together in the Ptolemaic Egyptian milieu, and then you add on top of that the fact that many individuals themselves were uh, multicultural, um, bicultural, multi-ethnic individuals um, who um, were leading, uh, you know, multiple cultural lives. Uh, one of the things I like to point out is that um, in, in Ptolemaic Egypt, some people had double names and would sometimes have an Egyptian name as well as a Greek name and would be uh, use their Greek name in a Greek context and use their Egyptian name in an Egyptian context. So within the temple, when they're carrying out their liturgy, they might be, you know, known as uh, Petiesi or something like that. And then in the Greek, in a Greek context, they might be known as Apollonius. And those names sometimes translate one another. So we have this very complex um, uh, and um, connected cultural milieu uh, in which this develops. And I think it's uh, very much a product of that um, uh, co combination of traditions and interaction. Not to say that it was always peaceful. There were certainly um, conflicts within uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, and I don't mean to um, gloss over those, but it was extraordinarily generative in this in this moment. Yeah. As well. yeah, I know. I know we we're going to talk about some of the later, um, like the coffin lids from the first and second and third centuries in Egypt that mixed Greek and Egyptian contexts uh, or concepts. And maybe this would be a good opportunity to do so to illustrate, like we we're talking about with the the Soter family and some of their different um, generational, like blending of Greek and Egyptian culture. Yeah. So here's an image of one of the famous um, coffin lids that has been discovered uh, where it has um, a picture or an illustration of the god sky goddess in the middle and then surrounding her are the different figures that represent the different signs of the zodiac um, again with kind of you know a blending of greek and especially egyptian iconography right yeah it's it's really fascinating you know, just like the um, iconography of the zodiac uh, signs in the temple at Dendera, you see the uh, combination of, uh, um, you know, the the animal or the zodion uh, that is that is the sign, but also some Egyptian elements uh, mixed in. Uh, here we have the twins again. Um, there's and there was uh, Pisces. There was actually. Um, I saw something cool on the Leo that I just noticed as you were going by. You know, um, this uh, figure of Leo here, uh, you see that little thing that it's kind of standing on that looks a little bit like a lightning bolt. Mm -hmm. um, that is actually um, probably a hieroglyphic sign that is um, one of the sounds that goes into the spelling of of the lion, Ma'a, or Ma'i, 
in Egyptian. And so it looks like there's been a kind of a combination, for instance, of a, a lion, typical symbol, uh, universal across the zodiac, but also a hieroglyphic sign that would be part of the spelling of the name of uh, Leo in Egyptian or, or Mai. Okay, cool. Um, so this is uh, the coffin lid of a, a woman or a girl, girl named Cleopatra um, that they've dated to, I think, like the, what, the second or third century, but it was actually part of a, a family of coffin lids and, and her fathers, as well as like other people in her family were also discovered as part of the same discovery, I guess. Yeah, yeah, this was um, a group uh, associated with, a, I believe, a, a reused uh, tomb in Thebes, and it's uh, a Roman period family uh, with um, a, a fascinating array of different names. Uh, just to go back to the point we were making earlier, I don't know if you have that uh, genealogy um, that I think I uploaded um, uh, from a, yeah, and I put it, It's this is from a study of this done several years ago. Um, by uh, Van Landout, um, and it shows the Soder family, and um, the scholar has put the names in their hieroglyphic form and their Greek form as they appear, um, and some of these are actually names that appear in demotic. So the whole uh, genealogy of this family and, and the labels on the coffins and their funerary inscriptions are written in multiple languages, um, and some of the people have... Uh, you know, very Greek names like Soter and Cleopatra. Um, and some of them have uh, um, uh, Roman names like uh, Cornelius Polius, um, who's the father of Soter uh, there. Um, and But the mother of Soter is uh, Femutos or Pimutos, which is um, she, uh, she of uh, a Mut, uh, which has been differently interpreted could be she who belongs to the goddess Mut, who's a kind of a mother goddess in, in the Theban region, or she who belongs to death. I don't think that the Egyptians would name someone uh, someone that, that way. So, But uh, what you see here is um, a continuation into the Roman period of uh, what we also saw in the Ptolemaic period, uh, families with uh, multicultural and multi-ethnic identifications. And we know that Soter, who we also have a coffin from, um, was the uh, archon or ruler, uh, is a Greek word, ruler of Thebes. Um, and this probably means he was either kind of the mayor of Thebes or the governor of the Theban, uh, Theban region. Um, and so this was an important uh, official uh, who was a possibly bilingual um, and possibly, um, uh, you know, uh, in contact with both uh, Greek or Greco-Roman traditions and um, Egyptian traditions. Yeah, I think this is his coffin lid, which also has the goddess Nut in the middle, and then it has the signs of the zodiac um, around the outside. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's really cool because it's like we have it's like his coffin lid has the signs of the zodiac around it, and then his daughter Cleopatra's has the signs of the zodiac around it. And they both have Greek names, but then his wife um, has a like a mixed, um, I think, Greek and Egyptian name, right? Right. And isn't there even a, um, there's one of the individuals called Kandake um, or Candace. We, we say it in, in um, uh, when we transform it into English kind of. Yeah, um, that's, her, that's, that's Cleopatra's mother and that's Soter's wife. Right, there you go. And and that's a, a name that's taken on a Greek form, but it um most people now believe it was a Nubian royal title, like the Queen Mother, um, that eventually made its way into um a Greco-Egyptian. And there's a famous Kandake Queen of Meroe that appears in kind of uh literature, and Meroe is a, a name for the, the Nubian kingdom to the south of Egypt. And so you know, we don't know, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is a, a Nubian, um, but it might, it might mean someone who's um, got a Nubian background. Uh, uh, so from, uh, you know, further up the, the Nile Valley. Um, so, you know, we start counting it up and maybe we've got four possible, at least, you know, four different names that can be traced to four different cultural ethnic origins between, you know, Greek, Latin, Egyptian, and possibly Meroitic, if you uh, um, consider this name. 
So it's a, and that's not impossible because uh, Thebes, of course, is uh, to the south in Egypt, um, and there was lots of constant contact across the border between um, Egypt and Nubian civilizations. And in some periods, there were Nubian rulers in in Egypt. Uh, so that's a, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing family that represents uh, um, some of the, the the mix of of late Egypt. Yeah, and, and it's like um, Cleopatra's brother, and so does son. Um, had a Greek name, Ammonius, but he it says that he like went by an Egyptian name, which was Petamenophis. Is that right? Yeah, that's a great example of these double names that uh, we were just talking about. So um, Padiamenophis um, literally means translated from Egyptian, he who was given of or he of uh, Amenhotep. Okay, so that means Amun in peace or Amun is pleased. Uh, and so if you literally translate the name and then you take his name Ammonius, and that's a Greek way of saying belonging to the god Amun. So the the two names are actually sort of counterparts of one another, or Ammonius is maybe a translation of the Egyptian name uh, Padiamenophis. Or, you know, so it's, uh, again, this uh, translation back and forth between uh, different cultural milieu. And perhaps this Ammonius um, would have used a Greek name when dealing with the largely Greek-speaking officials of Roman Egypt, but maybe um, residing in uh, his community in Thebes and, and with all the Egyptians that were there, he would use his Egyptian name. And um, we don't know. We don't, I think we had, don't have any evidence about whether these were uh, bilingual individuals, but it's a pretty good clue when you've got uh, this double naming that this is someone who's uh, working in two different cultural contexts yeah and so it's just a good like small microscopic representation of a larger theme that had been going on for several centuries at that point which is in that instance with that family where you have an individual that might have like a greek father and an egyptian mother and then you can just imagine then the child would have both cultural contexts that they would have grown up in essentially including maybe different um, things in terms of like the mythology or the religion and different influences then that would have been blended together in the child, as well as just the, the cultural context that they grow up in, in terms of maybe having different friends or different associates or, or whatever else that come from either an Egyptian or, or a Greek context. So we can understand then why Hellenistic astrology and this new system of astrology, when once we become aware of it in the historical record in the first century BCE, that's already um, you know two or three centuries after the conquest of Alexander of, over Egypt, and after two or three centuries of this like intense cultural um, blending that had been going on there uh, up to that point. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's just so relatable too to see a family like this. Um, you know, I mean, so many people in in uh, you know our, our modern world um, live in families of mixed cultural um, and ethnic backgrounds and racial backgrounds, and it's really interesting to see, um, you know, an example of that, um, and then to see it manifesting also in the traditions around burial um, and and the astrological signs and and uh, symbolism that they're using in their burial. Um, uh, in this context. And I, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's, you know, hard to, we can call it Greco-Egyptian. I think it's a, not a bad term for, for some aspects, at least of, of Hellenistic astrology. Um, but it's, and it's also interesting to see how that plays out in the um, iconography and symbolism of the, uh, the coffin. Um, if I, if I remember correctly, and if I saw it correctly, uh, when we were looking at it, the coffin has the same split of the zodiacs um, into the two sides, you know, from between the solstices. If this is the, is this our soter sarcophagus again? I can't remember. So I think this is Cleopatra, um, yeah, his was, his daughter. But I think, yeah, think Leo. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I think that's Leo in the top right, and then there's Cancer over in the top left. Right. I think you could see if we can you can we skip ahead to the Soter one. Um, I might be, or maybe you can see it in this one. But I think the Soter one. If you look at the foot panel of the Soter one, um, 
uh, down at the bottom, I believe that is a representation of Sothis uh, as a recumbent cow, just like like a, a cow that's kind of laying down, which is one of the ways that Sothis is represented in the hieroglyphic in, uh, inscriptions at Dendera. So we may have a similar pattern of representation um, as that zodiac ceiling in Dendera, um, which would be not that far from from Thebes, really. Um, some people, you know, might even, I think some scholars have suggested that maybe uh, the pattern of these um, coffin lids has been influenced or inspired by uh, the, the Dendera zodiac ceiling. And you have the same uh, cosmological importance then of the recreation or the moment of, of birth and rebirth and the annual cycle um, uh, centered around the Sothis rising, the coming of the Nile and the regeneration of the world. But in this case, it's put in a funerary context. And so it's um, uh, symbolizing the rebirth of the individual into a, into a blessed afterlife. Mm, right. Yeah. So, so they're incorporating different Greek and Egyptian concepts. And that was a really good point that you made that, um, yeah, that some scholars I know I was reading like Francesca Rocheberg referred to it as Greco Egyptian astrology. And I think there's a really strong argument for that of referring to Hellenistic astrology as that. And that's one of the reasons I referred to it as Hellenistic astrology instead of Greek astrology in my book and why I titled that because I wanted to make it clear. Um, that it was a product of the Hellenistic era, and it was the type of astrology that developed in the Hellenistic age when you did have that different blending of cultures of, of Greek and Mesopotamian and Egyptian, um, instead of just calling it you know, Greek astrology, because there's so many different um, elements being drawn from Egyptian and Mesopotamian cultures that it would be a little um, misleading to just call it uh, Greek astrology. Right. There's a particular form of uh, Greek cosmopolitan culture, co cosmopolitan culture, largely in a Greek language uh, that's related to this period, which draws on lots of traditions and translates them. Uh, Greek after Alexander becomes a kind of international language um, of the of the Mediterranean and the Middle East in many ways because of uh, of this political world. Yeah, and so, and and we're needing to talk about this because this really is the continuation of the Egyptian astrological tradition that we saw earlier. Continues right into the Hellenistic tradition, and there are many elements that get imported into it. Um, so, anyway, so there's a lot of cultural blending that's going on, and we also see um, that come up um, recently, actually, with a new discovery that was just made about. Um, um, a like a, a tomb that was discovered um, for an astrologer from the second or third century, a woman named Heliodora. And on the um, tomb, there's like an inscription in Greek just below it. Um, and it refers to her as a, a mathematike, which is the Greek word that was really commonly used in that period, which means mathematician, but it was really commonly used to refer to astrologers because of all the calculations involved. Right, right. It's a really fascinating find. Um, I believe it's from Terranuthis. Is that the um, site where that was originally from? from? It's in a museum collection now, I believe. Um, it's just been recently published. Um, but it's a it's a one of these, uh, definitely one of these um, uh, Greco-Egyptian towns. We have a few funerary stele uh, from the same place in our collections at the um, uh, uh, Kelsey Museum in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan, and uh, they're they're really some of them show these also show these blendings of iconographies showing people reclining in a kind of um, symposium pose with uh, their their drapery on, but then there'll be an Anubis figure or something like that nearby. Um, uh, uh, so it's, it was very much the same kind of uh, um, uh, mixed milieu. Um, and there's, oh yeah, there's a, I think that might be an Anubis figure there um, to the left of our, our reclining figure there. Is that? Yeah. I can't that's quite what they, see it. That's what they interpret it as, I believe, in the, yeah. in the commentary in the paper. Right. And so, 
but also important, um, as, as you pointed out when we were um, talking about this, um, this is the first attested uh, female astrologer that we have um, um, in antiquity. Uh, so an actual, it uh, seems like a practicing astrologer um, there in Egypt who, who was a, a woman. Yeah, and um, I because I'd written a small section on this in my book, how there's references in like juvenile to women consulting with astrologers in the first century in the Roman Empire so often that they became astrologers themselves or started seeing clients, which is kind of, it was a piece of satire. So it was kind of mocking or, or making fun of that, but it was probably pointing to something that was legitimately occurring to some extent by the first century, at least. But then I pointed out in the book how we didn't otherwise know the names of any specific women who were astrologers and that the earliest one we knew of was maybe who could have had some training in astrology would be Hypatia in the fourth or fifth century because we know that she had some training in astronomy and her father was a was a famous astronomer. Uh, although you know we don't have much that survives from her to know what she would have um, done or been familiar with. And then the other earliest person besides that is Baron or Queen Baron of Baghdad in the ninth century, who some astrological legends are associated with. And I did a whole episode on in the past, but this is a big discovery just because it's the first woman we know of by name who who would have practiced astrology and identified as an astrologer. Yeah, and it's it's that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm glad we have that information now. It kind of helps flesh out the the world of astrology a bit more. Um, yeah, and it and it comes from just to this, even though it's second or third century, it comes from again Greco-Roman um, Egypt and that tradition of Hellenistic astrology and the blending of of Greek and Egyptian cultures um, is where we we find this person. Yeah, and we don't know a lot about. Often we can't tell what kind of cultural uh, or ethnic background a, a figure might have had um, because of the name choices you now heliodora um could be a greek name and the person could have an egyptian name as well we don't know um but uh, it's a it's a fascinating document and it's great to great to see um i think that also you know um it, it leads into the question of the the practice of astrology a, a little bit and um uh one of the things that we also have from egypt are of course the the materials uh, that astrologers used sometimes to consult with clients. And so if Heliodora was a, um, a practicing astrologer, uh, she might have used some of the materials like we have um, preserved from on papyri and, and ostraca or on potsherds uh, that uh, are one of our most important sources of information for astrology. Um, and uh, that's a kind of, uh, I'd just wanted to bring attention to that um, briefly because that's uh, uh, an area where there's been some new discoveries that are really exciting and interesting. Um, the uh, um, some of the scholars that we mentioned earlier um, uh, have discovered some new ostraca. Did you want to talk about those now, or did you want to? Um, let's talk now uh, in order to round this out about some of the demotic material that's being rediscovered at this point, where. Um, for the longest time, most of our understanding of Hellenistic astrology was based on um, the Greek and the Latin texts that have survived from that time period, from about the first century BCE until about the sixth or seventh century CE. Um, but recently, uh, especially over the past several decades, there have been some discoveries of some demotic texts written in that sort of cursive Egyptian script that we talked about earlier. That are actually astrological texts and um that's been really fascinating discovery and it's been one that, that is they're, they're still making new discoveries basically even very recently yeah absolutely i mean there have been uh demotic materials um uh, published before some of which we mentioned and um a few uh, materials like the ones that are coming out now, um, but uh, I think we're on the the verge of some some new and exciting materials coming out, and some new, yeah, new data, new um, information about uh, some of the earliest horoscopes that that we have. Um, and what we're talking about are a series of uh, ostraca, which is uh, the word for these potsherds that were used as writing materials um, in Egypt. Uh, it was easily available. Pots were always breaking, and it was cheaper than papyrus, so they were used as a as a writing material. 
And there so are you're just like right directly on this broken piece of pottery, basically either on the on the front or sometimes on the front and the back. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, papyrus had to be made and manufactured, but uh, you know, ostraca were made by breaking pots. It was easy, and uh, they were used. They tend to they used for all kinds of things, but they were often used for um, you know smaller texts or things that you didn't want to spend a lot of money on, like a tax receipt or something like that. We have lots of ostraca that are like simple economic documents, but it seems like they were also used fairly frequently. Uh, for um, horoscopes, for writing down horoscopes. Um, and this is really interesting, I think, because it gives us a little bit of a window and insight into the practice of astrologers who are consulting with clients. Um, yeah. they, they did use papyrus sometimes, but a, a lot of them are preserved on ostraca. Here's a blog article by Andreas Winkler, who's one of the scholars that's working on the demotic material, and he has a, a blog titled A New Look at an Old Horoscope that people can Google, but it shows first a piece of papyrus that has survived that has a birth chart written on it in Greek and how tattered it is in surviving. And then below, he has a picture of one of the um, horoscopes that have survived on a piece of ostraca. Um, and you see this little bro basically broken piece of a pot pottery shard, and it has demotic writing on it, which is, um, it turns out, once translated from demotic, it turns out to be the positions um, of the planets in a birth chart, where it lists the planets in each of the signs of the zodiac. Yeah, yeah, this this is what astrologers would, would do, is they would uh, meet with a client, presumably, and uh, they would get their uh, birth details, and then uh, they would write up, do the calculations, and then write up a summary of of the important points in the uh, in the in the natal chart. Um, and um, most of these, almost all of these, are fairly brief summaries of just the data. And so I think we have to assume that they would then. Uh, either keep this for their own records or perhaps give it to the client in case the client wanted to, uh, you know, refer to it again or take it to another astrologer or the same astrologer um, and and have them give interpretations. Um, but they generally don't have a lot of interpretive information about, you know, what this means. Um, most of them don't. There's a few uh, notable exceptions. Uh, probably the that means that uh, in most cases, those interpretations, the forecasts um, or advice or whatever would be given orally. Um, and another tool that they they might have used um, is uh, something called a pinax, which is an um, astrological board or table that had a depiction of the, the zodiac on it um, and also other things as well, quite often the decans. Um, and or and the terms or or uh, bounds of uh, that were also used in in ancient Egypt and and also in the the rest of the the Mediterranean world um, and they probably would put oh yeah here's a good example of some uh, that were discovered at a site in France um, part of the Roman Empire what was Roman Gaul um, and uh, they were. Um, they could fold up so the astrologer could carry them around sometimes. And they would put little stones, possibly gemstones on them to mark the positions of the planets. And I, I've recently become kind of obsessed with these. I think they're fascinating. And it's it's kind of uh, lovely to imagine an astrologer and a client uh, bending over this board together and the astrologer placing these little gemstones on it to represent the planets and uh, uh, positions of maybe the ascendant and and who knows maybe other points and then right. the astrologer uh, you know explaining it all yeah and this one's cool because it shows the the 12 signs of the zodiac in the center um, but then it also shows the figures for the egyptian decans um, in a circle around on on the outside of the wheel as well so we see the merged again like Mesopotamian zodiac with the Egyptian decans concepts sort of present at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and also, I, I think it's the the terms as well are in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you have the names of the decans in their Greek transliteration. So this is, uh, I believe, this is dated to the um, second century um, CE. 
And so, uh, you know, we're right at the height of, of astrology in the Roman Empire, um, and they're still continuing to use, uh, you know, Egyptian uh, decans. So it's a fascinating object. And with yeah. there, similar th objects have been discovered in Egypt as well, um, not as elaborate as, as that one and, and made of different materials. Uh, um, uh, but they were probably used um, sometimes by astrologers. Of course, they could have also just drawn in the sand or something like that and made a, a diagram in another way. Um, but the the information would have been uh, written down the the birth chart, you know, uh, the the thing that people pull up on their apps or or on a computer screen now would have been the data anyways would have been written down on a um, a pot shirt or a small scrap of papyrus. And what's great about that is that um, we have um, actual evidence of the practice of astrology from particular periods. So as a complement to what we read in these technical manuals, uh, the man well-preserved manuals from the manuscript tradition like Vedius Valens and, and all these other figures, Hephaestio of Thebes and so forth, which give a, a theoretical outline of astrology. These are the products of astrological practice, really, which makes them fascinating. And so what's, uh, what's happened in the last uh, uh, year or so um, is that there's been... Uh, some work to publish and republish uh, a little handful of texts um, in Demotic that represent some of our very earliest records of, of a horoscope. Um, and some were already in collections in museums in, in Europe uh, or in, in the UK, like the Ashmolean Museum. Um, and I, I believe uh, the word on the street is that there's uh, more that have been discovered and that um, may be published sometime in the, in the, I hope, not too distant future. Um, and what makes these special is uh, they're uh, super, well, super early, but I, I think it's fair to call them pretty early uh, by interpreting the data on these um, horoscopes. They, the earliest of them, I think, goes all the way back to 48 um, BCE. Um, so that's uh, um, that would make it the um, earliest surviving um, uh, horoscope that we have from Egypt. I think there's a couple of earlier ones that you mentioned earlier from Mesopotamia, and, and there's some other uh, monuments here and there. But this would, I think, be the earliest one from Egypt, and it's the first century BCE. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, these have been really important. And one of the things that's important is that some of this demotic material has been um, found in collections associated with certain Egyptian temples. So it started to make it clear that um, the practice of astrology as a form of divination by this period, by like the first century BCE and later, started to become something that the priests associated with the Egyptian temple were doing at that point was reading birth charts or horoscopes for people using Hellenistic astrology. Yeah, absolutely. And we we had uh, demotic horoscopes um, uh, before this material. And again, some of these were already uh, published a while ago, um, uh, but the full significance hasn't been quite realized and there's, there's more of them now. But uh, we have a, there's a large collection uh, from uh, the town of uh, Medinet Mahdi in the Fayum region of Egypt. It was known as ancient Narmuthus. And um, uh, there were lots of those discovered there. And uh, I mentioned and those are these... the ones published by my, my, Micah Ross, I think is one that did his uh, PhD thesis on those. Exactly. Yeah. So a full publication of those, which is just fantastic, um, uh, including, you know, calculating uh, the positions and comparing them to modern calculations. So a full you know, study of those uh, uh, those documents, which is great. And um, those, I just mentioned those because although they're later, uh, those are uh, primarily from the second century uh, of the Common Era, uh, they were definitely found in a temple context. And so we know for sure, and they were found in large numbers along with lots of other ostraca. And uh, some of those are also bilingual. Um, so they will have you know, mostly demotic, and then sometimes like Greek words thrown in, or sometimes they're they're bilingual ostraca. So uh, it really shows a couple of things. One that um, priests uh, in Egyptian temples were, uh, in many cases, the ones who were also astrologers, uh, doing work for clients, casting um, natal charts and offering interpretations, and that some of this activity was going on in the temple precinct. Um, 
there's actually some really interesting stuff in the MediNet Madi Ostraka that talks about um, how much money you might expect to earn um, uh, for a consultation. Uh, and there's also mention of rules that astrologers should follow, one of which is that they were supposed to keep their calculations a secret, it seems like. So they were supposed to like, um, if, if the ostraca is interpreted right, they were supposed to get their data and it sounds like uh, go into the inner sanctuary and do their secret calculations and then come back and, and talk about it so that no one um, would see how they were doing what they were doing. And um, that sounds sort of secretive and strange, but uh, there's another document that um, we're waiting for a full publication of called the Book of the Temple, which is a book of rules for temple architecture and for the duties of various priests um, in the temple. And it happens to mention in a fragmentary spot that the knowledge of uh, divination and astrology is meant to be reserved for the highest ranks of priests. Um, uh, and so it was, um, it's evidence of the high esteem uh, in which this knowledge was held, that it was meant to be protected and, and kept uh, secret. Um, but it's all very right. interesting because, yeah, this was a this was definitely something. It may have been practiced in other contexts as well by other kinds of astrologers um, uh, who were maybe working in Greek and not tied to the Egyptian temple context. But it was definitely part of the uh, um, the world of Egyptian temples, or at least some of them. Yeah, well, and the some of the secrecy, you know, even has parallels amongst what we otherwise assume are more public. Greek astrologers like Medius Valens, who you know makes the reader of his text swear an oath to keep the teachings um, secret and not to reveal them with the unlearned or the uninitiated, and Firmicus Maternus has a similar thing, um, and we also see a similar thing with the Hermetic text, the Discourse on the Eighth and the Ninth, which like gives instructions, uh, electional instructions for writing down the material and using an election to do it. I think when Mercury is making a helical rising in Virgo or something like that, and then it makes you sort of swear an oath to keep things secret. Um, so it's interesting that we have that also in the um, sort of Egyptian temple context as well, where things like um, like secrecy and the eliteness of the knowledge, I guess, were were prized or emphasized to a certain extent. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a great point, and I'm glad you brought up the Vedius Valens because I I'd, I'd like to ask you about this. Um, uh, I was reading an article. Uh, I honestly, can't remember uh, uh, the the name, but um, it was uh, pointing out that uh, uh, some of the calculation methods that are included it included in Valens really can only give very approximate um, uh, positions for things if you actually followed them. Um, and so I was wondering if if you have the sense that uh, since you've been you know looking at Valens a lot <laughs> with the publication of this uh, new translation, if you have the sense that Valens might have been holding back some of the technical knowledge um, from his treatise um, uh, for for some of those reasons of secrecy or if, and and providing only calculation techniques that were sort of a rough and approximate. Just a thought. I, I don't know if you have a sense of that or not. I'm I'm springing something out of nowhere, but I, I just kind of your comment about Valens made me think of that. Yeah, I mean, I think there there's some issues in, with in terms of some of the calculations that he gives in like book two, and some of them being more approximate methods, and some of the things being based on earlier sort of uh, more approximate like Babylonian methods um, in terms of the astronomical calculations. And then there's a separate whole separate issue that comes up sometimes also like in the Oxyrhynchus horoscopes about um, most of the time and most of the examples we have are basic horoscopes that just list the rising sign and the rest of the planetary positions by sign. And that most of the different astrologers seem content doing that and think that you can go pretty far just doing things by sign. And then that that's a sort of perfectly sufficient method on its own. Um, to just do things by sign, both in terms of like calculating houses by sign, as well as aspects by sign, and so on and so forth. But then there's also sometimes more um, advanced or more complicated techniques, which will do things by degree. And we see that sometimes in some of the horoscopes, where certain horoscopes 
will like for example in the terminology of like alexander jones and the oxyrhynchus horoscopes he points out how sometimes there's these more advanced what he calls deluxe horoscopes that list mm -hmm. all the degree positions of the placements um and one of the points i think that they make is that it would have been more complicated and more time consuming to calculate things by degree and to do the deluxe horoscopes so that there may have partially been like a like a time factor involved on the part mm -hmm. of the astrologer but they're also from like a market standpoint may have been like a like a cost difference as well on the part of the consumer in terms of mm -hmm. like what what would have cost more to get like a more deluxe horoscope um sort of calculated so i think there's just like different factors like that going on that are kind of hard to get into when it comes to balance but <clears throat> most of the time i think he's just he's um happy with a more approximate method of, of calculating things by sign right uh, that's a great point about like sort of price point <laughs> you know what's your what can your client afford that's a that's a really great uh thought yeah, yeah. Well, and it's still relevant today and that's something that happens today just in terms of the time commitment of the astrologer and like how much prep time does an astrologer do preparing for a consultation how long does the consultation itself go is the consultation something that the person the astrologer has been preparing for or are they doing the consultation on the fly like does for example there can be instances where you have a astrologer that works in a shop or something like that and, and somebody will just come in off the street and say you know read my birth chart and they have a specific um, issue that they want to talk about I'm sure there's parallels with in the ancient world between those two things in terms of that and and how much time the astrologer has to prepare and things like that and that's something I'd like to do an episode on at some point is just talking about ways in which some parallels in terms of the practice of astrology today could actually provide a lot of insight into the way that astrology was practiced back then if you remove some of the the technological components and you just think in terms of some of the practicalities of doing some of this it can actually give you a lot of insights into what the practice would have been back then just by observing some of the things that are, are still similar to this day I think that's a fantastic idea. I think that's one of the the, the ways you know um, uh, uh, people who approach it academically and people who are practicing astrologers can really you know <laughs> join forces, as it were, and, and kind of learn something from those kinds of insights. That's a really fantastic idea. I think you should do it. <laughs> yeah, it's really yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll follow up. Um, yeah, yeah. So I I should guess we should get back to the. Uh, so so we were talking a bit about practice there and how these ostraca were, um, you know, at the center of of uh, these practicing astrologers' uh, methods of kind of gathering data and writing it down. Yeah. And um, what's interesting, uh, you were mentioning the different levels of the horoscopes. What's also interesting, uh, in addition to these ones, these demotic ones that are being uh, published and republished. Uh, now, um, is that they're also relatively complicated or complex compared to later demotic um, uh, horoscopes. Um, a lot of the Normuthus ones are fairly straightforward and simple, but these have a a few more a few more details uh, to them. And so uh, they, you know, they have, um, uh, you know, they they go through. Uh, a set of uh, they have a typical form they seem to follow or they put the date down uh the the name of the 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 person the native as it were um the positions of the sun moon and the planets um and using signs but also sometimes the, the egyptian terms um that is the subdivisions of of the zodiac sign uh they sometimes include a few remarks on the life of the native it seems like um and the um publishers uh um both uh, Andreas Winkler and Marina Escalana Poveda have commented that these may be related to length of life calculations or some sort of technique like that. Um, they mentioned the the cardinal points that we were talking about earlier on um, in in our in our chat, um, and then they give other positions. And this is where it gets really interesting. In addition to all the standard, you know, just like a lot of a lot of simple horoscopes will just have like positions of the planets, date, um, the ascendant, and sometimes that's about it. Um, uh, but these have all of that um, and plus uh, uh, pairs of points that there's some debate about, about what they actually are. And some uh, uh, sometimes uh, um, Andreas Winkler has interpreted 
Uh, some of these as related to the lots, um, especially the lot of fortune and the lot of the daimon, which are well known from later as astrology. Yeah, uh, but I also mean, we, they're uh, yeah. clearly like a set of lots, and we don't have to get too much into that debate because I don't want to get into the debate too much between the different people, but just that there have been some really amazing papers that have been published recently that show a set of horoscopes that are way earlier um, and way more complex or advanced than we thought previously and are also doing things with the lots or the houses that could change some of our understanding of like the history of, of horoscopic astrology and Hellenistic astrology. And part of what it's doing is it's um, <clears throat> it's pushing the demotic material back further, and it's starting to raise questions about did astrology, did Hellenistic astrology as we understand it, did it develop in demotic first, and then it was passed off to the Greek astrologers essentially into Greek, or did it develop in Greek first, and then it was passed off to the demotic astrologers? I think up until recently, it's been much more easy and common to assume that it was developed in Greek, and then the demotic astrologers started practicing it as well. But now it's really starting to raise some serious questions about um, if the demotic, if the material, the, the, these techniques could have developed in demotic first, and then started influencing the the Greek tradition, basically. Yeah, um, and and a, a, a sort of third possibility would be that you know some of these astrologers could well be bilingual um, and be working in both languages. You know, we we, we could think that you know that, that uh, uh, their primary practice may be one or the other. But some of these people were um, could well have been bilingual um, at at this stage in in late Ptolemaic Egypt. So mm -hmm. um, there could be even more complex situation of of kind of co development in some cases uh, where you have people working in in both traditions. Uh, but it's yeah. a it's a fascinating set of material, yeah. So the um, there's three papers that basically everyone should check out. One of them was by, as you said, Marina Escalano Poveda. It's titled "Astrological Arthabitana for mm -hmm. Demotic Hieratic Horoscopes from Athribus. Um, The other one was uh, Andreas Winkler's paper on the Demotic Hieratic Horoscopes from Arthribus. And then Winkler's also published another more extensive paper titled The First Zodiac Sign and the Diamond, The Advent of an Astrological Tradition and Seven Elaborate Horoscopes. Um, so those are really important, and that's really raising some interesting things. And some of these, they just discovered, basically, they have a discovery date in 2021 where they discovered some of these demotic horoscopes. So that's how recent some of these discoveries basically are taking place um, that they're then publishing papers on now. Yeah, it's really it's really exciting. I'm looking forward to that material uh, coming out and seeing what else we learn from it. Um, I think you know the um, the uh, this some of these um, positions that are noted have been noted in other other uh, horoscopes as well. But just to to close another circle, uh, some of these either lots or places, um, just like in the Greek term terminology, are referred to as the the lots of fortune or daimon and. Um, uh, the daimon is uh, the same word that we're talking about, shai. Um, it's this, it's a demotic version of that uh, that figure who sort of attends the birth and follows it. And uh, shepshit is the name for fortune, uh, which is one of the the female divinities that's often paired with uh, the shai um, as a, as a counterpart to uh, the daimon. So we have you know it's it's interesting. Like um, again, there's lots something new going on here in in uh, the the emergence of this horoscopic natal astrology in the demotic practice, but some of the terminology is carrying on very old traditions. Yeah, that's really important. Um, that that earlier concept of of you said shy, uh, which was that Egyptian concept of fate. That that concept that's from almost like pre birth chart astrology, prenatal astrology here comes up in the natal astrology tradition in Egypt, and they start naming specific technical points after that, and that has then bearing on the astrological interpretation. Right, right. Yeah, I don't know how early Shai gets connected to um, astrological signs. There's some possible evidence in a demotic wisdom text um, called the Insinger Papyrus, where there may be a reference to fate being um, uh, connected to the stars and, and announced by the stars. Um, and that may that may go further back. We don't know exactly the date of that, but certainly there's a concept of fate and shy 
uh, that, that goes way, 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 way back um, uh, before we have uh, any of this, um, uh, you know, anything even you know, remotely resembling uh, natal astrology kind of anywhere, including Mesopotamia. So that's uh, that's these interesting threads coming together. Yeah. Um, um, one of the other oh, things that's ahead. really interesting about um, some of the demonic material also is um, Winkler points out in one of his, in the last paper that I mentioned, um, some of the symbols used for the signs of the zodiac uh, that became common in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the Western tradition, there's long been a, a realization going, you know, back to Neugebauer, I think pointed out that the symbol for Libra was very similar to or was the same as the hieroglyphic Egyptian symbol for like the the setting place of the Western horizon. And um, Winkler and others have shown that there's other parallels where the later astrological symbols for the signs of the zodiac, um, you know, may have been inspired by some of the symbols that were used in hieroglyphic or in demotic. Right, exactly. Um, the the Libra uh, is as the horizon. You know that that's one that's still even kind of with us today, with that sort of bar and then the you know little bump like that. Mm -hmm. um, that could be uh, uh, very much the the Ahet, um, and I think, to, yeah, that's the one you have on the screen right there. Um, the Sagittarius as a kind of arrow glyph um, also makes a lot of sense, and you can see the continuity. You know, some of them are not as obvious as as others, and um, uh, another one is maybe maybe too obvious, but um, the Aquarius sign. Those are actually uh, those wavy lines are used uh, in hieroglyphic writing to represent water. Um, the word mu is um, as, as a as a set of you know two or three wavy lines like that. Uh, so there's you know a connection there um, possibly, um, and uh, you know there's also um, uh, you know some uh, folks like uh, Joachim Quack, whom we mentioned earlier, have suggested that. Uh, certain planetary signs uh, might have a relationship. So that kind of pointiness of the the um, Mars glyph uh, might be related to the use of a knife um, uh, sign. Um, and there's right. also some of the demotic uh, other demotic horoscopes use the symbol of a knife for for the planet Mars. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that that may have evolved into uh, some of the later uh, glyphs. And I believe also um, sometimes that the sign of Venus, um, and we saw Venus and the name of Venus on that Dendera uh, zodiac, who's called Panetra Dua, which is the morning god. Um, Dua is sometimes written as a lotus sign. And so uh, Clark has suggested that the, the shape of this lotus with its little stem may eventually have evolved into uh, the sign uh, in later manuscripts, which is less complex than uh, the circle with the cross underneath it that we think of, it's just a circle and a line. And Kvaka suggested there may have been an evolution from the Dua sign to that simplified circle and line, which is kind of antecedent to our uh, Venus uh, glyph that is uh, used today. So. Uh, there's a whole set of, uh, um, and I think Alexander Jones also talks about some of these similarities and shows uh, some of the notations that were used in the um, uh, the Greek papyri and also the manuscript tradition, and notes that the Greek papyri often use uh, an abbreviation of some kind based on the name of the planet, uh, but that when there's a symbol that later emerges in the early manuscript tradition and astrological manuscripts, some of those seem to be traceable back to demotic signs. And so we we have, a, I think, a, 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 that's another interesting element of the continuity of practice. You know, these are the kinds of things that would be passed on from teacher to student, presumably, as, as you just, you know, nobody talks about it, but you just learn how to write the sign for a, a planet or a sign of the zodiac, and they just get passed on. Yeah. Well, and I think it's really important because there's a tendency in some of the Greek most of the Greek material to write the planetary names out in Greek words, like use the full name like Zeus for Jupiter or Aris for Mars Mars or, or what have you. But here in the Demotic tradition, we have a, a tradition of them using like a single symbol and sometimes like a pictorial representation essentially for some of the planets or the signs of the zodiac. 
And that clearly, in some instances, some of those symbols continued all the way into present day where the Aquarius symbol is still exactly or very closely the same. I guess today it's two wavy lines, whereas in this tradition we're looking at it was three. Um, or the Libra symbol, like you said, is very close. But that basically means like the short version of that is somebody could summarize that by saying that the um, Egyptians contributed the concept essentially of the astrological glyphs. And in some ways that goes all the way back to the use of like hieroglyphs in the Egyptian um, tradition, you know, much further back in the sense of using pictorial symbols in order to represent things. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's much more um, that ideographic writing or or concept based signs is much more of an Egyptian tradition, obviously, than a Greek tradition of writing. So, just the whole idea itself. Yeah, very much. Yeah. So, just I think that's important, just in terms of um, thinking about this question of, especially once things get murky about, you know, what's Mesopotamian and what's Greek and what's Egyptian in the Hellenistic period where it's all merging together, that there may be specific pieces we can focus on and say, this is something perhaps that Egyptian con culture contributed to astrology that, that seems a little, little bit more clear cut compared to other things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and including some of the other things that we've already talked about today. There are elements that have antecedent traditions or that you can locate in a particular um, tradition of practice more generally, writing systems and styles and so forth. And, and those um, have longer prior histories and a cultural context within Egypt that um, uh, tends to crystallize around temples and, and their writing systems. And so right. a little bit more, you know, yeah, it's 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 good to think about all of those possibilities. I'm glad you pointed that out because we have both these multicultural, multi-ethnic milieus where there's lots of translation going on, but we also have these um, continuations of longstanding traditions that that um, I won't say are unchanged uh, or unchanging, but um, there's a, a specific institution or a social location in this world where they preserve certain kinds of practice and certain kinds of ideas. Yeah. And so some of this material, like we said, is really just discovered very recently through the finds, through through archaeological excavations in some of these um, cities in Egypt that are still ongoing to this day. And one of the things I've realized over recently in researching this material more is that this could be just the tip of the iceberg. Like there's probably going to be many more discoveries and other publications of other things that may change our understanding of the practice of astrology in Egypt in the first few centuries BCE and CE, just based on further finds, basically. Yeah, it's it's a really exciting time. And and then there's also the thing we mentioned earlier, the, the need to publish materials that were discovered uh, at various times, but um, people haven't been able to um, you know gather the the labor together to really work through these difficult texts and, and transcribe them and translate them uh, and and then publish commentaries on them. Uh, we do have, as I mentioned, demotic treatises that are also, you know, tables for finding the position of planets. Um, some that include uh, sketches of interpretive principles for various things, uh, but there's also large numbers of ones that are reported that are in collections and just are waiting for um, translation to be brought to light. Yeah, so that's really important. And it raises one of the points for me that starts getting us towards a conclusion. But I think there's things now we can start to see like the the glyphs and, and hieroglyphs and that connection or connection to modic of using pictorial symbols. It means sometimes there's things that we take for granted um, in the Western tradition of astrology that we assume or that have long been assumed to go back to the Greeks and that were Greek thought to be Greek innovations that we've taken for granted are Greek for a long time that may have actually been introduced by Egyptian astrologers or, or been a byproduct of, of Egyptian cultural things um, that came from demotic or other traditions surrounding that. And so there may be other parts of the astrological tradition that that have long been assumed to be Greek or what have you that may actually also come from uh, or been Egyptian contributions essentially. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if we turn back again to that that figure Nikepso um, and Petosiris, uh, as you mentioned, it was an earlier tradition to assume that this was a, a Greek um, invention uh, creating a sort of 
authoritative figure as an author for astrological doctrines and tracing it back to Egypt because that was understood as a site of wisdom. But then, you know, uh, just a little while ago, um, uh, a papyrus story about um, a priest by the a papyrus story in Demotic about a priest by the name of Peti Aze, um, uh, which is close to Petoceris um, and may be partly a, a, a you know relate, related a misunderstanding related to the way it's written in Demotic. This Peti Aze in this story um, finds a, in a temple a, a manuscript, an old book on astrology by a certain Imhotep. And then presents it uh, to this pharaoh, uh, Nekepso, or uh, uh, Nikau Pashesh, who's the Neko of the wise, who's the historical figure. So um, these are, and then there follows actually an astrological text, which has some doctrines of interpretation related to the moon. So the more these demonic texts get published, the more we sort of revise some of our understandings of, of the position of these uh um, these things that we see in Greek texts, you know, some of them are, of course, I'm going to derive from uh, Greek tradition, but sometimes we catch these little glimpses in newly pu published papyri. I think that uh, uh, translation of that text was only published in 2019 by um, Kim Reiholt and um, Joachim Kvak again. So uh, right. new, new finds, new discoveries all the time. And I know you've, you're have you working on a paper, you've done a paper where you're tr also trying to identify the composition of some of the Nechepso and Pedasiris texts um, and locating it to the second century, like the middle of the second century BCE, based on some internal statements that might have been made in it based on the version of the text that's attributed to the Egyptians by Hephaestia. Right, right. I think um, the, there's a wonderful series of, of eclipse omens that uh, appear in Hephaestu of Thebes that are attributed uh, to Nekepso. And um, they. Uh, it's been long um, suggested that these refer to historical events, that is, the, the um, outcomes of what's supposed to happen when an eclipse occurs in a particular um, astrological sign. Uh, these are given interpretations, and then some of them look a lot like historical events from the, the second, and, uh, second century BCE. So I went through and did some work on that, and um, what I think emerges from that is um, there's an interesting combination of elements, once again, that there uh, is the Mesopotamian tradition of omen literature related to uh, eclipses, um, and there's traces of that in, in these Nikepso and Petosiris uh, in the structure of, of these predictions, but there's also possibly empirical um, processes involved that um, scholars working in uh, Alexandria, astrological scholars working in Alexandria were observing eclipses and eclipse phenomena and then uh, developing correlations, maybe outcomes uh, based on events that they were observing. This eclipse happened. This was followed by these events. This was recorded in some way, much like the Babylonian omen literature was, was recorded and, and became codified. And so the text may be a blend of a continuation of, of Babylonian traditions, but also um, Egyptian um, uh, observations and um, uh, empirical contributions to the the science of, in this case, eclipse interpretation. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, so that's really important because it could locate, you know, the creation of this system, or at least the writing of some of the foundational texts that really got it going to somewhere around the second century BCE. And um, the other piece, just to tie everything together as well, is one the, the really important turning point that everyone wants to locate at this point is when did astrologers start using the system of 12 houses that mm -hmm. assign specific areas or specific topics of life to different parts of the birth chart? Because um, that was really the major turning point um, where we moved from the Mesopotamian tradition and their form of natal astrology into the... Um, the new tradition of Hellenistic astrology that became so popular from the first century BCE forward. Mm -hmm. um, and the um, you know, one of the things that really becomes important in terms of that is um the use of the rising sign and starting to use the rising sign and referring to it as the hour marker, um, and then using that to start 
um, once you determine what sign was rising over the eastern horizon at the moment of a person's birth, then that sign becomes the first house, and then the sign after that becomes the second house, and so on and so forth. And um, whenever that started happening, that kind of marks a really turning point in the history of astrology. And I know, <clears throat> for example, uh, Micah Ross and Dorian Greenbaum have written a paper um, arguing that it was the Egyptian use of the decans, and especially the rising and culminating decan to tell time that acted as the precursor to the development of that system of using the ascendant and using the 12 houses. Um, and to the extent that that's correct, then it means that's another very specific um, thing that the Egyptian tradition would have contributed to the later practice of Western astrology, um, whether that was innovated by you know, an Egyptian person or a Greek person or a Mesopotamian person around the second century when um, they started using, when that tradition of using the 12 houses started being used? Yeah, yeah, I think that's an important observation that that, that whole system of uh, houses or, or places, as they're called in Greek sometimes, is really keyed to uh, very much to that ascendant position and, and all the other um, positions. And um, I think that's, um, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, I hope, more information um, uh, available uh, as those uh, new ostraca get published um, and be interesting to see if if they represent some sort of um, early version of the houses or some of them are a mixture of lots and houses, what what actually emerges when, um, when we uh, get more of that data. But um, uh, that seems to be something that very much occurs um, or it can be traced to this Egyptian milieu, whether, like you say, whether it was developed by uh, folks working in Greek, folks working in demonic or bilingual individuals who are conversant in, in multiple traditions, um, uh, who are scholars kind of collating and, and assembling materials, reflecting on them and developing new concepts and theories of interpretation. Yeah. And maybe even the, like you you said uh, several times, like maybe even the attempt to try to point to like one culture or another is a mistake, you know, on our part, trying to look back on things when we're talking about a culture where, where things were much more mixed together and like synthesized. And um, yeah, and, and maybe it's it's hard to attribute things to one specific thing, but we do know ultimately, I guess what's important is that this new system of astrology probably largely developed in Egypt, um, especially probably around Alexandria from the second and first century BCE, and then went on to become so popular that it was sort of spread around the world and continues to influence and largely be the basic system of astrology that's used around the world to this day. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing origin point. It's a, it's a coming together of traditions um, in a, in a, for its region, a globalized kind of world, um, a ferment of uh, cultural interactions and exchanges that produces something that's, yeah, once again, part of a, of a global world. And uh, there's multiple traditions, um, uh, you know, of astrology uh, in, in our world, but um, there are connections and contact points between uh, many of the ones that are all the way across um, all of what we call Afro-Eurasia, the whole landmass, and that now is, you know, of course, in the in the uh, in North America and South America as well, um, uh, and it's also kind of exciting that this is a moment, as as you pointed out in in your podcast, uh, uh, it's a long moment, uh, but over the last uh, you know thirty years or so, uh, that um, this tradition has been revived and and um, brought back to life and become you know a kind of a revived living tradition, um, partly through. Uh, the new era of globalization and the way things are disseminated and communicated, uh, um, especially on the internet and other technologies. It's kind of a, it's amazing to think about different moments of globalization of, of um, astrology and astrological doctrines and the exchange of information. Um, uh, and, and I mean, they're very different moments, but uh, it's, it's still worth thinking about uh, the, the, the way that um, flows of information contribute to the production of new knowledge. Or the revival yeah. of old knowledge. No, I mean, that's a really great point where today, you know, as a result of the internet and as a result of like um, um, like Hollywood or, or culture, you have a language like English, for example, that is being used as a common language that many different people are using around the world. And it's actually facilitated a lot of 
interaction amongst astrologers and the exchange of techniques and approaches and, and philosophies and, and things like that. Because one of the things I've observed is like anytime you put, and this is true for the entirety of history, anytime you put two astrologers in a room together, they start talking and they start comparing their approaches to astrology and their approaches, even if they don't agree, start start rubbing off on each other. And eventually you start to see a, a mixture or, or a synthesis of their approaches over a long enough timeline. And um, we have an exact parallel basically in the Hellenistic period where you had all these cultures suddenly being connected, sometimes through the language of Greek, and sometimes in other times just through um, physical proximity to each other of, of a bunch of astrologers meeting up in Egypt, basically, and the synthesis of the different systems coming together and creating something new. Um, and that's kind of what we've been talking about and exploring here. And Egypt was very much the the place that um, supported that and sort of like fostered that development um, during the the Hellenistic age around the the second and first century BC, right. Um, and and you know the flip side of that is too local places preserve their um, local traditions and and cultures and interacting with that global culture. So it's a it's a really uh, you know and and they reconfigure their ideas and traditions in relation to it. Um, so it's a it's a it's a fascinating set of exchanges to to observe. That's actually something I'm really interested in, which is that in some of the demotic texts that have been recovered so far, there's been variations. So that's actually something that's really interesting is there may have been some local variations in different like cities across Egypt in the astrology practice and or even in different like temples, there may have di been slightly different traditions or different approaches that were practiced. And so while there may have been some commonality, there may have been some differences as well. Um, and that is something that's already coming up in some of the demotic horoscopes. And it's something that I'm interested to see where that goes as additional ones are discovered in the future. Yeah, no, it's a really exciting time. Uh, you know, there's some people have referred to different ways of laying things out in these um, horoscope ostraca, you know, like a Theban tradition. And then we have these ones from a Thribus. And then there's a large number from uh, Narmuthus, and we think of them as being later and therefore simpler, but maybe it's just a regional variation. You know, if we had more of a timeline uh, from Narmuthus um, and other places, maybe we would see that actually these are a very localized uh, traditions of students handing on their practices, uh, or sorry, other way around, teachers handing on their practices to students. And this is just how you do this um, in this lineage and tradition. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's really amazing. Um, all right. Well, I think that starts to bring us towards the end of this this episode and this discussion. This is a really amazing, sweeping uh, discussion where we've covered so much at this point. Are there any things that we meant to mention or w wanted to mention that we'll be kicking ourselves if we if we don't before we wrap up? Um, uh, I I can't think of anything right now. I mean, I'm, there's a million things to to mention uh, and other aspects um, uh, that uh, I, I suppose we could pursue, but I think we've covered a, a, a huge number of uh, pieces of information and reference points for the uh, the development of of astrology uh, in Ptolemaic Egypt. Um, so one topic that we touched on briefly, but that bears further research is the Corpus Hermeticum and the relationship between the technical and philosophical hermetica. So for our purposes, the main issue is that there is a whole collection of very influential early astrological texts attributed to Hermes and Asclepius and Achepso and Petasiris that we don't really know who authored those texts. While it's previously been assumed that they were authored by Greeks under Egyptian guise, which is part of what is often also assumed about the philosophical Hermetica as well, since they incorporate a number of concepts from the Greek philosophical schools, it's possible that there was a greater Egyptian influence in some of the doctrines of the technical Hermetica than has been previously assumed. So I want to make that point, and, and to some extent, this sort of reappraisal of the Egyptian contribution has also been happening when it comes to the philosophical Hermetica over the past few decades, and there's been more analysis of some of the legitimate pieces of Egyptian contributions, or at least inspirations, in the Hermetica. Um, the recently discovered Demotic Book of Toth is one example, and I know that's one that you wanted to mention, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, this was a, a work that was known and part, parts of it were 
published um, at, at various stages in the history of its gradual discovery. But finally, um, uh, some time ago, I think it was 2005, um, uh, Richard Jasnow and Carl Theodor Tsausik published a full edition of it and translation and commentary. And that was kind of a landmark moment when um, people had a good text and could be able to compare it with the kinds of things that we're seeing in the works that you mentioned, the philosophical Hermetica works like the Asclepius and other philosophical dialogues. And it was kind of an interesting mixed result. There were some very interesting parallels between these works, but also some really interesting differences as well. Um, one of the things that was clear was that they both worked in a similar sort of genre of writing. They were both dialogues. Um, so the Book of Thoth was uh, structured as a dialogue between a figure known as Hesrech, or he who praises knowledge or wisdom, and someone called Merech, is who, he who loves wisdom or, or desires wisdom or learning. Um, and it's a dialogue between these figures. But um, and they discuss all sorts of sacred knowledge, which is of course the the basic uh, genre of the philosophical her her Hermetica. They talk about the cosmos and uh, the nature of knowledge and uh, the divine. Um, uh, so there's broad similarities in that respect. Some of the um, and I know you've talked about the Hermetica in another episode, so we won't go into too much detail. But there's even one point where the house of life is mentioned in the um, Hermetica. And that's a term that is really of Egyptian origin. It's the ter term for the temple scriptorium, uh, the place where all the books were stored and where the teaching of scribes and priests was carried out. And that's significant in this case because the uh, the Book of Thoth is a dialogue that's essentially an initiation text, a text that describes a dialogic initiation between these two figures, where the, the wise figure, who scholars believe is probably meant to be Thoth or Hermes, guides the student, uh, the initiate or initiant, the one to be initiated through various dialogues um, where knowledge is tested and explored. And that's also, again, very similar to the kind of roles that you see in the philosophical Hermetica. And some of the, uh, the mythological characters are, are very uh, closely matched. The um, Book of Thoth includes a, a long praise to the god Imhotep, um, who's a divinized human, who was the great architect of uh, Djoser's pyramid, the first step pyramid, but became a kind of divinized figure uh, of a scribe in Egyptian tradition and was identified with Asclepius. And Asclepius, of course, in both astrological texts and, and hermetic texts appears as a purveyor of wisdom. So there's a, a, so all these kind of parallels and contact points. Um, and yet there's also really profound differences in other respects in the demonic things. The de and I would describe it as the difference between a, the settings of the two. They're both kind of a little uh, um, dialogic, sometimes a pair or a group of people talking about these issues in a question and answer format. But the demonic material is very much keyed into this scriptorium, the house of life, and learning about writing and the nature of writing and the nature of hieroglyphic signs, and even down to the equipment of the scribe, the pens and inks and things like that, as well as the traditional mythological landscapes of Egypt um, and all sorts of esoteric symbolic wisdom uh, that's that was part of the learning of the house of life. And um, included in that although it's not mentioned a great deal, included in that is a little bit about um, astronomy and some of the things that we were talking about previously in the episode about the, the nature of the course of the stars and the, that being required knowledge for priests to be able to um, you know, follow the course of the stars and the timing of rituals and uh, understand uh, the constellations. So um, there, there are contact points, but it looks really, it looks quite different. So it's a really interesting mix. Um, and well, I think one of the ways to think about it is that these were probably produced um, in very similar milieu, both the Greek texts and the demotic texts, um, but they take different forms and have different cultural reference points and dialogues with a wider world of literature that is specific to those two languages and their contexts. So anyone who 
um, was familiar with demotic would have probably been trained in a temple scriptorium. And so all of these allusions to traditional Egyptian knowledge would have been um, available to them in a much more rich way. And those who were reading something like the Greek Hermetica would not necessarily, they could have, but would not necessarily have access to all of those cultural reference points. And so it's framed in a very different way. But I would say it's um, it's a product of uh, probably a mixed cultural milieu. And they both, some of the texts may have emerged from the same milieu from among these bilingual individuals that, that um, we were talking about earlier. The fact is, of course, that we just don't know. A lot of it's speculation, and, and not just speculation, though, but opportunities for further research, I would say. It's really going to be exciting as more and more demotic texts come out. And now that um, the Book of Thoth has been around for a while, scholars can really start the, uh, the, the hard work and business of comparing these texts and trying to figure out what the, what the contact points really are um, working between the two traditions. Right. So, and this is a text that just we didn't know about that was just discovered in Demotic and um, just showed a little bit of parallels in almost like the format with some of the Greek Hermetic texts. So that even though there wasn't a lot of clear one-for-one -one correspondence in terms of there being a connection between the two, it sort of maybe gave a, a better notion of what the Greek Hermetica almost might have been um, imitating in some sense, or or is that is that a okay way to frame it? I think that could be fair. Or you could, it, since we since they actually are roughly contemporary, the demotic texts. Uh, this is another question that a point you raised earlier. I want to get back to is the question of authorship and how do we date these things can be really right. complicated. But I'll, I'll hold that for a second. But because we know that the manuscripts of the Book of Thoth, that is the actual papyrus texts with the demonic writing on them, are roughly contemporary with some of the earlier stages of the Hermetic writings as we have as they've traditionally been dated. There's a significant overlap there. It's entirely possible that they were being produced at about the same time in the same world of cultural connections. Like so first first century, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so, uh, and and for you know, longer, later, and early, a little bit earlier, maybe in some cases, although that's harder to trace in the actual papyri. Um, but um, that that means essentially that we can't always put our finger on. Okay, this one was produced first, and therefore this one must be uh, a copy derived from that or influenced by it. We have to sort of say, well, they were produced in the same context, and they both make references to the same kind of cultural ideas. Maybe they're produced in the same milieu, but that's going to be something to try and trace, tease out with further study and research. I think. Right, for sure. Um, yeah. I do. Do you think? Do you, I, I do think, or do you think it's fair to say that in the past few decades, there's been more of a reappraisal of the Greek Corpus Hermeticum? And that those philosophical or relig religious texts having little bits and pieces of um, more legitimate Egyptian sort of doctrines embedded in them than was thought previously. I think that's true. Uh, one that I always like to, uh, I think, yeah, over time, you know, certainly over the course of the second half of the 20th century in very slow stages, um, more and more of a realization came to the fore. Um, certainly, I think Garth Fowden's book, The Egyptian Hermes, was an important turning point where he really tried to understand the historical milieu of those texts better and situate them more in Egypt. Um, and then as demotic studies progressed um, in leaps and bounds, really after Fowden's work, uh, more and more parallels came to be traced. And one of the things that I think was uh, um, identifiable even before that, uh, that's a point I like to make is there's a passage in the Asclepius um, uh, where uh, one of the characters is, you know, um, showing an opposition to the translation of sacred knowledge into Greek, even though the text is actually preserved in, in Greek, um, and um, uh, saying that the sacred writings, the hieroglyphs of, the, of Egyptians are the only pure form for um, purveying this knowledge. And, and that's really interesting because um, uh, some of the things that are said in that passage uh, resonate with some of the ideas about um, the, the, the 
way that hieroglyphs are thought to transmit knowledge um, in a divine form that you can read in the book of Thoth, really, um, in mm. some in some ways, or you know, in a in a thematic sense. And so I think um, more and more of these things are being identified. I think there's still more work to do there, uh, but I think um, it's it's it is becoming clearer that there's some sort of conversation between these texts. Um, and and that's and that's something that I think continued work will show the publication of more more texts. You know, it's also worth bearing in mind that although the Book of Thoth really was a big text that um, you know um, was viewed as a philosophical hermetic kind of text, but in demotic, um, there's also the little um, steps in the increase of our knowledge of the interaction in what were called the technical hermetica, the, the more technical texts about um, rituals, practices, technical knowledge like astrology and, and so forth. And um, as we were talking about earlier in the episode, um, we're getting a better understanding of the fact that this was very much a live issue in, in demotic as well, demotic Egyptian uh, and those literate Egyptian speaking and writing circles as, in the temples as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so that was the next. So let me continue on with what I wrote down. I, I, uh, I forgot. I, I was going to say something about authorship, but if you wanted to, I, I don't know if you were getting to that point as well. There's there's another point about authorship, but um, you can continue first and I can come back to that. Or should I uh, mention authorship my, of the philosophical hermetica? Well, the, the problem of authorship um, in general, uh, we mentioned okay. it a bit around the Nekepso Petisiris text, but I don't know, maybe mm. you were about to cover that. I can't remember. Um, yeah, actually, well, here, I'll, I'll finish, let me just finish what I was saying, and then we'll yeah. circle back, back to that, because um, then I'll at least get some of the summarizing stuff out. So I, I went on to say that um, after this section, oh yeah, I did want to refer people for just the Hermetica and the Corpus Hermeticum that I did an episode a year ago uh, titled um, Hermeticism in Ancient Astrology with Sam Block, and that was episode 339 of the Astrology Podcast, so people can listen to that for a more detailed discussion of some of that. Um, but but moving on from the Philosophical Hermetica, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to say, it was like, now with the rise of the demonic astrological material, it may be possible before too long to be able to give a more accurate assessment that's a bit more generous to the Egyptian astrological tradition than previous ones have been. Um, this is especially true since the recent demotic horoscopes published in the past few years have showed a greater degree of technical sophistication, unique concepts that were not represented in the Greek material, as well as a much earlier dating than what may have been expected previously. So um, as a result of that, it's possible that some of the attributions of different parts of the astrological system to Egyptians or to Egyptian figures which were previously often chalked up simply to Greek authors adopting exotic sounding foreign pen names, could instead signal that the authors of those texts were originally inspired by some sort of earlier Egyptian tradition that was happening in the temples in the Hellenistic era that we just don't have much documentation of since we're missing so much in the way of texts, not just from the Egyptian tradition, but also even from the Greek tradition from that time period. Um, so this would be in line, for example, with Iamblichus's statement that the Egyptian priests were in the habit of attributing all their writings to Hermes in order to signal their intellectual indebtedness to that tradition. Um, it does seem like the center of the activity was Alexandria in the second century BCE as the likely turning point for the full development of Hellenistic astrology, and there's some sort of lingering issue in terms of the tension between, on the one hand, the diversity of the tradition and how we can see many different components that were coming from um, earlier traditions and cultures and philosophies. Well, on the other hand, there are significant parts of the system that Hellenistic astrology represents that do seem like um, a technical construct that was developed and integrated different pieces together as part of a larger whole with some sort of overarching systemization or underlying philosophical or conceptual motivations in mind. So ultimately, it still comes back to the question of what was contained or introduced in the earliest texts attributed to Hermes and Asclepius and Nechepso and Petasiris in the astrological tradition, because it's in these early texts that we find the foundational concepts that most of the later astrologers combined and used and took for granted. 
So as David Pingree said at one point in one of his papers, we can only hope that future archaeological or other textual finds help to answer some of these longstanding questions without raising too many new ones. Um, but to the extent that the system of Western astrology was synthesized in Egypt around the 2nd century BCE as a result of some clear antecedents in the Egyptian tradition, I think we can safely say that Egypt made a major contribution to the astrological tradition, and the form of astrology that many astrologers still practice around the world today has its roots in part in a much earlier tradition of Egyptian astrology. So that was part of the conclusion I wanted to write down just to bring some closure to our whole episode and, and discussion of, you know, the point of all those different pieces that we talked about during the course of this. Yeah, that's really a great way to frame it. Um, you know, it's both a, a, a series of parts from different uh, areas, culture areas and traditions around this Mediterranean, Middle Eastern world that came together and each made these significant contributions, including the Egyptian one. Um, as we're becoming more and more aware of it. But there's also, yeah, just like you were saying, this moment of uh, synthesis that really takes place in the multicultural cosmopolitan world centered in Alexandria, to some extent also integrated with the world of the temples um, where these practices were being preserved. And as time goes on, we're becoming more and more bilingual as well. So it's uh, it's a it's a pl time and a place where you can see something coming together that was... Um, you know, greater than the sum of its parts. There was a real creative moment there, which is, I think, a great way of thinking about it, um, rather than only emphasizing the tracing back of origins. Um, those are all there, but there's this really exciting moment of crystallization that you described. Yeah, and I keep I keep having this tension in myself the more and more I research some of these different things or different um, the different cultures of, of Egypt and Mesopotamia and some of the earlier traditions, because you can see like the earlier antecedents that fed in eventually to Hellenistic astrology in the first cent by the first century BCE and what came out of that. And so it's obvious that um, you have these longstanding traditions that were synthesized and that um, came from different cultures and um, therefore should be recognized as part of different cultures. But then also you have this tension eventually where it all gets mixed together somehow um, you know, partially, I'm sure, just by accident or, or by circumstance due to the geographical locations involved, but also some part of it seems very deliberate um, and very systemized. And, and just the ultimate question just comes down to like, you know, who we may never know, but to whatever extent we can figure that out, like who put that together and when is like the big million dollar question. That is. And and one of the things, like you say, we may never totally be able to answer that. Um, uh, one of the other points you just made was that um, Nikepso, Petosiris, Asclepius, Hermes are all attributed as authors of this material. And you quoted uh, Iamblichus's opinion. And Iamblichus was basically right. Uh, this was a, a way of representing authorship that was particular to Egyptian uh, literary culture. Um, the it's interesting. The the more I've studied demotic texts and got to know them, you rarely have a sense of authorship in the way that we typically think of it in you know Greek literature, where we think, okay, you know, yeah, we can turn to Vedius Valens and he wrote a text, and we know when he lived and so forth. Or you could turn to Plato or Aristotle or something, because there's a culture of authorial identity there. Um, and uh, a connection between the, the author's persona and the work. And that just isn't developed in the same way in Egyptian culture, especially for things that were viewed as sacred knowledge, which, of course, astrological concepts and doctrines were. They were very much part of the temple world. Even literary texts don't always have authors uh, expressly stated in Egyptian tradition. So there, there's a whole series of narrative fiction, novelistic kind of literature in Egyptian tradition, and they're not really attributed to authors. Uh, they were just kind of copied and preserved and told as stories and shared around. And so there's a kind of sense of collective authorship um, amongst those. But definitely in the temples, um, these were viewed as as simply the you might have a scribe who would say i copied this text um, and might even give you a date 
but they're not claiming authorship. Uh, authorship ultimately goes back to these divine figures and they're um, passing on a tradition. And that's how, that's the cultural norm for the transmission of knowledge. It's not tracing it back to an original author uh, at a time, a human author at a particular time and place. And that, and that's one of the things that we'll just always, we'll just have to, I, I think, face up to at some point is um, there were lots of different authors, probably many of them are going to remain anonymous. Um, Nick Kepso was a historical king, but he almost certainly didn't write uh, the, the texts that we, as we have them. Um, he may have had a connection to astronomical knowledge because there was, I believe, an eclipse at the end of the reign of, of his predecessor. Um, uh, and so uh, he was, knowledge around astrology and omens may have been connected to him. And that's how it kind of developed into a tradition of accumulating that knowledge and then attributing it to a moment, a historical moment like that. Mm -hmm. But it's not really, they didn't necessarily understand authorship that way. And the greatest example I can give is the text I think I mentioned earlier on in the episode in which we have a story of a, a priest, um, a Petiesi, um, whose name is sort of similar to Petosiris, um, who discovers a text in a temple written by Imhotep, this Asclepius figure that we mentioned, and he presents it to King uh, Nikepso. But neither of them notice are the authors. It's the god who wrote the text that was discovered in the temple. And so um, it, that's the traditional Egyptian way of presenting things, uh, a nature or knowledge of this kind, as it's traced back to the gods. Someone may have found the text or or it's traced back to a divine figure like Imhotep. Someone may have found the text, helped preserve it, presented it to a king. The king may have sort of helped to promote it and promulgate it. Um, but it's a very different way of understanding uh, the production and transmission of knowledge than I think what we're used to. And that's that's important to bear in mind when we see these things. And earlier scholars dismissed, dismissed this as like, well, you know, it's just a made up story to give the text a, a kind of an aura of authenticity. It's like, no, that's actually, that was the way Egyptians represented the production and transmission of knowledge. Right. Yeah. So it's like, and there's so many texts attributed to Hermes or so many different, there's different texts attributed to Asclepius and there's different texts attributed to Nechepso and Pedasiris. Um, so on the one hand, there it's obvious that there's like different authors attributing their writings to those figures at different points in time. But then there's also this other tension where there probably was just from multiple different independent citations, for example, a single singular text that was very early that, that was attributed to Hermes that dealt with the topic of the 12 houses and seems to have like introduced a really early system of significations for the 12 houses. And then there was like a singular Asclepius text that seems to have introduced another very early treatment of the first eight houses that lots of other you know authors um, cite, and then finally there's the Nechepso and Pedasiris text, and at least one of the early versions of that seems to have talked about the theme of Mundi, and also seems to have talked about like for example the length of life technique that became common and cited by so many later astrologers. So the question is is like you know who authored those original texts? Were those texts originally in Greek or were they in demonic um you know were they written by greek individuals let's say that or originally written in greek but inspired by some earlier egyptian traditions or are we seeing the product of something that was originally part of the demonic or part of the egyptian tradition that gets transmitted over into greek at some point um we don't really know what the answer to that and it's really um tricky and really hard just because we don't have most of those early original original texts um yeah, exactly. so it's really tricky. And then also, you know, the other parallel is to go back to the Hermetica, the philosophical Hermetica. Um, the authors of those are drawing on a lot of Greek philosophical traditions and schools. Mm -hmm. So it's it's also hard because it's very much wrapped up in a lot of the, the Greek intellectual and philosophical and spiritual ideas of that of that time frame, essentially. So we probably run into a very similar thing with the technical hermetic in terms of the astrology. Absolutely. It's all interconnected. Uh, just to make one example, um, there's a number of texts that refer to someone whose writings we don't have all of fragmentary 
author and a figure that was um, early Roman period contemporary, we think, with the Emperor Nero called Chiramon, who was an Egyptian priest, but also a Stoic philosopher. So you could have the same person um, versed in both traditions. Um, and you can easily imagine that someone like that, who's uh, who's educated both in the traditions of Greek um, philosophy or contemporary, uh, especially with the Hermetica, they show a lot of well connections to Stoic philosophy, but also sometimes Neoplatonic ideas um, that emerged uh, later. And, and they, that could be the same person, uh, the same you know, someone who, who's had a training in, in Egyptian traditions, but also Greek philosophical traditions, working back and forth between them, translating, if you will, between cultures, languages, traditions, of finding syntheses between them. Um, uh, and, and I think that's one of the characteristic features of all of this literature. Uh, we also know, you mentioned the technical um, literature, and, and we were going to uh, get into that just briefly. We can't obviously do another five hours or <laughs> something, uh, as fun as that would be. Um, but the um, uh, the among the texts, sometimes grouped with the uh, technical hermetic, are the so-called Greek and Demotic magical papyri. Um, and some of them are indeed Greek and Demotic magical papyri. Some of them are, in fact, uh, uh, bilingual texts produced and written by uh, the same individual, and sometimes switching between one language and another, sort of code switching, it's called in linguistic terms, writing one part in Greek, and then switching to Demotic for another part, then back to Greek again um, in the course of one you know, spell or, or uh, recipe for a ritual. Um, uh, and that uh, some of those involve astrology too. Um, one of my favorites is is a, a text in um, uh, one of these bilingual texts. It's a ritual for the um, uh, for getting Imhotep to come to you in a dream and cast a, a, a what looks like a cathartic um, astrological chart or tell you the right hours for an undertaking by using a a pinax in the course of a dream, um, but it's the text itself switches between um, Greek and Demotic for different parts of it, and sometimes even uses um, uh, Greek letters to gloss the correct pronunciation of Demotic terms, and sometimes Demotic terms are actually Greek terms that have been written in Demotic. <laughs> and so that gives you, I think, a little bit of a feel for just how bilingual this world of the technical her Hermetica could be. Um, maybe I could mention now, just in case folks aren't aware of it yet, there's a whole new publication coming out, the Greek and oops, the lights shining, the Greek and Egyptian magical formularies, edited by Christopher Ferroni and Sophia Tarallas Tovar, um, which is uh new translations also laying out the the Greek text and the uh, transliteration of the demotic script um in a standardized format on a facing pages to the translation so that you can see how the texts really work as bilingual texts in those moments mm -hmm. uh, and that's really exciting that's uh that's um uh, and just came out i think last november or so right because that's a whole um area of the egyptian contribution that we didn't fully get into but the um, earlier tradition of like magic in Egypt and how that may have fed into some of the traditions of like astrological magic that developed in the Greco-Roman and subsequent periods. Exactly. Another enormous topic we can't get into, but I think there's, um, you know, scope for, for talking uh, more about this, uh, but there are definitely spells in the Greek and Demotic magical papyri that uh, talk about astrological doctrines and use them, especially, uh, I guess, what's you know today called electional astrology or cathartic astro astrology, uh, choosing a, the proper or most propitious uh, or powerful moment from an astrological perspective to perform a right to achieve certain effects. Um, so things that uh, show up much, much later, for instance, in the Picatrix and, and other um, uh, treatises on astrological magic seem to already be starting to uh, emerge in things like the the Greek and Demotic magical papyri. Right. And the pre-existing use of things like like um, amulets and different things like that, that has like a long lineage in the Egyptian tradition, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. As amulets are a uh, um, use part of religion, um, frankly, you know, it's a, uh, it's the, 
as many people may know, the the mummy of uh, a deceased person's uh, you know prepared body um, would have amulets of various kinds protecting different parts of the body, keeping them intact, invoking various divinities and powers to um, to um, provide that protective function. Um, and those amuletic traditions um, undergo extraordinary and interesting uh, transformations and deployments for new purposes as time goes on, um, and the making of statues and images as well from Egyptian traditions, it, temple traditions also start to be used in a wide array of contexts in, in household religion, but also various rituals and practices that we would today, that's another controversial category and topic, we would today maybe call magic, um, um, but, uh, you know, is also uh, just was part of Egyptian religion, uh, uh, or what, and another controversy on what is religion. That's <laughs> maybe we don't want to get bogged into uh, these kinds of, uh, uh, debates, but, uh, their, their ordinary set of ideas and practices for, uh, working in relation to, uh, uh, the, the powers beyond the human world. Mm, okay. Um, and then there, that may be then culturally taking from some of those earlier strands in Egypt, uh, in the early, much earlier Egyptian tradition may then explain and help understand how that contributed to some of the debates um, after the Hellenistic astrology was developed about the tensions between like the complete determinism and everything being faded uh, and that you can't really change it versus others who would say that things are only partially determined or that there are things that you can do to change one's fate, um, such as through magical practices or electional astrology or other things like that? Yeah, absolutely. You you see that that full blown debate in antiquity already. You know, it's a topic I know that's that's current today amongst uh, uh, people who are involved in astrology. Is is that very same debate, and and it has roots in antiquity, very and different opinions. And I think um, another thing that I think that if I can make a very general statement, um, that another thing that would be great to talk about sometime. Um, is uh, I think there's been a lot of reassessments of of the extent of determinism itself in ancient astrology and ancient ideas uh, and and uh, ways of understanding the cosmos of um, various ancient religious traditions. Um, you know, I think a lot of um, a lot of texts were precisely designed for um, uh, dealing with. Uh, and even sometimes escaping the powers of of the cosmos, um, escaping the the astrological power of the planets. There's a great text um, preserved in multiple copies in the corpus of the so-called uh, magical papyri called uh, the Eighth Book of Moses, um, which is a text that draws from multiple traditions, religious traditions um, of the Eastern Mediterranean, which is essentially a, a long rite that's intended to um, help you conquer the power of fate and the power of the stars. Mm, right. Yeah. Because that's, yeah, that's a whole issue. Um, and something I've talked about at different points, like how I feel like um, Hellenistic astrology is a technical system, especially arising in the late Hellenistic era when Stoicism was so in vogue so many some of the astrologers show stoic leanings like like valens or or manilius or even firmicus um but then what that would have been like and how you can see after a few centuries of that being such a popular and dominant idea and the the interrelationship between fate and astrology that you start to see um some pushback against that idea you you start to see people normal people like looking for a way around that and and like if there's a way to make that negotiable or to not have everything pre completely predetermined in a person's life and so you you have things like the magical texts um you have things like the electional texts you have things like um in some of the like some of the christian texts and things like that like like the idea that um you know that you're no longer fated to that fate doesn't hold sway over you or you have, yeah, just a lot of different things like that that start to be almost a reaction to some of the philosophical and technical things that were implied by the practice of astrology in the from the late Hellenistic era onwards. 
Yeah, it's it was an incredibly lively world of philosophical and uh, religious debates around all of these topics, um, and, and with different schools pitted one against another. And, and I think that's one of the ex exciting things about that. Uh, you know, it's um, it's often difficult to talk about um, you know, one strand of ideas in in these texts. Um, you know, they they seem to all. What's extraordinary, however, I think, is there's such a broad um, acknowledgement that uh, planetary uh, entities played either indicated or uh, influenced what was going on in, in Earth. So many different, totally different religious traditions, uh, mm -hmm. if, you know, if you think about it, um, who would see themselves as inimical to one another, nevertheless took for granted that this was a thing in some way either right. either in the case sometimes in the case simply denying it and saying that we're just having to recognize that this was something that a lot of people believed that they had to try to reject mm -hmm. or that um they were claiming that their um the, some of their religious ideas were um, a way to transcend this um, or actively working with it um so it, whichever way you slice it it was part of the um, almost the air people breathed of, of antiquity, no matter how many debates there were around it. Yeah, just that that whatever that system was, whenever it was created the, after the second century, it just sort of explodes in popularity and has such a huge emphasis, a huge impact on like so many different cultures and and religions and philosophies and different things like that that you see everybody reacting to or or um, trying to deal with it one way or, in one way or another over the next several centuries. Yeah, exactly. It's a incredibly complex world, and uh, I, it's been it's been great, um, you know, talking about all these strands and threads that come together, um, and and the Egyptian context, of course, that I'm I'm very interested in and, and invested in in many ways. But uh, you know, we have to also acknowledge, as we've just been doing, that this was part of a a very wide uh, cosmopolitan world that was cosmopolitan in terms both of in terms of the cultural context and exchanges going on, but also many people within this world had a very cosmopolitan view in that literal sense of seeing themselves as citizens of a cosmos, uh, that is uh, being polites of the cosmos, uh, situating themselves in a very broad world uh, that extends uh, to the heavens. And that's part of the the architecture of, of this world. Yeah. And, um, and also, one also ending point that's really good that I'm surprised we didn't mention was that many of the astrological texts and the major astrological authors whose works survived that wrote in Greek um, still tended to be from Egypt. Like, for example, you know, we have Valens and Ptolemy. Um, and I forgot to mention that Heliodora, <clears throat> Heliodora would have been contemporary with like Valens and Ptolemy, roughly, probably like second century. Then you have Hephaestus of Thebes and Rhetorius of Egypt. Um, but one of the things that happens is towards the later centuries um, with the rise of Christianity and the tensions between astrology and, and Christianity, um, that they there started being bans against astrology and this sort of like um, intellect, intellectual zeitgeist eventually turned against astrology. Um, and that's sort of when the sort of practice of astrology in Egypt to a certain extent starts to wane later um later in the the Roman Empire as the Roman Empire starts to decline and things like that and that we get towards the Middle Ages that eventually the locus or center point of activity um ceases to be Egypt or ceases to be Alexandria and instead moves to other major cities like like Baghdad for example mm. during during the 8th and 9th centuries or or other cities after that and, right and along with that the great hermetic traditions um uh continue in in uh, the the world of the um uh, the islamic and arab world as well um great work on that from a historical perspective by Kevin Van Bladel who's done a lot of work on the on the arabic tradition of hermetic texts so right that's called yeah. the egyptian hermes exactly yeah or yeah. sorry is it no that's not is that right no that's Fowden's. wait Fowden, yeah, yeah. The, oh we're the, getting the mixed up you're right now i think it's the arabic the oh arabic dear hermes? i should know and this i i, I kind of know kevin this is embarrassing he's going to write me a nasty email <laughs> just i don't know kevin's very nice he would never do that 
Um, yeah, that you had it right the first time. The Arabic. I had it right. Herb. The Arabic. Herb. I think so. Okay. The Arabic okay. Herb, okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. from pagan yeah. sage to prophet. So in that, yeah, that's a great book documenting the continued, um, continuement of some of the Hermetic tradition into the Arabic texts when they receive and translate a lot of the earlier Greek and other astrological and other both scientific and philosophical texts, and then we get figures like Abu Mashar who. Just a couple of years ago, we had the first two translations into English of his greater introduction that have ever been. It was the first time it had been translated into English, first an academic translation, and then Van Dyke's published his translation also from Arabic. And what was amazing and what was kind of mind-blowing in that is that we could see um, Abu Mashar drawing on an earlier text that was attributed to Hermes, and that um, he said that Hermes... Um, had some sort of revelation from Agatha Diamond so that this, whatever this hermetic text was that no longer survives in Greek, because I had never seen any references to this until I saw Abu Mashar talking about it. Um, but it actually gave some really interesting insight into some early hermetic text that was giving some rationales for things like the exaltations that didn't survive in any of the other authors. So it was another example of um, yeah, the continuation of this this Hermetic or this Egyptian tradition to some extent, and of the things that still sometimes we find unexpectedly coming up in different places that give us insight into what this earlier um, tradition of astrology in Egypt during the Hellenistic era and what its foundational stages may have looked like. Right. And that's a, a great point. Yeah, Baghdad being another one of these nodes that's kind of brought together things and, and sent them out again. He's kind of there's these uh, little points in our landscape of, I suppose, the intellectual and, and cultural history of, of astrology that uh, were, were real uh, distilling and crystallizing and then in many ways distributing points as well. Yeah, it's a great, yeah. great point about that. I think that gives us a nice perspective on, on uh, yeah, that was another incredibly cosmopolitan world um, there in, in Baghdad as well and the great translation movements there. Mm -hmm. Right, for sure. Um, yeah, as well as just the transmission of this material and um, that, you know, we have the transmission of the Hermetic texts, of, of the different astrological texts, and that, um, yeah, that, that some of the pieces that astrologers are still using to this day, like things like the ascendant or referring to you know, uh, using the word like horoscope, hour marker, and as we talked about earlier, how that might be tied in with the earlier Egyptian tradition of like the hour watching or hour marking priests um, and different things like that, or or the different subdivisions of the zodiac that are still used that are called decans. And while that's very far divorced from the earlier concept uh, connected with the fixed stars, um, how it still has its origins in that tradition that goes all the way back. Uh, four thousand years now yeah it's really kind of mind-blowing isn't it <laughs> yeah it's kind of cool just seeing yeah. a continuity of something because also especially like if you just think about it it's like there's few things like that that have that grade of continuity that you can trace back like that far in history in like common like everyday life but right there is something that's you know relatively common relatively popular um, or and recently has seen a resurgence in popularity, interestingly, in the past few years, but that has its origins and that you can actually like trace back through the centuries and through culture to culture and language to language all the way back to um, you know, very early in the Egyptian tradition. Uh, it's it's really striking. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's wonderful to take these historical perspectives uh from our times and see all the different transformations and how even in, you know, you were mentioning the and I, I know we're we're in danger of starting an entire new Netflix right. episode here, so I'll try to be restrained. But you know, you were mentioning the uh, the the way that Christian Christianity played a major role in many ways in constraining the possibilities of uh, astrology, and and yet um, astrology was adaptive there too. And I th I always think that um, you know maybe this is much more a, a factor in in the Renaissance uh, revival of of astrological traditions, but the fact that uh, you know. Uh, Ptolemy um, of of Alexandria, uh, you know, became such a key figure in um, the late you know, post Renaissance astrology tradition. Is in part because it could be presented as a kind of system of nature, um, 
uh, separated from some of the other kinds of um, ideas of, of divine beings and so forth, which, which would be not um, doctrinally acceptable in a Christian world. And, and that was, in fact, one of the, the strategies, I suppose, of the Renaissance astrologers was to promote the idea of natural magic and natural astrology to not get in trouble with the, <laughs> the authorities. And yet that's a tradition that uh, comes also out of Alexandria um, that is, an, uh, this in that case, an application to this burgeoning world of astrology of mostly Aristotelian natural principles of causation um, to the the to provide the explanatory framework for how and why astrology worked. Yeah, well, and, and that that allowed like Ptolemy stripping it of some of the more um, mystical or or clearly like religiously inspired concepts and creating a more naturalistic model allowed it to survive through the Middle Ages and through periods of of persecution uh, and all the way into the present time. Um, but that even that, but that we know that Ptolemy was drawing elements from that earlier um, Greco-Egyptian tradition, and that he was centered very much there as a contemporary of Valens. So it's like you can see the parts of the system that he's still using versus the parts of the system he's leaving out, and even some of the parts that he ends up leaving in are still connected to some of that um, that earlier Egyptian tradition to some extent because he you know continues to use the ascendant or yeah. the midheaven or um, even though he only uses the lot of fortune and he doesn't reverse it um, that still has some connection with some of those earlier traditions and we can see the lots being used um, in some of the um, demotic texts at this point in very interesting ways yeah. so yeah, that's a great point. That's exactly the one I I, I was hoping you'd make. Uh, that that's you know, despite Ptolemy's interest in changing it, he can't leave out the the lot of fortune. It's just too important to doctrine, and and it seems pretty clear, from, especially from I think it's Stefan some of Stefan Highland's work that that was there in the Nicapsopetosiris tradition pretty clearly. Right. Well, and Ptolemy explicitly has it, has an allusion to Petasiris that everybody thinks is to Petasiris, because when he introduces the length of life technique, he says, and the ancient one says that you have to apply the length of life technique before anything else, because mm -hmm. you need to know how long a person will live so that you don't issue predictions for somebody that won't live long enough to see the appointed day when that alignment would otherwise occur. And that's pretty clearly an allusion to Petasiris in the text on the length of life that a number of other astrologers cite Petasiris for. Um, and to me, that goes back to, and it makes me think of, to close another loop, um, mm. how you had that earlier Egyptian tradition surrounding that Egyptian god of fate, uh, mm -hmm. Shai, and that one of the things that was really emphasized in some of the, the mythology surrounding that was that that Egyptian god of fate was tied into your your birth, but also your your death and your length of life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really striking to me then that one of the major things that the Nechepsa Pedasir's text was supposed to have dealt with, one of the major techniques that it contributed to astrology that astrologers then used for hundreds of years and puzzled over and tried to get right, was this very specific technique for determining the length of a person's life that was like a highly technical and highly specific doctrine, but that um, was probably first introduced in the Petasiris text. Um, and to the extent that that's true, I find it interesting that um, the earlier Egyptian tradition may have had this notion of, of fate being tied in with the length of a person's life in particular. And I wonder sometimes if there was like a connection there. I, I think so. I'm, I'm waiting to find, I'm hoping that some of these new texts that come out in demonic will provide the smoking gun. But I think you're absolutely right that there's got to be something there and that this is a great sign, you know, I think we can start to imagine, anticipate, and ask questions about how um, these scholars working in temples or between the temple context and a cosmopolitan center like Alexandria might have engaged in this kind of creative reinterpretation of their own traditions in the context of, uh, you know, the the cosmopolitan intellectual world around them and took taken something like the concept of shy and fate, which had a long tradition, appears in wisdom texts and other literature and, and worked with that together with these new emerging ideas and, and techniques uh, to think about it uh, creatively in these ways. And um, I think that's one of the things I always like to emphasize is that there used to be a way that um, 
people understood the world of the temple as as a closed off space um, uh, away from uh, the rest of the world and very kind of conservative and, and restrictive and, and hidden away from the world. But things like that suggest that um, there was much more dialogue between centers like Alexandria, the wider cosmopolitan world that Alexandria in many ways encapsulated, and these local traditions. Yeah, for sure. And also that um, no techniques, none of the astrological techniques are ever fully developed in isolation, but they're always there's always a dialogue between like the past and the future and innovation versus tradition is one of the constant tensions in the astrological tradition. And no matter how much there may have been new techniques introduced in the Hellenistic era in the early Hellenistic era that led to the birth of Hellenistic astrology, it was drawing on earlier technical and philosophical and cultural components, like probably that concept of, of shy that we were just talking about and fate and the length of life that then fed into some of the motivations for why you would even seek out trying to connect to, to create a technique that could do something as, as fantastic or, um, or difficult as determining how long a person would live based on the alignment of the stars at the moment of their birth. Um, yeah, sometimes the cultural context, once you understand it, like provides a lot more of an understanding of why certain techniques are developed than, than you might know otherwise. Great point. Yeah, really great point. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, thanks a lot for joining me for this today. I, I really appreciate it. And you're going to be working on or what, what are you working on in the future? Or what do you have coming up? Um, well, uh, I've been working on a couple of articles on astrology. One is the one you mentioned on uh, Nikepso and, and Petosiris and these uh, omens and the and the role of um, ast um, Alexandrian astrology as a kind of cosmopolitan center. And that's going to be coming out in a little while in an edited volume on Alexandria the Cosmopolis. I've been doing a little research on some other astrological topics. Um, I think though um I'm it's I'm really it's great to have this opportunity because I've been getting back into astrology um and study of of ancient astrology um after a, a long period away from it um I used to be very interested in this in an earlier stage of my career and uh, I'm glad to be back into it I'm hoping actually to just teach a course in the history of astrology uh, at uh, uh at the university and um you know get other people engaged with this uh, really fascinating subject both in interesting and valuable in itself, but also a subject that I think teaches us a lot about the nature of cultural and intellectual interactions um, and the, com the complexity that's involved in them. Uh, and sometimes the human side, like with the uh, the coffin of Soter, it's a, it's a really fascinating topic through a, a great lens into history itself. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, awesome. Well, I will look forward to like those publications and some of that future work and look forward to seeing what you're doing as well. You're also doing some work on like um, Egyptian temples, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, a project I'm working on now is on uh, the public areas of temples and the way that they were used, uh, um, how they served as law courts, uh, public places for um, uh, setting up documents uh, in, a, in a public place where people could see them and, and read them, uh, sort of like a town square of the, of the ancient world. And interestingly, one of the things, one of the ways that they probably were used was for astrological consultations. Um, we have a fascinating graffito that was discovered at the temple of Knum in Elephantini Island in, uh, way in the south of Egypt. Uh, which I think is a little um, representation of the zodiac wheel that was probably used uh, as a kind of pinnax where people would, uh, an astrologer might have set out their, uh, their little stones to represent a, um, uh, the constellations or, and, the, and, the, and the planets for a client. Um, and it's right there in front of the temple. So I think um, that's, that's the connection there as uh, uh, astrological practice was probably happening in the public places of these temples. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, a book project I'm working on. Cool. Well, I look forward to to checking it out. And people can check out, I guess, your your previous book if they're interested in some of the things we've talked about in terms of the cultural interactions in in between Greeks and Egyptians. Yeah, great. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining me today. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Um, uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, being on, on the podcast. Uh, I've I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks everyone for watching or listening to this episode of the Astrology Podcast, and we'll see you again next time. A special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com.
In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Mimi Stargazer, and Jean Marie Kaplan. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through our page on patreon.com. In exchange, you can get access to bonus content that's only available to patrons of the podcast, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the monthly forecast episodes, our monthly Auspicious Elections podcast, or another exclusive podcast series called the Casual Astrology Podcast, or you can even get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, visit patreon.com slash astrology podcast. If you're looking to get an astrological consultation, we have a list of recommended astrologers at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrologers on the list are friends of the podcast that have been featured in different episodes over the years, and they have different specialties such as natal astrology, electional astrology, synastry, rectification, or horary astrology. You can get a 10% discount when you book a consultation with one of the astrologers on our list by using the promo code ASTROLOGYPODCAST. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS, which is from the creators of Solar Fire for PC, and it includes both modern and traditional techniques. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. If you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then I'd recommend checking out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I go over the history, philosophy, and techniques of ancient astrology, taking people from beginner up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can get a print copy of the book through Amazon or other online retailers, or there's an ebook version available through Google Books. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. There's over 100 hours of video lectures as well as guided readings of ancient texts, and by the time you finish the course you will have a strong foundation in how to read birth charts as well as make predictions. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com. Thanks also to the Starscribe Astrology and Journaling app, which is currently running a Kickstarter campaign through April 22nd, 2023, to fund an exciting new mobile app for astrologers. Find out more information at starscribe.co. Finally, thanks also to the Northwest Astrology Conference, which is happening May 25th through the 29th, 2023, just outside of Seattle. This year's conference is going to be a hybrid conference where you can either attend online or in person. Find out more information at norwac.net. 